Block 7. Then how exactly are we supposed to defeat them then? Clovich asked. Fortunately, I do believe we found a solution on how to negate the Sisters of the Blades' blur ability. Samantha reassuringly added. Electrical-based magics is their kryptonite. A good enough charge should force their bodies to reform into something solid so we can actually hurt them. Zap them fast enough and they wouldn't even notice until they drop dead. Sounds also like a job a stun mine wouldn't solve too, but then again, I leave the neutralization of those assassin nuns to you and the other Mystic Three. Polonsky nodded. Indeed with all of our collected experience, abilities and tools at our disposal we can defeat the Black Elves. However there is one more there one more point I must speak of and it is considered perhaps the most profane of what my fallen kin are capable of. Aliathra raised, it is known that their armies would. In all their history. They gain the uncanny ability to tame even the wildest of monsters, beasts of strength or terrors of the arcane, if it has teeth and can gain an appetite to commit murder, their beast tamers would bind them to its will and have it fight on the black elven armies as their vanguard, that explains why the most gruesome of images to Sart had taken. Clovich cringed, from what I can gather from my dragonflies, they are a bunch of gillums some sort of raptor birds as big as a man and the grandest of all. A dragon, a black one specifically, he said. I am sorry Agent the Sardit. They brought. A what? Clovich eyes twitched with hanging fear. Did his eyes deceive him? A black dragon milord. My fallen kin brought forth from the depths of their vile homelands a black dragon. This means that the Midnight Camarilla had sent one of their very bests to attack us. Aliathro explained. They say amongst the dragon kinds the black dragons are considered the most violent, they spit an acidic breath that can melt through any metals enchanted or not and their scales can stop almost anything not magically enchanted. Only a select group black elven generals would be granted the privilege of their own black dragon mounts for battle. It is no question you fight one of ten of the Crimson Lancers the most accomplished of generals of the Black Tree Pact. The elf explained. Her arms kicked forward to her cheeks as she became flushed with fear. God strengthen me for this trial. Clovich prayed as his body shuddered. The overwhelming might of the Federation's military can easily crush the ten lords of the Crimson Lancers and their armies, who have never lost a battle nor a duel in hundreds of years. Aliathra states confidently. But that doesn't mean you should underestimate them. They are the elite of the Pact's army might for a good reason. We learn from other people's mistakes, Zulu, Burma, Afghanistan, and Vietnam. I will not be the next subject on their Sunday Cigar Club chats. That I will be sure. Right, Colonel. Holyfield swore with Polonsky nodding alongside him. Again, I suggest we exercise caution, Holyfield. If we are to hold New Argonia we will to kill off their monsters and their spellcasters as soon as the battle engages. Polonsky reminded him. Kill things quickly before they can begin their siege? Holyfield asked. They will march in full force towards New Argonia right? Do take heed of the Black Dragon most of all. We must not allow it to exhale its breath upon your forces. Aliathra raised. Maybe. Just maybe, Holyfield muttered, grabbing the elf's attention. Do you have something to keep the dragon busy Sir Holyfield? Aliathra asked. It's not what we have, but what we do not have. Holyfield smiled coyly. Not have? Samantha twitched confusingly. Not officially per se. Holyfield grinned. Major. You're not proposing we. You commit the. That thing. Polonsky hesitantly tried to ask if the Holyfield was not humoring him again with his past glories. Did it not nearly kill you years back? He knew just what the Major was talking about. A relic of a past war that Polonsky thought were all wiped out but the Colonel had kept inside the Aurora carrier in which the only reason it was kept there was that he couldn't find the time to dispose of said dangerous relic. But now under such extra fortuitous circumstances, this relic, the last of its kind must now be sent back to the battlefield once again. A relic that the Federation had tried to wipe its existence. A relic deemed illegal. All records to be expunged of its existence from the face of humanity's tumultuous interstellar history. Oh, 
it will be more than perfect for this battle. One last cry before that old memory finally becomes ashes where it belongs. Holyfield smiled. Sometimes, to fight monsters, you need to send out your own. Holyfield bluntly explained his rationale with a singular sentence. Dash. Destroy all of those who stand before us. Lord Vokha forwarded his sword towards New Orgonia. Vlosarian, 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 chanted the frenzied black elven warriors as their marches spurred into a sprint. The shortened speak of the inspiring phrase by one of the Black Tree Pact's founders meaning desire through blood or more simply through blood which is a figure of speech chanted by those ambitious enough to push themselves to take all of what they want, all that they desire through hard-fought effort as per their founding father and mother's core principles. The distance the army needs to cover from their mass illusion spells exposition point to the other worlders position was about at least 1000 or so feet away from them. Vokhol's men were split into of at least five columns as they made their approach towards the crossroad town of New Algonia cautiously albeit in a rushed pace to cover the distance between the exposed ground his army find themselves upon. He took the precautionary measures of using his rock elementers, the fifty duos he had split into five groups of ten to screen the core of his infantry during the approach while the troops themselves into the marching tortoise formations to shield themselves from any skirmishing fire from the other worlders defending the town. Additionally, he let loose his flying units, the Erinus and Katakans to probe out the other worlders' defenses and to return the skirmishing fire likely being received back. He prefers to fully expend the brutish and monstrous aptitudes of his zoological collection of monsters at his disposal to soak the brunt of most of the fighting while his men do the damage once his quarry tires themselves trying to slay the black elven monsters. Riding atop of his black dragon, Dracer, he used her snake-like neck to look over the town's overall layout without exposing himself by flying atop of his troops lest he instantly grabs the other worlders' attention. At least not yet. Using his periscope, he zoomed in on his aviary units as they beat their wings towards New Argonia's modest skylines, seeing his catacans shifting their scales into invisibility and his erinias cackling hungrily at the sight of a long-awaited meal made the black elven general smile confidently. These monsters, despite their nimbleness, had shown record success in being able to preemptively thin out more fragile sections of most enemy armies the Black Elves would encounter, assassinating mages and siege engine crews, for example, drawing the fire of enemy ranged fighters, and even just causing havoc amongst the enemy lines so that the main forces can take advantage and slaughter them wholesale beneath the chaos. But his confidence was short lived. As soon as they approached the horizon, he could see the New Argonia skyline suddenly lit a light in luminosity as the shrieking wails of the Erinia's death rattle and the Katakan's angered holler echoed through the air. Normally these varieties of monsters were the expendable cut of his collection but typically most monsters do not go berserk so prematurely in his experience. Enhancing the zoom of his periscope, he could see that his Erinus were rapidly getting their wings clipped by an invisible magics that made them plummet to the ground but not before wailing their infamous screams. Meanwhile, he took notice that the Katakans began to uncloak from their invisible state and attempted to flee only to meet the same fate as their higher-pitched comrades, their blood being shed being their own rather than his enemies. Before long all of his avian monsters lay dead atop his adversary's grounds like a grisly trophy to demonstrate to Lord Vokhol that they will not let him take the strategic town so easily. These other worlders are indeed impressive, rooting both of my Erinus and Katakan so quickly. We must proceed to harry their defenses so that my men can go through. Send out the Unseen and the Sisters. Begin the advance. I want this town burned like the ashes we walk when Malinries hides away. He ordered, his lieutenants bowed as one of them, carrying a horn massive war horn held up by a pole sounded the wail that is felt across all of the black elven army. Overlooking the lay of the land discreetly from the trees, New Argonia's defenses as seen by the fourth war marshal of the Crimson Lancers were quite ill suited for any sorts of protracted defense as the town when designed by the Slay Aegeans was more to accommodate high volumes of trade with the infrastructure to reflect upon the need. Wide open roads, 
heavily paved walkways, and the houses spread out far from each other making it a nightmare to defend such a place from an attack. It was no wonder the Imperial garrison assigned to await them there had collapsed so soon. In spite of those disadvantageous conditions, there were observable improvised defenses that were being hastily set up by green pigmented infantrymen in cloth uniforms consisting of upturned furniture, carriages, and uprooted stones cobbled together to make barricades to impede the Black Elven advance. A commendable albeit vain effort to halt him and his army. His monsters will easily see to that. He also noticed that there were several indecorous erections of strange totems scattered about across New Argonia's grassy plains, their construction of a design that neither Vokhol nor his advisory table of lieutenants could recognize apart from its altar-like appearance and twin bundles of iron sticks or cylindrical rods as some debate tucked around its circumference. If they were some sort of magical siphoning device or aid of sorts. He doesn't know but he will have his cabal of sorcerers to deal with them. Sorcerers, unleash your magics. Burn this town to the ground. Vokhal ordered, using his army's altars of Dalin, to efficiently overcast their spells to such a degree that most non-elves would not dare push such limits. The violent scented black elven sorcerers called forth to the sky the spell Mada Ivan's Meteor. Great rocks of condensed from the great Aetherium weave were conjured above New Argonia by the black elven sorcerers, slowly materializing into this plane of existence asset over five of them were formed to rain destruction down below. But just as the great magical rocks were about to fully form before they are dropped into his adversaries, Lord Vokhal noticed strange bolts of light that come from afar behind the afternoon clouds charging towards his slowly fabricating spells like bees making their approach to a flower. A great thunderous blast followed upon those bolts of light making contact with the formulating Mada Ivan's meteor spells prematurely miscasting the ponderously conjured spells from fully reaching its peak potency. The debris that managed to materialize all falling down upon its intended targets with negligible effect. What trickery is this? Lord Vokhal questioned the absurdity of it all. The Mada Ivan's meteor attack. A difficult spell with an equally difficult means of dispelling quick enough for one, let alone five simultaneously were all instantly blunted by these other world as strange sorceries. Before the sorcerers could react, the altar of Talin that they stood upon to cast their battle magic suddenly ignited into glass splinters as if the wrath of the other worlders looked down upon the gaze of those who dared try to smite them, destroying all of the seven mobile altars of Talin in mere blinks of the eyes. A humiliating sight for Lord Vokhol and the finest arcane battlecasters of the Black Tree Pact. Our spells have failed. A wounded sorcerer stumbled before Lord Volhol and wailed in disbelief. N no matter. Vokhol stubbornly clung to his wounded pride as he regained his composure. Let us not push ourselves too much for such a trivial matter. Do not overexert your magics any more sorcerers. Stick to safely casting your taxing of spells and continue your support of our troops advance into the town, he ordered. In due haste, the sorcerer bowed, recollecting themselves. The talented spellcasters of the Black Elven army focused their powers into supporting their troops in battle. Blessing them with magics that allow them to move expeditiously swift the no man's land between them and their adversaries and also harmonically converging their minds with divination magics that allows them to have the foresight of dodging most of the worst of the other world as defenses, but without their altars of Talin. The sorcerers had to make the difficult choices of who to assist in pushing the wave through the battlefield while leaving those weren't fortunate to be torn to shreds. The black elf shook his fist frustratingly as he witnessed his men push forward closer into New Argonia. These other worlders were indeed not unlike the barbarous Dawson tribesmen nor were the helter-skelter rushes of the Saihanese but of a considerable prowess that he had mistakenly underestimated. But now this time. His gauntlets were off and his sword raised forward. It is time to commit to the battle. If these other worlders wish to fight him then his army's murderous prowess in battle shall indulge them. As Vokhols marched further closer to the town homes of New Argonia, the elves could hear the faint yet desperate cries of the defenders. In their histories of fighting and triumphantly besting such previous foes before, 
The sound of such panic excited them into a frenzy from the elves and their monstrous shock troops. Fire, a voice echoed from defensive lines. An orchestra of a thousand deafening drums followed suit as the black elves were being bombarded from their front. Top and bottoms below in a storm of fire, erupted earth, and the haunting wails of slashing winds as if the very soil wished to stop Vokhol's armies from advancing no further. Formations were broken, soldiers cut down by invisible spirits whose wails were as of the flowing winds whisper, and monsters turned being ground into oblivion as Vokhol looked on. His face frozen upon the scene before him not to betray his grandiosity to his subordinates of a proud crimson lancer for he was, inside astonished by what he had seen, the once confident black elves, the proud sons and daughters of the true rulers of Alfil Nora who was lust for glory and bravado were in one instant dashed away like the sands in the ocean, they have swept aside upon a tide of unseeable hail as many of those who expected to bear witness and participate in a slaughter, became the slaughtered, no matter how they tried to defend themselves, whether shield, magical wards or even tucktailing behind the resilient duos gillums the other world a greeting drastically reduced the first wave of black elves within the opening minute of their barrage, the dread steeds, the mighty vanguard of the black elves, their imposing steeds yet light bardings do them no favors in this ambush, Instead, becoming easy prey to the other world as invisible magics that they, the very symbolism of frightening cavalry charges all lay dead on the battlefield for all of the demoralized elves to see. Only the Sisters of the Blades, unless they too were caught in the preliminary explosions, were able to intangibly phase their bodies from harm's way were still in a somewhat functional mental state albeit now hesitant on their next action as they have never faced an adversary that can unleash such a volume of magics towards their general direction. At first the sorcerers who here placed in reserve thought that the demons were using their earthworldly magics however after his sorcerers divined using the spell detect magics they gravely and confusedly informed the general that the only sources of magics it could sense were the magics being used to shoot down the clay golems. It was likely that whatever strange contraptions that waited for them must how can fire upon the black elven army at such speeds that they are invisible to the naked eye. Vokhol noticed that many of the thunderous noises came from the buildings within New Agonia that the defenders had garrisoned in the previously overlooked totems he had observed suddenly animated to life, turning around and to open its alien eyes. Eyes of fire gazed upon the black elven troops, who were unfortunately at its direct line of sight and as if cursed. They die the moment the totem's gaze was set upon them. Our army is being sliced into ribbons my lord. I fear only half of our entire forces are what remains of our glorious army. What should we do? Asked one of his lieutenants alarmingly, thinking quickly. Vokhol reassessed his resources available to him by on his immediate hand. There. The sisters. Have them commit to the battle with haste. Have them flank the defenders. Sorcerers protect the infantry and charge with my wardens upon my signal. I need someone to loosen the chains of our Caribides, as it too will join the charge. I will burn these other worlders to the ground myself. He yelled his ferocity boiling from the froth of his teeth. This rapid destruction of his forces shall not stand by his watch. Sufficiently analyzing the capabilities of his adversary, the black elf general cracked his riding whip onto his black dragon dracer, commanding the beast to unfurl his wings and gust upwards to the air. He will see to it as his pride as a crimson lancer that he will make his enemies suffer for this humiliation. He will see them burn, soaring over the battlefield in all of Dracer's draconic majesty. He ordered his steed with one elven word that would arouse the black dragon to fury. Nara the word for destroy. Chapter 52 The Battle of Newgonia The Major's plan better work. I don't normally approve of such plans but then again. He was going to destroy it eventually. Crockett tells his thoughts to Samantha as he sipped a cup of joe from his MRE as he overlooked the outskirts of New Argonia. It's old Militech tech, but I understand your concerns, unlike last time. Major's people will keep it on a leash. Samantha answered. Hold up. Sensors are picking up movement. Oh no. It's here. 
They are here now. Cold sweat escaped Ken as he monitored the UAV's radar from his laptop monitor. A bed here. That's a large flock of birds. A bee dire radioed. He spotted before him on his binoculars a mass gathering of about hundreds of unusually shaped avian creatures flying towards their position with haste. To make his old heart stressed more was that he now can hear the heavy treads of an army uniformly and slowly approaching them alongside. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests have arrived. Strider Group dug in a fortified and old townhouse near the outskirts of New Orgonia. Barbed wire fences, a ditch, several mines and other adjacent strongholds of similar built were all that protected the house from the outside world. Utilizing the limited manpower and the defensive terrain to their advantage, the combined Lani Yu and Jufi forces awaited eagerly for the impending charge of the Black Elven army. Over the distance, they can see a soul slowly setting herself down upon the horizon as the sun embedded its heated kiss upon the youth's eyes. Those are Erinias, avian monsters native to the Tavai Islands. They say that their screeches can cause anyone who hears them feel immense pain. Aliathro explained, they're in range now. Kane looked over the binoculars. What is our orders? All anti-air weapons, fire for effect. Samantha radioed her orders. Affirmative, chakrams rotating. Radioed the air defense captain. He the roar of the Militech Chakram spad burst to life as its twin 30mm Gatling guns and radar-guided Samtor unleashed lead rain upon their flying attackers. The pint-sized little brother to the Militech Fjord IFV, sacrificing size to accommodate a full weapon loadout of anti-air weaponry and equipment to take down any hostile object who so happens to vulture around an effective 20km radius. They were soon followed by those brave men under the banner of the 20th Engineering Battalion's PAL-2 slingshot manpads and dull missile batteries that fired surface-to-air missiles that fragmented into shrapnel upon detonation near their targets aimed at the Arrhenius, both weapons finding their marks upon the avian monster's flock with lethal precision tearing the large birds of prey apart without their talons ever tasting the blood of their prey. They leave an inhuman and profane shriek that gave a haunting chill to those who heard of them even hundreds of meters away as their bodies plummeted to the green and ash grounds of the Slay Aegean heartlands. Gah! cried the air defense captain. Son of a bitch! Croc gnashed his teeth as he grasped his ears painfully. All of Strider group could feel their eardrums disgorge themselves as they heard the Arrhenius screams of pain. You weren't kidding when you said they scream so loudly. Samantha cringed. Oh Bita, how are you doing? She turned to their sniper who situated himself on the second floor of the house. I feel a bit queasy, but I think my ear filters stopped the worsome. Strider's marksman answered calmly. His head was still ringing but he can still function normally in combat. Orion, this is Strider Group status report. Samantha turned to the town's air defenses. Damn it we are at at best 50% fighting strength mom. Those screams knocked out a good number of my weapon teams and vehicle crews. Reported the air captain, getting them out of her eye. Shit, he screamed. Orion, Orion, Samantha cried shaking the radio intensively to garner a response. We got giant bat dot lizard things dot attacking the 20th. They barely register on my thermals. The stutter of the radio barely giving a coherent explanation of his panic. Katakins. Those must be the Katakins. Alia through alarmingly informed. You know the drill captain. Bring out your incendiaries. Samantha ordered, reminding them of Aliathra's insights into these monstrous beasts. The 20th Battalion captain nodded and unleashed from their reserves their incendiary weapons. Fiery grenades enchanted by iris and flamethrowers were thrown upon the lizard bat-like monsters whose biology has an instinctual aversion to sudden spikes in temperature and loud noises due to their enhanced echolocation-centric hearing and frigid native homelands of the southern and untamed lands of Sanigrad. Another hazardous score about these native beasts is that their unique scales reflect light in such an illusory way that combined with their cold-bloodedness they can easily slip past most most of the youth's detection equipment with relative ease. Shit, a bee dire recoiled as one such cat Akan caught sight of him resting his rifle upon Strider's house with its eagle-sighted eyes. 
the aviary reptilian swooped in upon, aiming its razor-sharp claws eagerly for prey as the widower sniper barely escaped its clutches just in time as the monster crashed through the wooden frame of where the sniper had rested upon. The Katakan cried thirstily in vain as it tried to reach inside the Abedaya's room but its large size could barely breach through the broken window. Quickly drawing his hunting revolver, Abedaya fired 2.357 magnum rounds off of his concha pistol named April towards the beast, piercing critically through its scales and through its heart, killing the monster instantly as its body fell down upon the house's front door. Katakans are in full retreat. They. We have casualties, the air defense captain radioed. Finish them off and rally all those still who are still combat capable. This is only just the beginning. I need pounders ready to fire at my mark. Samantha ordered. Acknowledged. The 20th engineering captain nodded. Artillery pieces were now being set up and tuned to the direction of their predetermined coordinates as their shells awaited Captain Rose's signal. Samantha looked over the approaching Black Elven army marching towards the youth's lines with a stiff yet determined march towards them. Thanks to Isaac's combat calculations, the optimal location and timing of the youth's support artillery was designated on her visor now awaiting the adversaries to merely walk into their death trap. All of the army men and all the Laniyu anxiously awaited for the signal as the grasps their guns as the black elves loomed over across the fields, not knowing they were doomed the very moment they stepped close to New Argonia's outskirts. Fire! Samantha shouted, send it! 20th engineering captain nodded. Mortars, shells, and missiles arched over New Argonia's defenses as rained fire below to the Black Elven infantry absolutely devastating their formations into a scrambled mess of corpses and shell-shock troopers stumbling blindly from the artillery barrage's blast zones. Some of the higher-ranked packed soldiers raised their swords to rally the shocked men to continue on the march in a hasty rush to close the distance between the Black Elves and New Argonia. From that point, a second volley, one of the bullets was unleashed upon them from the Afif Lanilla defensive positions. Each choosing their shots carefully in rapid succession as automatic machine gun fire burst through in must black hills taking dozens upon dozens of lives in seconds. Keep firing. Samantha oversaw Sergeant Crocker's machine gun fire as he burned through hundreds of 7.62 mm bullets with his LMG. Back off. Iris rolled her hands as Dredares conjured around her fingers before the vampire witch let loose a smiting blade of lightning. Unlike her previous histories of only able to crackle enough of current to electrocute one person from close range. Her deeper insights to a lightning bolt's essential characteristics the principle of breakdown voltages thanks in part to Samantha and Kane has allowed her to cast the spell to gain the additional effect of the electrical current able to jump between multiple targets, searing through the Black Kelv's heavy armor into hollow slags. This improved variant of the lightning bolt spell to be called Iris Electro Avalanche in which she dubbed haughtily much to both the chagrin and humor of her peers. Their ambushes opening hours managed to quickly cut down a multitude of black elven troops when they had detonated their mines and had them walked into the waiting arms of their prepared machine gun and mortar kill zones. Additionally, the mines that the youth were able to set up caused their Testudo-style infantry formations to crumble sending the Black Elves flying if they were anti-personnel mines or electro-taste still if they were the non-lethal electrical stun mines to be easy prey for the Lanier's newly formed Rayfleas to finish them off. The stun mines also as predicted, temporarily disrupted the metaphysical phasing effects that the Sisters of the Blade relied upon to dodge most of their attacks, resulting in them being killed before they realize what had just happened. At first, the elves were frightened by the hearing and sight of the Federation and Lanier's weaponry but they were able to craftily shield began to recompose themselves. Several hid behind a sorcerer's warding shells only for their protective magics to shatter upon the weight of the Federation's arsenal whilst others were blocked off by the ballistically resistant Dao clay golems whom the Federation have a difficulty penetrating its oleaginous bodies, merely absorbing most of their gunfire. It was only resolved when Iris and Carlyre cast several magical missiles upon several of the fifty gillums which caused them to erode like broken soil. 
However, even with the large volume of fire the combined amelioration and federation forces inputted towards their adversaries, their most vulnerable moments, the equally sizable Black Elven army of those who could still keep their composure pushed forward under the cover of their slowly being battered down and sapped magical wards and golem screens. Shit, Clay cursed as he narrowly dodged the Black Dragon's acidic fire breath as he rushed back into his squad's bunkered down house. Ammo's here. Load up. The engineer tapped Samantha on her shoulders, carrying the said box of ammunition and his Mare 5 rifle clumsily passing much needed supplies for the Afif soldiers. Gah. Clay collapsed behind a wall and frantically grabbed his radio piece from his breast pocket. Someone shoots that damn dragon down now. It's roasting us. He yelled. This is Orion. We are trying. But the dragon is just shaking off whatever we are throwing at it. It's just regenerating whatever wounds we make on it and just burning the whole place down. I'm now down to one Sam and two AAs over. The air defense captain responded to the radioman's calls. Regeneration? Dragons can regenerate wounds? Aliath Rez ears perked curiously on Clay's radio chatter. They don't heal that quickly. She mentioned. Then how are we going to kill that thing? Ken urgently questioned. The black dragon's breath was indeed a terrifying weapon to behold, strafing across the Ufif's defensive lines unleashing its fury to the defenders below, and unlike the failed meteor attack, the monster's attack run found several of its marks, liquefying several key defensive installations and positions from garrisoned homes to even several mechanized elements. The beast managed to draw the ire of most of the Federation's heavy defense ordnance to itself buying precious time for the Black Hills to close the distance towards New Orgonia's defenses. They are getting closer. There's just too many of them. Carlyle cried. Keep firing. Don't let up. Samantha ordered. They needed to hold this position for as long as possible until their reinforcements arrived and their fire supports could reload their weapons for the next barrage yet even then. The situation is slowly becoming dire by the second as the Black Elves inched closer. A loud horn-like sound blared above the horizon that she could hear from far away. Three repetitions of the same note the soldiers in New Orgonia heard. What is happening? Samantha asked. Three howls from the war horn, that means they signaled the coming of the second wave of attack. Aliathra gripped her boat tightly. Over the distance, the beleaguered defenders see before them additional columns of Black Elven infantry running towards New Orgonia at double the pace. Marching alongside them was a great abomination gave emitted an unnerving presence upon sight. Making Aliathra, Carlia, Iris and the Lanier Ray Ifleys lose a significant amount of their hearts. The monster was a hydra-like creature with five snakes-like appendages sprouted from its portly and scaly bodies, but instead of multiple heads like the Greek myth of old, it sported upon each of its elongated appendages a circular mouth with a rotary of stalactite-shaped teeth and a snake-like tongue. It screeched a sickening roar as it hurled itself maddeningly towards New Orgonia. What the hell is that thing? Questioned Cain. Gods have mercy. It is an abyssal Charybdis. Carlyle gaped her mouth. The former college mage had only heard vague descriptions and conflicted illustrations of the beast but the one feature that all depictions had in common was its many worm-like mouths with razor-sharp teeth that salivate to devour its prey deep down in the darkest corners of Tlio's domains, Glesia's seas, hunting whales, other similarly sized prey or in some cases finding hapless ships to devour lest the crew perform the religious prayers necessary to not incur the water god's wrath. Enemy got another BAM. A Ufif soldier cried. Call in an airstrike on that ray. Ah. A Mosiod squad leader tried to rally his shaken men but his radio suddenly fell into static before dropping the call dead. Shit. Some of the Black Elves gotten through. Engaging. A Ufif soldier radioed. Around the western flank of the Federation's defensive line, a contingent of Sisters of the Blade managed to slip past the mines and line of sight of their foes and now came close enough to engage in melee. Dodging their point-blank gunfire with their material phasing abilities before reforming to cut them down with their dual-curved swords, they managed to slice down several dozen worth of Laniyu and Ufif within a span of a few minutes however, due the previous casualties they had suffered earlier. 
they simply couldn't slaughter the bewildered Ufif soldiers fast enough before the tandem cooperative of the Ufif and Rayflees were able to reorganize their cohesion and using small squad tactics to surround and isolate the murderous battle nuns before returning the favor, taking a frightening timing to fire their weapons just as the sisters materialized themselves to swing their blades for the kill. The same could not be said for the air defense platforms taking the full brunt of the Black Elves' fury, from the Black Dragon's acidic breath to the Unseen's hidden arrow fire. The 20th Engineering desperately held their nerves to fight back, to stay alive and continue returning suppressive fire to their foes. Shield Father, Shield Father, we need fire support, they're coming in full force on Romeo and Delt now. Clay radioed. This is FNMF Indian Sea. We are on the scene. I have thousand pounder kinetic strike missiles on my batteries. Paint your target. The radio opened forth a ray of hope as the missile frigate announced its arrival. Indian Sea, strike package Alpha and Bravo on my coordinates over. Samantha nodded as she activated her laser designator and pointed its forest gaze upon the Charybdis. Take out that Hydra. Firing. Maintain a line of sight. I repeat maintain a line of sight over, the missile frigate tells her sternly. Captain Rose's sweat dropped nervously to the cold wooden floor as she maintained her composure of the terrifying beast that crawled upon its four chimera arms towards her position. Its mouth salivated glutinously as its spongy-like paws scented the taste of prey to feast. If Samantha were to falter, she would break her laser designator's line of sight and the missile will not be able to precisely hit its target. Its frightening shrieks, however, the closer upon approach excavated Samantha's primal flight or fight chemicals that besieged her will, causing her hand to shake just as violently as the Caribbean's colossal charge. But just as her legs were about to liquefy, her hands turned to boiled noodles and the laser designator's line of sight was about to prematurely break a firm hand grasped her weary limbs. Bring that wanker down, Crocker shouted. The hypersonic missile strike struck the great beast as an implosion of smoke covered where it once stood about 50 meters away from Samantha's position. A perturbing silence followed as Strider Group looked onto the damage they had brought. It is dead. It is to be dead, the captain muttered, praying her words become true. As the smoke from the coordinated attack dissipated, they can see from beneath the blackened linings that the Charybdis, it stood majestic and proud, before letting a mighty roar before its mouth frothed in its own salivated blood and collapsed heavily onto the floor dead. When the smoke fully dissipated, Samantha saw before her even more of the ruined dead of black elves who perished in droves of the thousands along with the Charybdis, their bodies an unrecognizable charred mess brought forth by the supersonic missile's incalculable damage. Dash. Hill confirmed Indian Sea. The BAM has been neutralized. Samantha ecstatically radioed the missile frigate. Do not celebrate just yet Captain. UAV drones report that there is still a massive gathering of upfers converging on your position. Colonel Polonksi interrupted her early celebration. These stubborn fucks just don't know when to give up hey? Crocker passed his comments. Well by the looks of it now they are going for broke. Isaac counts about 25,000 foot mobiles marching into your position. Polonsky informed them. Sit rep on the situation on the ground over? He asked of them. Not looking too good sir. We had to dodge that dragon just to keep our guns fed sir. We are running low on ammunition. What happened with that big lizard anyways? Clay asked. This monster exceeded far beyond my expectations too sergeant. 20th engineering's been decimated just to even try to make a dent on its scales. As we speak, I have scrambled two squadrons of era fighters to deal with the situation one. Polonsky replied. Another distant horn roared above the horizon as another three long and winded howls that chilled the hearts of the Federation Lanny year soldiers. Vlosarian. Vlosarian. Cheered the third wave of the Black Elven army. Another trumpeted wail echoed the battlefield above them. Three more repetitions of the horn, 
signaling the beginning of a third wave to finally sweep down New Argonia's defenders in one final attempt to obtain the glory the expeditionary force sought after from thousands of miles away from their homes. Lead by the Acropolis Wardens and the surviving sorcerers, the Black Elves charged stoically past the bodies of their fallen brethren, clay ives, swords, and claws rearing their fang teeth towards New Argonia's defenders. I will not be long before their unending numbers slowly overwhelm us. Carlyle huffed as she downed herself a potion to recuperate the expended the tremendous calories she had to exert. Samantha and the rest of Strider checked their ammunition. She and most of her squad reported they only had a magazine left on their pockets before running dry, nowhere near enough to fight off the upcoming horde of hostiles flooding into their position in a few minutes. Additionally, the defenses they had set up from the traps and firing positions have all been destroyed or spent during the previous waves. The fighters of the first defensive lines of New Argonia are simply in no capacity to fight off another wave let alone stand on its two feet. This is shield father to all Federation forces in New Argonia. I am ordering a general regrouping to the second line of defense at the double. Radioed Colonel Polonsky on Clay's radio. Is there nothing more we can do here? Carlyle shrugged her arms and asked. I am afraid not for now. If we stay here any longer, we will get overrun and slaughtered. Samantha informed the college mage. You heard the colonel. Crocker shouted. Pack up and fall back. Strider group wasted no time leaping off of their feet, barely being able to catch their belongings as they escaped their fighting position as they retreated south of New Argonia towards the town's keep. This is Lima Fiver of the Western Army Group. We have arrived. Sorry for the delay. Clay's radio sparked to life once again. Captain Rose recognized that voice to belong to her acquaintance Captain Mendoza. Cover retreat then regroup at the central keep. Captain Mendoza. Colonel Polonsky ordered. This is Sparrow 1. My squadron is in range of the Black Dragon. A youth free star era fighter pilot descended from its mother carrier the Fnuck Tenacity, readying its peregrine air to air missiles for battle. Sparrow Squadron, you are clear to engage the beast. Eliminating the Black Dragon should be able to break whatever is left of the enemy's morale. Godspeed. Over. Polonsky ordered the pilots. Wilco. Sparrow Squadron's lead pilot acknowledged as he and his squadron engaged with the Black Dragon. Fox 2. To the nightmarish beast and Lord Vokhal himself. These strange insects that dared to lay their fingers upon both of them were exceptionally fast and equally powerful in their attacks. Drawing both of their ire, the dragon foregoes its original task of setting New Agonia ablaze in demon cleansing fire to engage with these adversaries, buying the retreating units the cover they need to reach back to the second defensive lines. The lightning quick projectiles it unleashed from their wings harried the dragon to no end in spite doing only cosmetic damage against it as it vainly attempted to swipe down these strange griffons, pegasi, eagles, or whatever they are that Dracer could attempt to recall from his many vile feats the dragon had done in its lifetime. Meanwhile, the Euflanier retreat wasn't as steady as the coalition had hoped. Despite their more mobile selves running through the demolished gauntlet of the now battle torn landscape of New Argonia, the Black Elves continued to give chase from the surviving sisters of the Blade Nuns and the Unseen attempting to rout the weary retreaters. The opposing army crashed through the now abandoned defenses, pushing away the sandbag and upset wood fortification as adrenaline dulled their discipline and replaced its savage murderlust, seeking to shoot, cut, slash, and stampede over all those lesser of species than to their exceptional selves. FFF cursed Clay as the support of his legs failed him causing his heaving weight in no part with his radio set making eat the dust eagly easy and dirty face first. Emerging from his left heel was a crossbow bolt, protruding across his leg drawing blood, being mixed with an unidentifiable liquid infecting his leg. Their mage is wounded. Kill them all. A voice echoed from beneath the chaos of the battlefield, it is the unseen. Aliathra cried. The Black Elf ambushers were an elite skirmishing unit of the Pact specializing in attacking their prey from their enchanted cloaks that allowed them to hide under shadowy mask of invisibility. Additionally, 
Their usage of poison-coated and no repeating crossbow bolts made them a sinister contrast to the Earth Island equivalent of their Glade Rangers in which the Elven Princess had honed her survival, biology, and archery teachings. Switch to thermals, Samantha shouted. Get to cover, she ordered. Crocker carried the wounded radioman over his shoulder whilst Kane, Abidia and Samantha turned on either their thermal visions on their goggles or their sights providing the cover they need to push Clay into safety. Yet the unseen were tenacious hunters as per their reputation. They will not let go of such a tactically valuable quarry escape their grasps. Despite their cover being blown, they were still a cut of the most dexterous of the Black Elven populace to become their rangers, able to unleash torrents of arrows and bolts towards Strider Group's pinned position. The Ufif soldiers could barely to almost not return fire thanks in part to the Unseen's lethal expertise, taking heavy fire. Samantha gnashed her teeth. I can't cast my spells. They keep shooting at me. Iris cursed. You are high. A barbaric yet by the tone of Samantha's ears. A chilling cry stilled her battle-stressed heart. A thunder of hooves followed as the unseen turned around to where the source of the sound is coming from. No sooner than they were given the answer when a stampede of whirling axes met their bodies cutting several of them down. The young captain emerged from the cover of her stone hiding spot to immediately recognize their unexpected savior. It was Kimura, one of the Oshadnaniadi Dosnbi asked folks. Wielding in her two hands with savage grace like the flowing winds, a spear in one hand and an axe on the other. It is good to be by your side sky-blooded one. I will take the heads of these tyrants one by one, she frothed savagely. Her mind was no longer of this world, instead fully immersing itself into a trance-like state of the same primal fury she had unleashed mere days before back in Marnia's bluff. She led the tireless vanguard of West Army Group's marines to link up with the besieged Eastern Army Group in a hasty response to fully secure strategic crossroad of New Agonia so that their supple lines can finally be secured. Many of the jar-headed marines bought the precious amount of time the Afif and the Laniye needed to fully pull back from their spent defenses to the second line of defense dropping their smoke grenades and surprising the black elves from their flanks. This devastating turnaround was impossible to have happened if it were not for Diaz and his Apara mercenaries eliminating the pact's scouts from reporting of the Jarhead's reinforcing approach. That war maiden killed the centaur. A black elven sergeant ordered his men. Before long, a contingent of black wardens began to pour through the ruined streets and battle-torn fields of New Argonia to reinforce the final push into the crossroad town. It was now or never for the pact to achieve the victory they had traveled far and invested so much to obtain. When news comes of their trial, the losses they had incurred will surely be recompensed by waves of sponsorships and favors from both the locals Laegeans and from the Midnight Camarilla's constituency from their capital of Dernimloth, and they will not let one crazed Yosh and Iniadi thug prevent them from achieving their sought-after glory. Dawson was perhaps in a begrudging sense to the pact, the worthiest of adversaries in terms of physical prowess the elves had fought. Their battlefield prowess matched only by elven dexterity and tactics. Prisoners captured from the northern hinterlands of Zanigrad were prized for their physicality in various fields from labor, indoctrinated slaves, and even for extended periods of pleasure fetching exorbitant prices upon being sold off back home or into the colonies. However, much of their premium prices can be justified into simply taming a free-spirited and openly defiant Dawson who much prefer to die than to be taken in alive by slavers, but that cruelty was equally reciprocated by those same beast folks themselves. Dawson would often exterminate with extreme prejudice entire black elven slavers and expeditionary forces barbarically to please their ancestors and gain more fame for themselves as warriors just the same for the Slaegeans too. Die thieves, may my ancestors be sated by your spilled blood. Kimra shouted. Damn it she's going to get cut up. Kane nervously announced. Fuck me and his bollocks. Keep Clay Swite and cover me. I am getting her. Crocker growled as he finally had a moment of respite to reload the belt feed of his MG-70 saw. 
the staff sergeant emerged from his cover and made a mad dash towards the centaur war maiden, vivaciously unaware of the fatal tactical error she had gotten herself into. Over thirty black elf necropolis wardens plus one sorcerer began to surround Quimera holdings their heavy halberds upon the Gallic Quimera to impede her wildfire of a berserk state, managing to pierce several parts of her body causing her to recoil from the spiked feedback her adversaries returned in kind. She tried to fight back by thrusting her wooden spear towards one of the Acropolis wardens but the much more disciplined Black Elf and their ever so reliable and deadly iron from tip to staff halberds, easily parrying the crude weapon before the heavy axe blade of the warden's halberd cut it down to fibrous ribbons leaving only Kimra with her hand axe and naked self against an aggressive foe with overwhelming numbers. She tried to scream kick and attempt to take a few more down of these overseas tyrants but the black elf sorcerer quickly cast hold person onto her body, paralyzing her and now left to the mercy, for which there is none, impunity of the Acropolis wardens. When her arms were bound, her legs were made still and her axe cast away, the berserker rage that ember within Quimera's soul was snuffed out. She was now without a weapon, tired and exhausted beyond belief. There was just simply too many of the black elves for her singular warrior's spirit to overcome, beneath her pride. A hidden cry, a soft yelp by the cackling sadistic glee from the pointed ears of the black elves just as they are about to put her down from her rabid rampage, Kimura closed her eyes and reluctantly readied herself for her fate to meet her ancestors. Like a wolf pack that finally cornered their prey, they ready to thrust their many fanged shaped spears onto her soft hide. Yet death never came. Instead, the centaur war maiden heard the loud throttle of thousand raindrops perk her ears, reverberating them with deafening beats as she opened her suppressed eyes to see what caused her sudden turn of fate. It was the Ogre Breaker, one Lewis Crocker who became her unexpected savior. From his massive stave, he unleashed a flood of hail upon the Acropolis wardens, turning their thick and sleek armors into slag making the once proud and thought to be invincible warriors of the Black Tree Pact fall to the ground shamefully that they never had a chance to slice their halberds in battle. He roared ferociously as his stave continued to fire, shaking the ground in every blast of its black powder bolts upon the black elves like an all-consuming inferno that for a moment. Kimura could see the manifestation of her ancestor's aureate before Crocker. Even when his stave gave out, he continued to press on. Unsheathing his hatchet from his pocket and with Herculean strength began to hack away the Black Elves just as ferociously as a Dawson chieftain's chosen warrior. Some of the wardens tried as they might stop him but his exoskeletal Hercules armor was simply too fast and too strong to keep up in any tangible way as Crocker cut them all down one by one in a blurry succession. His savagery with his e-tool was to such a great extent he actually pushed well beyond its durable limits, breaking the sharp shovel after it caves the head of a hapless warden whose last vision was the staring between Crocker's cold, adrenaline-addled brown eyes. After killing over a dozen or twice that number of black elves, the exact number he couldn't recall, Crockery examines to see that there were only two people left in his immediate vicinity, the sorcerer holding the paralyzed Quimra and one final Acropolis warden. The elite infantry elf proceeds to charge towards the staff sergeant. With his halberd but Crocker uses the arm frames of his exosuit to block the halberd from touching his exposed parts forcing the two men to collapse to the ground with the elf gaining the superior position over Crocker in a chokehold. Lewis' face turned lilac as he struggles to catch his breath from the elf's sadistic hold upon him. Grabbing from his pockets, Crocker uses the severed spearhead he got from Brenier's weapon from Suville tournament weeks ago and stab the warden in the throat, killing him instantly and ultimately freeing his lungs from the brink of suffocation. Inhaling a few quick breaths, he returned to the task at hand, the sorcerer tried to defend himself with one hand due to his other being occupied with holding Quimra as the staff sergeant menacingly advanced towards him. He fired a blast of magic at Crocker but the strider second in command rushes at him to tackle the mage down. Using his reinforced arms, he brutally pummeled the sorcerer until his blood pooled over the cobblestone roads like spilled red wine. With the magic's source severed abruptly, 
Quimra was free from the bonds of the hold person spell and took a sigh of relief as she wobbled her feet back upright. She looked at Crocker before him, his inhaling and exhaling form exposing his zenith of a figure to the barbarian beast folk. By Dawson's standards, a person of such prowess in the battlefield is the epitome of their warrior-centric society, a being of not only great authority but of great privileges such as an honorary seat on the chieftain's feasting table. The greatest portion of land, and the direct target of attention of the female folk of the tribe. A heat burned within Quimera as her eyes dilated at Crocker's as they locked each other's gaze for one brief moment. I, Quimera was about to confess of her admirations but then she was instantly interrupted by the howl of Warhorn. Across a few distances away marched an entire column of Acropolis wardens marching towards the ruined town haughtily as their bodies drowned the territory away from the Afif's control of New Argonia. Come on, Crocker urged Quimeron up and took her by the hand towards where the injured Cain lay before stride a group being attended by Aeliathra. The crossbow bolt she found was indeed injected with a noxious poison designed to slowly impair the ability of one from being physically capable but her fast intervention prevented the toxin from fully infecting the radiumans body but not fast enough to fully attend to the splintered bone and bloodied flesh from the bolt's entry and exit wound. Grabbing clay around his back he hovered over Quimra and placed the injured radioman over her back. Get this man back to the clinic, it's by keep. Look for a red cross, he shouted to her before slapping her in the back to push her off. The centaur was slightly shaken by the sudden weight on her back but she managed to keep her stature, her strength slowly re-emerging from her body to make one more gallop with passenger away into safety. She sprinted a good distance away from Stryder as her flaking hair vanished amongst the misted chaos of the battle. Her agile centaur physique easily strides over the ruined New Argonian streets guiding Clay back to safety. Another push for the weary Strider happened as they continued their tactical retreat deeper into the crossroads. A secondary defensive line was slowly being reinforced by the remnants of the garrison and their western reinforcements around the vicinity of the central keep of the town where the buildings were more defensible from rushed infantry charges thanks to their more packed formations and adjacency to each other. Still despite the casualties inflicted the vengeful filled black elves continued to pursue the retreating Lani Yu and youth soldiers to many of the native born recruits of the newly formed army of the amelioration. Their resolve was being tested to its limits as the pact's army closed in around them. The Lanui Rayfleas soon also found themselves that they were being severely battered by the attack with most if not all of the Terriani soldiers essentially being fighting wounded if they can still stand in their two feet and hold their new crossbow-like BF-77 battle rifles towards the enemy. Men, do not falter. Prince Clovich rallied his men. He was initially observing the performance of his new Lani Yafar behind the Federation's lines until the Dragon's fire attacks has caused him to pull back much closer into the central fulcrum of the youth's defenses which is the town's keep and the central square. He had decided upon arrival that he will look over to see those injured men or those who perished by the makeshift clinic that was in fact a converted into enliven the spirits of his Lani Yafar. But when the chaotic retreat was called only minutes ago. The full weight of his entire new army flooded towards him detailing the never-ending chaos and hordes of black elves swarming their position. Some shuddered in fear, others were considering fully pulling back from New Orgonia but others one led by a sergeant bin and urged everyone outside of the interned clinic to maintain the faith and keep fighting. We are being tested of our resolve my fellow men, our amelioration shall not end by these tyrants from across the sea. We only need to hold on for another moment longer. Clovich encouraged them. They are getting desperate. We saw how we can wound their pride. Take a few more of them and they will surely break. Binan spoke. How many of us are here? Clovich asked. Not including you, my lord. There are about at least 53 of us who can still fight. Then dear is 18 of your own personal bodyguards. Will you? The rest, I saw must have found themselves with our Federation allies. That is. How many? Bunan attempted to count his fingers. That is about. 71 of us sergeant, Clovich answered. I see. So where are the rest of the ammo for our new rifles? I am low, my prince watch out, Bunan shouted. 
He noticed the brief glimmer of the sunlight that refracted on the former yeoman's wet A's. There above the roof was a humanoid-shaped figure whose blurry image of warm mirage-like visage was quietly stalking the rooftops with what looked like a bow being carried by his hands. Years back on his farm observing the skies, surroundings and the earth can train oneself such as him to notice many critical changes within an environment that those of lesser attunement would have overlooked. Sudden shadows the flighted migration of a bird, or the ominous tune from the distance can predict many myriads of after-effects such as the shift in weather or a warning of an impending monster attack. This gives Tristan an acute advantage in peripheral awareness compared to even the most predatory of monsters or the most discerning of personal bodyguards. It was only a split second when the sergeant suddenly pushed the prince causing his body suddenly tilt away to his right slightly before a bolt struck him by the right shoulder. If he had maintained that clear and concise posture earlier, the shot would have otherwise fatally struck him to the heart, granting him an undignified and premature end to his amelioration. Over Zia and unseen, Binan pointed to the rooftop. The 71 Lanier Ray Airflees turned around and opened fire at the rooftop, unleashing a volley of what little ammunition they had left. They did not care if they were to run dry at that moment, they will be damned if they do not die or be caught neglecting their oaths to their prince. The invisible figure was quickly struck down, decloaking from his unseeable state before his bullet riddled body plummeted to the ground. All of the Tyranny soldiers nervously then looked onto their prince as he was helped up by his bodyguards. Stay with us, sire. One of the prince's bodyguards carried his injured body through the makeshift clinic. You again, Tristan. Benun was it not? Clovich addressed the sergeant personally. You saved my Life. R. Clovich winced as the first aid workers in the clinic quickly applied a stinging disinfectant on his wound as they prepared to extract the arrowhead from the prince's shoulder. Your dream. Our future will intend dare, Bunan asserted. We'll follow you to the ends of the world for you, he vowed, his simpleton accent pushing past his belief, just as the prince was laid onto the surgery bed. The 71 Laniers heard again the black elven war horn trumpeting amongst the ambience of pained anguish that the clinic emitted. Looking over by the inn's windows, Benun's eyes to his horror saw an overwhelmingly large contingent of black elven warriors marching towards the inn, their blood fresh with the slaughter of their countrymen who failed to escape swiftly enough to the secondary defensive lines. One of the said black elven warriors stood out. Riding atop of an elven steed and wearing a pompous plumed helmet, he trotted forward ahead of his soldiers with a grandiose authority as he just as pompously forwarded his chest, ready to address the Tyriani hold up inside the clinic. Due to his standoffish attire, most of the Rayflees reasoned he is some sort of captain high up in the ranks of the Pact's army. Slay all the thralls of the otherworlders and take their staves as trophies. The black elven captain ordered. Silence fell upon them as tense air permeated the two soldiers. Sergeant Binan was, to say the least, insulted to hear this fey-chested and cavalier elf surveyed the Tyriani with an abhorrent aura exhausting from his high-born mouth. He likely in all of his centuries-long life used to get whatever he wants within a drop of his sword and whip. Only given the position of captain and be put in charge of a company of soldiers by sheer connection rather than merit, not unlike Benin who had to climb through sweat, blood, and tears to get to where he is now as the yeoman sergeant of the Tyriani guards now turned to the Zanagrad ameliorations land a year. Benin looked over to his fellow countrymen who looked onto him quietly of what they are to do. Their bravery was high but the odds were clearly not stacked into their favor as they can observe over a thousand or so black elves awaiting to besiege the clinic against their measly 71 combatants, that is not also including the injured Laniyu and Federation soldiers, with their attending medical staff also inside too. Under the past circumstances, this would have been a hopeless endeavor. But when the former yeoman saw with his two eyes the power of these black staves he now carried, Tristan knew that to simply allow these elves to walk over him quietly would have thrown away all of what the amelioration now stands for. He would be damned to let them take the one thing that the common man such as himself can equalize against skilled murderers such as the black elves. Remembering the vow, 
he had made to Clovich just as he was whisked away to surgery. He swore to him that he will fight for the new future he dreamed of and now it is the time to commit to his words for him. And now, he fully understood what Clovich's crusade truly means. A future where there was previously none. Breaking the window of one of the inn's windows overseeing the from the Black Elven army. Sergeant Benun inhaled and exhaled his breath as was his rifle training before he took aim. With one crack of his BF-77 battle rifle, he struck the arrogant black elf captain on the chest, mortally wounding him to a bewildered elven army who expected that the severely weakened defenders would yield to their distinct numerical advantage. Come and take some, Bunan shouted. Joined by several more of his countrymen, they too broke the in slash clinic's windows as they combined their arms together as they unleashed their blessed storm of black powdered and metallic fury against the elves. Angered by this brazen insult, the black elves stoked themselves into a frenzy as they raised their weapons and declared to charge, making a beeline's rush towards the inn. G from nothing, Bunan cried, but take from them everything. The Terriani Lania rallied behind his war cry as they braced themselves for the incoming elven deluge hoarding to their bastion. The sergeant ordered several of his men and those who could still walk within the clinic to pass the 7.62 mm ammunition needed for their BF-77 rifles as they manned themselves to stem the elven tide. Doctors and patients ducked for cover as they frantically passed along ammo cartridges, grenades, and first aid to the brave 71 Rayflees who unleashed volley after volley of bullets upon the charging black elves. Most of the supplies were discarded weaponry from the injured or what the clinic could spare. My Lord Dot Sergeant, one of Clovich's bodyguards, descended downstairs and haphazardly crawled towards the valorous sergeant. The prince shall live. His wound is not fatal, but we cannot stay here. We need to head back to the keep with the rest of the army. Then what do you suggest we can do? Bunan asked. We lead through the back door gradually and follow the rest of the retreat back to the keep. The wounded has to go first. One of the clinic doctors suggested. How many injured are in this clinic? Bunan asked. Exactly a hundred and nine, not including you and the prince. The doctor answered. Bunan gritted his teeth as he absorbed the information. These men had families or were trusted new friends of the Tiriani. Indeed, they simply cannot be here any longer as despite his displayed heroics, this position simply could not be hold not whilst the black elves held the numerical advantage. Then so be it, Bunan nodded. Gee em some lads to carry these poor swords out o here, he asked around amongst the seventy-one. A breakaway team of those seventy-one holstered their rifles as they began the evacuation of the clinic's injured. There was a conveniently used during peaceful and more lofty days as the receiving mouth of inbound stocks behind the inn that faced upon the direction of New Argonia's keep. Using the inn as a strong point to prevent the flood of black elves from pouring in to rout the retreat of the Federation Lanier Kolsh and the valiant 71 Rayflees brought the injured precious time to evacuate to safety. Tried as much as the black elves might. The line that Binan drew upon the sand upon was nearly impregnable. For every twenty or so of the proud sons and daughters of true Alphalnora, they would fall one of the Rayflees. A most inefficient exchange that the surviving lieutenants of the Black Elves soon realize. They had taken an unprecedented number of casualties in such an equally egregious short period of time. From their seventy thousand warriors they as they counted the still standing banners with them of only about 20,000 or so less or more left of their once illustrious Camarilla sponsored expeditionary force. This callous display of humiliation of the elves shall not stand as long as one true child of Alphalnora still draws breath. Picking up several boosts of verticality and a ladder from a nearby house, the black elves turned around over to the blind sides of the inn and began to scale the walls of the building. The inn clinic was a two-story building with a straw and river reed made that truth which if a sufficient focus of force is applied to a single spot can allow the surface of the inn's top to be ruptured with a large enough hole to allow for an invasion. Using their axes, spears, and their bare hands, the black elves tore a significant patch off of the roof catching several Tyriani unexpectedly from their superior vantage point.
They're coming from above. One of Klovich's bodyguards yelled as he fired his battle rifle upon the rooftop breaches. An exchange of projectiles immediately followed suit, each side reciprocating kills into their tallies. One of the sorcerers even tossed a fireball into the inn in order to scurry out the rats within their stubbornly defended burrow, causing the but the development of the second breach of an alternative entry point plus the aforementioned developing fire racked the nerves of the Tyranny further. Now they must to evacuate the inn. Hold them back just a little while longer. Binant shouted as he shoved several tables and stools towards the inn's front door as a barricade just as the black elves were heaving their weight to break through. The Lanier sergeant could see the white of the enemy's eyes from the small cracks the humble wooden door that shielded him from. Picking up his BF-77 he fired several more shots through the door blindly managing to struck down several of the bunched up elven warriors who were trying to ram the door. Bunan. We have to leave now. Klovich with a wrap of bandages over his shoulder cried as the ensuing inferno began to engulf the former inn and clinic just as the last of the wounded were carried out of the damned structure, leaving behind about 48 martyrs who lay their lives for the defense of not only their prince but also the injured and clerics of the clinic. The remnants of the 71 Raifles covered the retreat of Prince Klovich's entourage using the emblazoned in as a momentary deterrent for the Black Elven advance had slowed down by the fire's choking flames. Overall, the sergeant's valiant stand traded off 48 Raifles for over 596 Black Elven soldiers and priceless minutes for the Federation Lanier coalition to retreat back into New Orgonia's keep. This is Admiral Nishizaki of the Fnac Aurora. We have arrived in the scene. The radio chatter lit a light and Major Holyfield, ready to show the full wrath of the Federation's arsenal, Holyfield added. Major Holyfield the situation is getting desperate. If they break through the keep our men will be annihilated. Polonsky urged his colleague into action. Now is the time to release that thing from Aurora's holds now. It shall be. Holyfield nodded. Stand by for lightning strike at Killbox Sulphur. The Major announced. Warning. Lightning strike imminent. Isaac's early warning systems rang out on the Federation's radios. Firing from the launching bay of the Fnac Aurora, a rocket pod zoomed over the skies, arching its thunderous path below to the grounds of New Argonia below. The fighting near the Federation's headquarters of the newly captured keep was where the exchange of blood fire, magics and bullets was at its most bitter and most desperate. Black Kelves cut down on youth machine gun positions while being shot dead by Federation sappers and Lanyian marksmen. Some fights resulted in close quarters combat, with bayonets clashing with swords as enemies faced to face themselves in vicious scraps. Both sides were at a stalemate fighting by the wide battlements of the keep as no side wanted to give a quarter for the fate of New Argonia to both sides would determine the fate of the war. Either the other world is secure the vital crossroads of New Argonia or the pact stop the demon tied towards the Empire. Before long, all of the Federation's defensive positions were now reduced to only the keep and several isolated pockets as the Black Elves' remnants gathered around for one final assault. For before them, at last, was the Black Elven general who led this botched crusade, Lord Vokhol of one of the Crimson Lancers. Despite his normally passionate self as per the custom of his knightly order, he was severely injured. Earlier he was shot off of his black dragon from one of the other world as Blisty. Only the rough fall that was reduced in impact thanks to a timely featherfall spell had him cheated death albeit not before sustaining several scraps of injuries around his body. But in spirit, he still remained unbroken. Seeing that his enemies bleed before him and his men advancing towards the centrifugal point of their defense, the Black Elf called forth one final charge to finally attain the hard-fought victory that they all see looming before the horizon. Forward, kill every last one of them, he ordered, raising his sword meekly into the air to the inspiration of his troops knowing their leader still stands with them despite his current afflictions. Vlosarian. The 20,000 strong black elves cried as they charged forth towards the cornered other worlders. They will see their flag raised atop of the ashes of that keep on this day or die trying. Comet. One of the sorcerers suddenly shouted, 
The murderous charge halted rashly as a great comet suddenly crashed through the cracked battlefield between the two great armies as dust kicked around the black elves' eyes as they looked over to this strange, almost divine-like intervention. From out of the smoke a single, large red eye opened, followed by several more juvenile-sized sanguine irises emerged surrounding the parent emerged. As the smoke dissipated, two large snouts protruded over its sides several meters apart from the bouquet of red eyes as even more red eyes stared deeply into the souls of several of the black elves who stood there frozen like deers caught between a car's headlights. Before long, the hostile natives saw before the full stripe of this strange arrival. It was a large walker of a monstrous proportion and design, sprouting forth twin, no triplets of the death totems the other whirlers had erected earlier, two for arms and one atop of a large elevated tail that seems to move independently on its own. Its body was adorned in painted yet worn metals that formed an insectoid-like body with three pairs of insectoid-like legs that carried its full weight, to some of the more veteran of the black elves. This monster that loomed over them that only comes short of the black dragon's own majesty was like the exotic poisonous arachnids that they collect from the eastern suzerainities. One brave, or maybe foolish black elf of one of the Acropolis wardens, recouped his courage soon enough before he charged his halberd towards the monstrous beast, hoping to heroically slay this monster that is likely summoned from the depths of the other world as void to fight for them. However, as soon as his blade met the strange monster's metallic flesh, his halberd's blade chipped away much to the astonishment of the entire Black Elven army. The metal monster let out a loud angered scream from its exhaust fans as it locked its gaze upon the foolhardy Black Elf and tore him to chunks of vaporized flesh with its twin death totems. It ominously summoned its energies into these eldritch erections as it began to cast its otherworldly powers upon the Black Elves, turning the tide of battle against the Black Elves as they were massacred in droves by this giant arachnid. Some Black Elves tried to cast calming spells to tame this beast whilst others attempted to spear into a kill's heel within its carapace to fell the beast but to no avail. From the keep. Captain Rose looked on to the change of fortunes with both fascination and confusion. Colonel A. Major is that a Phoenician Scorpius? Samantha questioned. I thought they were all destroyed. Indeed, the Scorpatrons is what you are seeing. And yes, this is barely read barely legal. Holyfield answered. In Samantha's memory, heavy UGVs and UAVs produced by the defunct Phoenician Corporation were once the pride of technological advancement in all of the Federation's technological innovations. Able to perform with exceptional performance a variety of combat tasks without the need for direct human input. However, about a decade ago, as part of the Project Gilliam an early means of security and crime prevention program sponsored by the incumbent government before the common state party's ascension those meshs who are of lethal and semi-autonomous in nature of over 30 tons were deemed illegal and condemned to be scrapped. Originally, the Phoenician Corporation deployed unmanned BWPs such as the Scorpius were created and deployed against separatists terrorists, or even criminals in several unstable core worlds. However, the advancement of sophistication in net running making it incredibly easy to hack the drones who were managing to break through the firewall of the system by using the newly invented digital pathway called the Dark Tunnel. This caused several incidents when most of the BWPS drones were hacked and turned against the youth force, causing thousands of casualties. At first, the Phoenician Corporation defended themselves that their drones had the best firewalls of humanity but it was discovered how easily the rogue hackers were able to bypass their supposed defenses and hijack control of the drones away from their operators. It was a case of engineering negligence that shattered all confidence within the company. To make it worse, the subsequent Phoenician scandal had also found out that the reason the rogue hackers were able to bypass much of the protective firewalls of the UGVs easily is that through several back channels, through grey and black market purchases, the Phoenician corporation had, allegedly, unknowingly sold their high-tech drones to said rogues in the first place allowing hackers to reverse engineer and unthread the needle that was the corporation's firewall in spades. 
This scandal became the catalyst for the ascension of the Common State Party's political regime in the Federation with one of their first mandates being the aforementioned banning of production and the scrapping of all existing heavy UGVs and UAVs from all arsenals by the dawn of the 23rd century. Major Holyfield was the one who performed the arrest of the Phoenician Corporation's scientists and executives having to fight their robotic security forces when they attempted to evacuate into the Federation's outer frontier space. He nearly recalled one point during the campaign he nearly got killed when one such skippertron, the nickname Youth Jarheads gave to the 30-ton UGV, brushed its twin uranium-depleted 30mm Gatling gun around his general direction. Even Samantha's father, Desmond Rose had participated in this campaign where he earned his title of the Hero of Beltavif and subsequent Medal of Honor when he rescued trapped civilians during the great robotic destruction brought forth by the Phoenician scandal. Don't be lazy now Strider Group. That Scorpatron of ours will take care of the army. I need your team to find and neutralize the Black Dragon, ordered the colonel. We end this now. Samantha affirmed her orders, without needing to tell her squad. Shay urged them forward from their fortified position, now rallied that they have the opportunity to counterattack. How do we bring that thing down Captain? Clay asked. My scanner says that the dragon has an unusually high amount of mana energies running around its body. It seems to be fueling the beast with its power. Perhaps if we can cut through its scales quick enough to pierce that monster's mana equilibrium we might be able to kill it. In theory I hope. Samantha gulped. Yes, I sensed it too. The dragon does indeed have an unusual abundance of mana. Carlyle nodded. What did my fallen kin do to that poor creature? That is unnatural, and I have an iron heart. It should not be able to regenerate so quickly. Aliathra stepped back, dismissively confused about what she, Carlyle, and Iris could sense within the black dragon. It was indeed the most unusual of creatures. I, I do believe if we can wound it faster than it can heal or even perhaps stifle its regenerative abilities we might be able to slay it. Stop it regenerating how? Clay asked. Fire attacks. A tactic employed to slay trolls and slimes I had known when I was with the rangers. I would make a wound out of its flesh then cauterize the said openings to prevent it from healing itself properly. It can be magic or ordinary fire, as long as it burns it should stop the regeneration. Aliathro explained. But for as long as that dragon is free to fly away from such an attempt on its life, it would be a difficult task to accomplish, she added. Then how about we cast a spell to stop it from flying away? The captain proposed. I have been working on this one but never got a chance to try it out until now. It's our only shot to even get that BAM to hold still. I call it, the gravity well. Samantha answered. What is that captain? Clay asked. In short terms, I can create a sphere that forces anything who comes close to it to get sucked in by its gravitational pull. If we can trap him into it, the dragon should hold still long enough for us to call in a concentrated attack. Samantha replied. You know, take away its flight so we can burst it down. I doubt it can regenerate from a full-on saturation attack. How do you intend to grab its attention though? Crocker asked. Captain Rose, you can use the Scorpatron to lure out the Black Dragon for your plan. It should have enough firepower to kill it. It is equipped with uranium-depleted rounds which should be just as good as fire. The Scorpatron should be wholly expendable for this plan of yours. Major Holyfield suggested, the Black Dragon does seem to be easily agitated by constant harassment from our weapons despite its resiliency. If you can indeed hold that thing long enough for the BWP to get to work with it we might have a shot at killing it. Sounds like a plan spearhead, I will create the Gravis well, wait for my signal. She nodded, gliding across the battlefield. Samantha followed rampaging Scorpatron on its war path against the Black Elves finding herself near a large enough clearing that the BWP and the Black Dragon could personally duel with each other. Positive with the conditions she needed for the plan to work, Samantha focused the mana energies of her Hecate suit to conjure the spell gravity well but a series of bolts brushed past her, barely conceivably zooming across her head as the intrepid redhead ducked down, 
her powers miscasting harmlessly from the suppressing fire. That one over there, the shareholder herself, take her alive. Lord Vokhol raised his surviving retinue towards Strider Group. Cover me, Samantha ordered. I will challenge them, Samantha. Continue with the spell. Aliathra stepped forward and raised her elven bow towards her fallen kin. Nenya protect me. She prayed as she moved forth to confront the black elves, drawing forth the enchanted energies on her weapon. The elven ranger let loose a barrage of arrows that as to honor her master's teachings, found their lethal marks upon several of the sundered armors of her fallen kin. Despite her grace, it didn't take long for Lord Vokhal to instantly recognize the prodigal daughter of the illegitimate elf Elnora. My. My. If it is not the tender-footed scion of the Lethe bloodline, Aliathra is your name? Vokhal mockingly acknowledged her presence. You and your minions will not triumph here. Tell your midnight Camarilla that they will find nothing but death in Sanigrad. Aliathra rebuked the Black Elf General. You humor me with your bravado princess. Vokhol couldn't help but raise his head pompously with ridicule to his counterpart's response. Has your corruption blinded you to the simple truth? Was it because of your parents giving more of their affection? Their attention to those tribes you call an elder sister and brother to you? I can already see it in your eye that those other elders had unraveled your mind, enthralled you to their songs of power and honor so denied by you from birth? He asked her, continuing his mocking tone much to Aliathra's irritation. Silence, you know nothing. Aliathra cried as she drew again her bow readying to shut the arrogant mouth of that murderous twit once and for all. However, Vokhol's highly alert bodyguards shielded him from any harm from afar she could inflict from her current position. Pa, I will gladly present your head to the Midnight Camarilla and to your family. He dismissed her with a scoff from his vain chin. Tira, remove this parasite, he ordered. The elven ranger swore to herself that none of them shall pass her and protect her friends. She drew her bow and opened fire upon the charging black elves. Despite her dexterity, she was only one ranger against several dozens upon dozens of murderous warriors who seek to gain the glory of taking her head as a prize for they had no intention to march her alive on Durnim Loth in one of their triumphant processions through that city. They seek only to prove their decades of skill to fall a noble one such as herself. For the slaying of one of the more upstanding of their hated kin was a mark of bravery in black elven society. Before long using skillful maneuvering, several Acropolis knights, sisters of the blade, and common infantrymen closed the gap, one of them able to cast a magic missile that targeted Aliathra's bow, splintering the weapon into pieces leaving her defenseless. You are nothing for you have nothing Princess Aliathra, a black elf Acropolis warden before. I will end you quickly. If Aliathra there was something the elf remembered in all of her time with the Federation, these black elves were sorely mistaken. Despite all of the trauma that would have either killed or break anyone of lesser will, she had come out of it stronger. Her cybernetic heart giving her unparalleled stamina to even her own kin. Her legs allowing her to leap great bounds in single strokes. Her eyes that can literally see all that is faster and her new arms who are they themselves as her cybernetic mentor of sort of Vincent Diaz would call himself, weapons themselves. Just as the black elf was about to thrust his halberd center mass to Aliathra, the elf hurled her fist and with a quick conceptualization of her mind, her new Aparo Corporation rapid movement boosted army set, with some arcane enhancements courtesy of Dr. Melona released from above her wrists an anoceramic blade that hurled itself towards the black elf's throat. His eyes widened upon the realization that the cornered animal he was about to slay still had teeth. H, how? The black elf asked before he expired. I am not nothing. I have become everything. Aliathra growled. The elf princess launched herself into the rapid frenzy using her cybernetic augmentations to snap back and forth with her nanoblades an endorsement by Diaz when she was selecting from a catalogue of additional under-the-table augmentations that she had practiced with before the commencement of Operation Haymaker. Now she was in the offensive, slaying those of her fallen kin before they could even fathom what kind of demonic beast they had just angered. Kill her. One sister of the blade phased in and raised her twin curved blades, but even with their uncanny evasion, 
Aliathra's second augmentation. The targeted electrical discharge system, also known as the Tesla, which allows her arms to be capable of firing a 200 milliamp arc of electricity, useful for incapacitating targets with its high voltage currents causing muscular contractions strong enough to clamp down on the heart and prevent full cardiac arrest, leaving the target unconscious and vulnerable. It is also capable of disrupting the molecular disruption the sisters of the blade do to themselves to phase their bodies from attacks, effectively negating their legendary evasiveness. Despite all of Elven Grace they simply could not compete with the Federation's bleeding edge in prosthetic augmentations. In such an auspicious moment, Aliathra felt she had transcended into a new form of being that not even her greatest forebearers could have conceived of, a being faster stronger, smarter and more perceptive than even an elf. She had become, ascended. Meanwhile, the rest of Strider group looked on to their friend from across several feet away slowly constructing the dragon's trap. Should we help her? Kalia asked. If anyone is needing help it's those black elves. Samantha chided. She almost feels sorry for them. Now you two help me channel this gravity well now. Iris and Carlyle followed the captain's orders and assisted her in channeling the expedient amounts of mana energy needed to be plucked from the Ethereum weave to allow the gravity well to have the spell strength needed to be able to ensnare a colossal creature that is a black dragon. Using all she understood. Samantha created a golden sphere around her person that resonates her weight to be pulled closer to its center nearly dragging the three mages into its embrace, but with a timely helping hand from Crocker's Hercules exosuit, Captain Rose, Aris and Carlyle climbed out of the gravity well's artificial quagmire, with their bodies, most especially their bones intact before the sphere itself reached its event horizon. Spearhead this is Strider 1, the trap is set. Bring that thing in. Samantha radioed. Upon hearing of their gambit slowly coming together, Holyfield ordered the Scorpatron's remote operator to draw its guns at the belligerent flying lizard who had laid havoc upon him and Polonsky's men for too long. It was time to finish it. The battlefield set was as far away as the Scorpatron can push back the Black Elves. From the Federation's defensive lines of New Argonia's keep where bodies of Black Elves littered the battle-torn streets of the crossroad town by the hands of its three Gatling guns. Just as expected upon a few bursts of its triple miniguns, the Black Dragon's attention was drawn to the rambunctious metal challenger from below, with a loud and equally terrifying roar. The Black Dragon descended upon the Scorpatron, who scurried away on its six legs past Samathka's gravity well. The infernal creature was too blinded with bloodlust to realize too late it had been outplayed as her body was instantly weighed down by the arcane trap. It squirmed, kicked, and screamed, turning over its body in an attempt to break free but its reflex and constitution were found wanting upon the incantation's spell strength. Now, Holyfield ordered the operator. The Scorpatron whirled its miniguns at the Black Dragon, unleashing a torrent of armor-piercing bullets upon the monster with a hellish fury that even the Gatling gun's barrels glowed into fiery orb and with overheat, thanks to its stationary position and the sheer volume of fire. The Black Dragon's eldritch regeneration was put to the ultimate endurance test as the mechanical monster crawled closer seeking to tighten the noose around the dragon for one killing blow. The operator, realized through its medical wisdom had successfully perceived that the lower, less pointy scaled section of the black dragon was much more vulnerable to its miniguns razor sharp thousand cuts than its angular upper body armor in which the operator quickly exploited. The black dragon, realized what the metal monster was attempting to do shielded herself with its two frontal claws while attempting to fire several balls of its acidic breath towards the Scorpatron who managed to barely dodge it. It disabled the tail gun, the drone operator fretted. His aggressive tactics had caused the Scorpatron its serpentine tail and tertiary minigun mount atop of it. Don't let up we have it on the ropes. Holyfield cheered on. The black dragon was slowly becoming desperate, tears streamed on its eyes as it tried to protect its center mass that was slowly being cut apart, its flesh, slowly revealing a glowing, beating emerald heart from within its center mass that the dragon desperately tried to shield from the Scorpatron's assault. 
The glowing heart emitted such luminosity that anyone within a close radius was easily blinded upon even the slightest of periphery vision in the limelight of uncertainty on which great beast was about to best who? The drone operator threw his constitution to shake off the sudden light flash from his screen display. Sir I am detecting a massive amount of mana energies around the dragon's chest it's coming from its heart. The operator attempted to explain what he is seeing while fighting with his constitution. Shoot the glowy part now. Samantha yelled. The captain reasoned based on her intermediate knowledge of arcane theory. She theorized that the source of the black dragon's unusual vigor was likely traced to its glowing, money, abundant heart. Dragons at least what she can tell of all the old books, PDFs and nerdrotic media she had consumed in her youth have fatal weaknesses if one manages to pierce through their scales with a deep enough puncture. However, if she puts together Rayleigh's statement about the dragon's irregular regeneration powers likely being of an artificial intervention has made the Black Elves were in another, unexpected and dangerous league of their own when it comes to the studies of the Aetherium. You heard her. Give it all that she got. Holyfield ordered. Pushing himself into high gear, the remote operator valiantly overclocked all systems within the Scorpatron. Pushing past every known safety limit as the BWP walked in spitting distance around the now cowering Black Dragon. Its overheated miniguns not only nearing melting point but also about to run dry of its 30mm uranium depleted bullets, before long. Its hot steel miniguns seared through the open wounds of the black dragon's flesh, cauterizing the diameter around the wounds and by its exposed heart. The dragon revulsed violently, not wanting the 30mm barrels branding its vital core not one moment longer as it attempted to shake the Scorpatron who sought to push its knife further in from the coup de grace. It's still not going down, Samantha cried. Operator, do it. Holyfield ordered. Overload its hydrogen reactor. Send them both back to hell. Take cover now. Danger close. The operator warned every Ufif and Lanier units within the battlefield. Self-destruction sequence activated. 5.4.3 the Scorpatron's monitor and voice announced the commencement of its ultimate sacrifice. A UGV drone such as itself cared little of its self-preservation, aggression and the massacring of multitudes was its only directive in its life. It had a compact 100 pounds hydrogen microfusion reactor that powers the BWP overall. The reactor also, when the self-destruct sequence commences becomes overloaded before blowing down anything within a 200 feet radius. Used mostly when it had expended all of its ammunition to take as many more of its algorithmic targets with it to its kingdom come. It was quite ironic, cathartic even for Holyfield that the swan song of this once infamous BWP shall be the made to fight to protect the Federation, not to destroy it. The remaining Federation troops within the immediate vicinity soon realized what is about to happen. They scrambled for cover as the Black Dragon wailed one final cry as the proud yet malevolent and yet also majestic creature was now about to confront the very notion a creature attempted to avoid. The idea of mortality, now clarified upon staring upon the solar size of its many-eyed killer, may you be ashes. My old nemesis Holyfield bid his adieu to the last Phoenician Scorpatron as the live feed from the operator's screen cut off. 2. 1. Detonating. The Scorpatron says its last words as there. A great bright light encapsulated the BWP and the dragon instantly vaporizing beings from the mortal coil. In its wake, a great shockwave rocked New Ogonia buildings and combatants alike. Most of the Federation Lanier troops were safely a good distance away from the explosion but the Black Hills were all but decimated. As the smoke dissipated across the slowly sunsetting sky, Strider Group walked closer. Their rifles aimed towards Ground Zero, hoping that their planned work. As they walked, Samantha gasped as she felt a sudden force stripped between her legs, tumbling before the ground. When she recovered her standing, she soon came face to face with the open jaws of the black dragon itself. At first, the captain recoiled, drawing her gladius pistol onto the monster and firing several desperate shots. Yet suspiciously the dragon didn't respond nor flinch. 
A closer examination by her made her realize, although this was indeed the black dragon's head, it was only its head, severed head. The heaving cadaver had separated a good distance between it and its mutilated and charred corpse whose lower reptilian section was blasted off to overcooked flesh and bone. The black dragon had died, it had been slain by the Scorpatron's valiant sacrifice, destroying the means of its so-called immortality during the hydrogen reactor's overload. Strider. You did it, Holyfield muttered, seeing Samantha's lift feed from his screen. No. We all did it. Everyone did, Samantha humbly sighed as her heart rate returned to a steady pace with a few inhalations. This is Strider lead, target is KIA confirmed. The dragon is down. The captain smiled. The Ufif command and their land EU allies. Upon hearing the gospel news from Captain Rose roared in celebration for their triumph among the radio chatter as in contrast to the devastated black elves who saw their once mighty monster, the pride of their nation be reduced to a heap of burnt flesh. My dragon, my sweet dracer. Vokhol despaired as he knees collapsed, staring despondently at the scene before him. His might black dragon, the pinnacle of elven supremacy was defeated, no humiliated by the scrap heap of a design contraption of these other worlders. This defeat must not go unpunished as surely the Midnight Camarilla will now see when the word has transpired for this disgrace. Surrender now Lord Vokhol, you have lost. Aliathra forwarded her arm-mounted nanoblades at the black elf general. Never. You will pay for all of this. Vokhol moaned his agony emerging from beneath his typical confident facade as he allowed himself to degrade his actions through sheer passion. The black elf bid for a wildly swung sword slash but the elven princess easily parry he blade with her arm blades before in one fell swoop, she cut sliced Vokhul's sword arm. His right side, clean off. The general wavered as he grasped his wounded limb his eyes vengefully looking back at his assailant with soul-piercing antagonism. Now you see what they are capable of? What I am now capable of Lord Vokhol. Aliathra inhaled her breath, accepting herself for what she had become. May no one remember your name, but before she could finish Vokhol off with a swift stab through his heart. The elven ranger's cybernetic hand was blocked off by the flighted intervention of one of Vokhul's Acropolis wardens. My lord, you must run now, he shouted as multiple black elven survivors, specifically one sorcerer and two more wardens grabbed hold of their general. They were on a bound to protect him with their last breath before any harm could fall to him, which they failed a few seconds earlier but not again. We must flee while we can. We have to report to the Camarilla of what great tragedy had happened. They must know the true power of these other worlders. The surviving sorcerers advised as he prepares a spell that will allow them to be teleported a short distance away for an opportunity to escape. They can only bring a few of themselves of no more than four people at a time as best as the sorcerer's ability could. We will hold them off for as long as you can. Tivna shall welcome us to her garden. Metalius guide your path my lord. The warden stoically readied himself to lay down his life for his master. Seeing that the window of escape is slowly closing in and it would be dooming more elven lives to the slaughter if he indeed stands and fight now rather than flee to tell the tale. Lord Vokhol, one of the Crimson Lancers, reluctantly nodded to his valiant bodyguards as he and those who volunteered to spirit him away were enraptured by the sorcerer's spell. Do not think you have bested me yet demons. The Midnight Camarilla will have its revenge. He glared his golden eyes piercingly on Aliath Rezazius as the spell whisked him away from their sight. He will retreat for now and reassess his strategies with his fellow Crimson Lance appears and the Midnight Camarilla. As he disappeared from view the surviving black elves looked over the horizon to see the now relieved defenders of New Argonia close in towards them. They readied their weapons and prayed to their gods that they will all perish a valiant end. Surrender now, a voice echoed from a speakerphone across all the way to the keep, and you will be spared. Vlosarian. The die-hard black elf survivors cried as they gave on last battle cry as they attempt to cut down as many of these other worlders with them. Each kill they shall make, an offering, a gift to Weidel's unconquerable altar. The battlefield for he demands his worshippers to sacrifice themselves all in their pursuits, in their struggles against all obstacles. 
they did not retreat. None of them surrendered, they fought with the savage fury of ones who had nothing left to lose as they raced for whatever souls they could take with them off of this mortal coil. The youth had no choice but to gun them down. There were however several of them who received the butt of the other worlders' rifles where they bring the shame of being captured alive but they were a drastic minority. For the other 344 survivors of the 170,000 expeditionary force of a completely wiped out Black Elven army. The Lan Yu and Ju Fief coalition have taken 1,008 dead and of about 3,461 injuries during the Battle of New Argonia. Despite the great mark of losses in the ongoing campaign of Gleesian pacification, it was an astounding strategic victory for the Federation as they now have a secured foothold and road access across all of the Imperial Slaeijan heartland, most especially one wide road straight towards the heart of its power. Herring point. But overall, for Strider group who are found now resting and allowing a sigh of relief that they had all pulled through alive, especially Sergeant Clay who was cleared off of his injuries after a quick application of anti-venom and medigel. Captain Rose was just glad that it was finally over. Unzipping slightly the tight constrictions of her Hecate suit, she let go, exposing a part of her cleavage as she retired her weary back near a demolished piece of debris and took a well-deserved nap. At the warmth companionship of her close and true followers. Dash. With Nugonia secured. There is nothing but a clear road ahead of us to Herring Point. Colonel Polonsky met with Major Holyfield in the flesh. Additionally, Diaz and the Apara Mercs managed to not only rescue the Black Elven slaves but also secured a forward position from the remains of their war camp. That is good news Colonel. Now the Imperial seat lays before our grasps. We must strike when the iron is hot before the Imperials have time to regroup into the capital. Holyfield nodded. My marines and your militia folks will see to it our ringed flower flies proudly atop of the Imperial Senate building. Remember, I will lead the vanguard for this assault. I must be there to claim the throne from Ulan. Prince Klovich nodded as he held an ice pack over his head from a bruise he had collected during the earlier battle. Which you will Prince, you will, Holyfield reassured him. Colonel. Get all of your men resupplied and ready. We converge our forces on Herring Point in due haste once you're back to cohesion. We are going to end this war now. Holyfield tightened his fist. For soon, the last breath of this pointless and bloodied war can be at a close, victory and the land of Gleesia now lay before them, they can all almost taste, see and feel the dying breaths of the old world's embers crumbling away as its ashes become the foundation for the new mandate. Clovich's Amelioration, Chapter 53, The Siege of Herring Point Unthinkable the valorous anthems of patriotism that trumped over the imperial capital's skylines became silent as plague hysteria gripped the city. Heralds had begun to grimly narrate the demise of the 22 legions, the dwarf and volunteer army and the black tree expeditionary force and the complete collapse of the Emperor Alden's dragon wall were heard all throughout the Slay Egen's beating heart. In place of supplely caravans and depots, refugees and survivors of the other world as attacks flooded the capital as the imperial logistic systems were stretched well beyond its workable limits. Despair, anxiety, and disbelief flavored the mood of those who heard of the apocalyptic logs of the heralds of how the 22 legions, some of it not the best armies the empire had to offer of brave men, capable commanders, valiant knights and fearsome war beasts, were utterly decimated, rooted and scattered to the dusted winds. Within the meager span of three days, Allbone had indeed returned to their world to unleash his bloody vengeance upon his transgressors. They overcame the treacherous ampass of Marnia's bluff and the dragon wall. All such supposedly impenetrable defense lay violated, exemplifying to the Slay Aegeans that their strength was not enough to stem the otherworldly tide. Accounts from the survivors were chaotic to put it into imagination bluntly speaking. However, were those erudite enough to piece together the hysteria from discernible fact painted a very grim image of the unholy capabilities that the invaders possess.
They speak of an unending deluge of metal beasts followed by green-skinned minions that march tirelessly over the dragon wall casting devastating magics that obliterated their defenses in a fraction of a blinking eye. No matter how hard they try to push back, their weapons, their magics their armor broke, dissipate, and fell before the incoming flood of otherworlders who mercilessly slaughtered the valiant martyrs of the Dragon Wall. Even if one has given the providence of surviving the initial assault attempt to find the sanctuary amidst darkness and ruins would not be able to protect them. As in one different account from a Grey Order mage stated, the demons have seemed to have an advanced means of scrying the battlefield for whatever hapless survivors who managed to survive their initial attacks to be an easy feast for their drones of thralls to toy and slay as they please. Those who managed to run swiftly enough or were fortunate to attain a head start to flee north being the bulk of the refugees arriving in Herring Point. The Empire, in reaction to this development, scrambled desperately to aid the survivors and funnel through additional albeit subper reinforcements to what few holdouts were left consisting of. To make such dire tidings even grimmer, the demons had managed to subjugate the aid of various factions hostile to the Slay Aegean Empire or had held a grudge against recording back generations from the Dos and Centaur Beastmen, Goblin Tribesmen, and the most dreadful of all, the father of necromancy and the most profane of act of vampirism. King Martin the Lich King, creating a triumvirate of all of the Empire's most hated of enemies under the enthralling banner of the Otherworlders' many ringed star. Some Grey Order scouts even state that they even spotted the traitorous Carlyle with the shareholder and the corrupted Elven Princess. Amongst the invading horde, slaying uncountable multitudes of the Empire's finest with ruthless glee. The Legion's generals. In spite of this, eased such fears being beset upon the Emperor and the other plebeians of Herring Point that they can still salvage whatever survivors that they know can still be rescued back into the safety of the capital's protective bastion. They just need time to re-establish a form of cohesion with those who are left. They could still count on the salvation of both elven nations of the Entente and the Pact, knowing the latter, led by one of the Black Elven Anstrastrianis of the Crimson Lancer Lord Vokhol is holding his own as ordered. The former, arriving much later after an unfortunate delay at sea, once they can rally whatever is left of the legions and get more men levied from around the Empire they can, God's willing, a counterattack. Yet even still, below the very streets the nobility and elites of Slay Agent society desperately try to keep their nation from breaking apart. Chaos became the rule of law today. Amongst the denizens of Herring Point themselves the situation was much bleaker. For they who bore the full brunt of this most disastrous of shocks, a rush of panicked feet began to trot the paved roads of the imperial capital as riots over vital supplies and hastily private evacuations became the theme over the past few days as people rushed to leave to the safety of the north whilst others hurriedly hoarded supplies for themselves for the inevitable siege of the city. Others took sanctuary at the many minor temples dedicated to a deity of the Pantheon or at the Grand Cathedral. In a thirstful search of hope and meditation at this trying time, they seek an answer or a consoling word in the midst of this uncertain despondency. The more Banorzik of folks however rushed into the local taverns, brothels, and watering holes to attempt to drown their despair away with pleasure. The latter is much to the chagrin of the imperial legions and bureaucrats who have to cruelly yet mercifully kick said wasters away from such areas so they don't waste Herring Point's vital food supplies. All in all, the once ground jewel of humanity and Gleesia, of order and civilization had devolved into a barbaric heart of a darkened jungle where Darwinian principles clash with what little defenses the paragons of peace and stability could steadfastly stand against such apocalyptic transpiration as all walks of the Slay Aegean Empire's public order hang delicately on a thread. To address the evolving crisis, Emperor Alden and the Imperial Senate declared an emergency congress of all the Slay Aegean Empire's leadership within Herring Point's senatorial dome. The tension in the room remained on a hung by the thread between determined diligence and stressful scouring as the first phase of the congress were the witnesses of the ill-fated Dragon Wall's defenders who managed to tumble their feet back into the capital's walls. Every last one of them? 
have perished? Sir Hewitt interrogated, his eyes, exposed with unbelief, pierced down through subject of his inquiry, a lonesome survivor of the ill-fated Dragon Wall who presented himself onto the Grand Chamber Hall of the Imperial Senate. It was nigh preposterous upon his tears to believe at the very first hearing for the Chief General of the Imperial Legions that he had effectively lost over half of his forces, plus the additional supplements from mercenaries and allies to the Dark Lord's forces in all over a week. Yet the continued grisly testimonies were given out by various messengers, many of him his own friends and friendly of subordinates in the Legion give out the same tale as along with the previously grim written messages he got as the last words of salutations from the generals he had sent to defend the Dragon Wall, that the demons from the other world, with their magics, absolutely obliterated all the defenses of the Dragon Wall allowing them to pour through to soft-bellied slay each an interior pillaging the heartlands as they speak. Indeed, I saw all of my brothers perish so swiftly and yet so dishonorably by the demon's magics. The otherworlders and their thralls are like an inferno, overpowering and overwhelming everything in their path pry out Cadliza, a survivor from Marnia's bluff bowed. The Dark Lord's forces have learned from their previous mistakes and are likely marching to the capital in due haste as we speak. He bowed as he took his leave in front of the Congress of Nobles. By the gods, this has been a disaster. Emperor Alden somberly covered his face, hiding away his anguish from his lesser peers to not show his decaying weakness. All hope is not lost, Your Majesty. Grand Master Owen inspirited the Emperor. We must activate the ancient defences of the city at once my lord, he sagely advised the beleaguered emperor. Yes, yes, if we can hold the capital for at least two weeks we can gradually move and the northern legions and evacuate most of the capital's populace to the safety of Marv's. Sir Hugot added, then we combine our strengths with Prince Valorian's men and push back the invaders. The general demonstrated his plans, pushing alongside the token standees representing the Slay Aegean legions and Ethylan elven armies towards the demons who now littered the imperial southlands from Vercourt to Tifrate. Yes. We may still have the advantage. Alden, now thirsted with hope, aroused from his despondency. He has nearly forgotten about Herring Point's mythical defences that are bested against any challenger during the Empire's infancy into its present day, fighting off barbarians' invasions and monster attacks alike. As of this present moment my lord, we can deploy up to eight cohorts strong of our recent levies to create a means of relief for what remains of our dragon wall garrisons, Hugit advised. The more soldiers that the Legion can break out of the encircled defenders, the better their second line of defense could stay strong. Do take care, that you handle those blah. The Emperor, now realizing his general mentioned about the survivors more in detail was about to say his piece about the most troublesome of allies, one who call themselves the Black Tree Pact who were sent to relieve the forces stationed around the vital roadway town of New Argonia. Bang, bang, bang. Three abrupt knocks from the grand double-sided door of the Senate's assembly hall rang greatly under the room. Under normal protocols, this would have been a scandal a speech yet such emergent times allowed some leeway in sudden influxes of new information to immediately trickle into the Empire's halls of power to be presented within correct reason. Emperor Alden, it is I, Lord General Vokhol of the Crimson Lancers. Let me in at once. The Black Elf General, once whose voice oosed with elven confidence had brought himself humbled upon the younger race of man. It was the most unexpected of interruptions for the Imperial Court. They had all thought that the Black Elf was busy fighting hordes of demons in New Orgonia at this moment, but to have him here in the capital brings about many questions and none of which that the Court had wished to never ask. Let him in. Emperor Alden commanded the sentries stationed by the door. The two guards bowed and obediently pulled open the heavy door's intricately carved façade allowing the Black Elf and his retinue inside the senatorial hall. To those in attendance is horror, Lord Vokhal entered the hall decrepitly, exposing an uncensored glance of what the other world as weapons are capable of inflicting upon a subject. 
the black elf was left heavily marred upon his image compared to his previously sanguine self when his tens of thousands strong parade of the pact's finest marched through the capital to pledge their support to the Alliance of the Light on their second sacred war. He sullenly sported several gashing scars across his face that were barely bandaged and stitched back together giving the black elf a tragic comical. He also had sash that hid little to imply that his most recent expeditions had cost him his right arm, not wanting to further display the scurrilous exposition of what his shameful defeat had brought him. Lord Vokhal, what are you doing here? Should you know? Hubert began to inquire of his sudden appearance but he was immediately interrupted by the elf's shrill cut off. What in Nania's name happened to you? The invaders were more contentious than I had previously thought. Vokha faked a cough as he made his way to the podium to stand for himself amongst the entirety of the Imperial Slay Aegean Court and Senate. What of your army? Alden leaned his ears closer to hear from what the elf had wished to so urgently interrupt this exigent gathering at the direst of times. What of this pact's finest? He pressed for answers. My men, all brave sons and daughters of true Alphalnora had made their stand in New Argonia my lord. Vokhol began to explain his prepared speech by softening his voice to a more refined accent. A only dot I have survived. And now I stand before you to speak on not only on behalf of my nation but of those who have fallen. He had practiced these upcoming statements, all tailor made for the maximum penetration of appeal as per instructed by his midnight Camarilla masters who behind the scenes were doing their best to make good onto their interests during this crisis behind all their rivals. Most especially the Earth Islands backs having arranged several favors to mold the developing situation from a military disaster into a political advantage. Subsequently, for himself, Vokhal needed to salvage his wounded pride from the embarrassment of returning to Herring Point in transmortifying tatters. Once he had finished his formalities with the humans in the Imperial capital, Lord Vokhal and his surviving soldiers are to return to Turnimloth to enact their contingencies to ensure that Alphilnora remains strong in the wake of this impending crisis. He couldn't risk divulging the humiliating details of his defeat that his wounded pride disallowed him to confess to the Imperial nobles, lest he humiliates not only the Black Tree Pact but also himself. But the true agenda of his deceit was for more politically cunning beneath the surface. He knew that even if the bright star of the Earth Island armies, the Crown Prince Valorian Luther is a glory seeker, he is ultimately responsible for the lives of his men. If the Imperial defeat is too crushing of a situation for the late arriving Earth Island forces who had been delayed by an unfortunate astrayment by an unblessed storm, then Prince Valorian may be hesitant to fully deploy the capabilities of the Earth Island's finest. From orders from the Midnight Camarilla, to salvage this minor deracination is to keep the Crown Prince and his army as far away as possible from his homeland as Lord Vokhal could. If they play the right moves on the board at the correct timings, then this transgression could be reversed into a blessing in disguise. An unending deluge met before them by the other worlders. We had fought valiantly and with our prowess, we had gloriously pushed back the demons to the very borders of Tyrian near the Duchy of Tefrate. But alas, the victory was at a great cost for I lost all of my men and beasts during the campaign. He lied, acting out a solemn lowering of his head still reeling with both mournful differences to those brave elven souls. You managed to push them back? Alden's weary heart leapt with hope upon hearing this most gracious of news it was a ray of hope from a sea of distress. Indeed, but only for about a week or more, I believe if judging by the distance of Tyrian and New Orgonius they may have been defeated once for now, but they will surely return to strength in the coming days. Vokhal honeyedly impelled. If you can use these precious days ahead to build your defenses from what remains of your armies then perhaps you may be able to marshal more of your men into your nation's defense. My lord, this could be all of the time we need to rally not only our northern legions but also the rest of our allies too. Hubert bowed. The emperor rested behind his throne contemplating what his general had counseled him on. The Northern Legions were gradually trickled down moderately compromising the security consisting several of the Northern Dawson lands of Sainagrad to the Beast folk barbarians in order to supplement manpower into the south for the Crusade. 
There were still several more legions who have not yet reported their commanders to him as of late and this sudden break in the war effort could indeed give him the time the northern reinforcements needed to march into Herring Point's relief. From a real politique point of view, the near total annihilation of the Black Elf expeditionary force was just what Emperor Aldin wished to hear from the Black Elf in general as he didn't have to suffer through many of these elves and their diplomatic pressures with both the Entente and the Pacts as he much prefer to handle with the former than the latter. The same idea was also given to the Dwarves and the White Elves who needed more time to train and acquisition their manpower and supplies too. Additionally, more time of study and research for the mages of the College in the Arts of Anti-Demonic Wards could also better prepare the Empire for the Dark Storm ahead, most especially for the Empire's new champion, Faithlen Garmhaik, Your Majesty. Faithlen's voice perturbed the Great Halls, his impetuousness reverberating within his tone. You should let me lead our troops to Tyrian and vanquish the demons once and for all. I grow tired of sitting idly by here in the capital while our home is being invaded by these other worlders. It was a great mistake for not letting me in the front lines for I would have surely defended the Dragon Wall and Tifreit would not have fallen. But most of all we wound not even need the aid of those black elves. Faith Lean arrogantly proposed. Do you have no clue of what we had just talked about you brat? Vokhol was left astonished by this chosen one's ineptitude. Your strength is not yet enough to challenge the demons. Look here. The corrupted princess, Aliathro had taken my right. What can you do better? The black elf challenged, says the one who then exulted that they will vanquish the demons all by themselves. Faith Len snidely fired back. Such lack of tact of yours. It is a miracle by the gods that you are still standing here after the Astrix. The Black Elf General scoffed away his hand across dismissively to the young knight. I have you know that I have been practicing my magics for the past week ever since I had returned to Herring Point. I had studied through all of the most powerful of magics from the college such as Fireball Barrage, Final Transmutation, and Thunderstorm. Faithlan boasts of his achievement. All of that learned. In a week, Vokhol jerked his lithe brow. This youth couldn't be more delusional. The Black Elf may not be that too deep within the many written laws of magics but he knew from a fundamental level that the spells that this arcane knight is proudly aggrandizing about were of a high level of combat magics that takes years of refinement from studying lesser potent of related spells and additional practice to safely cast. Learning them all for the past week has described it's although not impossible is highly advised against by even the most aggressive of magical tutors for such spells require an extensive investment of discipline to effectively cast and control such a physically and mentally taxing spell, less the spell will backfire on users which is called in the magical community as overcasting. Additionally, his over-dedication in ostentatious destruction spells would blind him to the reality of spell-fighting duels as such confrontations between mages require a whole vast anthology of many different spells two or more schools and the creative application of said spells principles and characteristics. He was all attack, no defense. Although he is not dismissing the boy's ascendant talent as word of mouth did say he is indeed quite a prodigious adept in the arcane arts, his impetuousness could easily be his most fatal of flaws. This chosen one Vokhol grinned annoyingly towards the emperor to display his dissatisfaction. The boy has much to learn if he is ever able to fulfill his calling. He subtly showed his disdain for Faith Len. How dare you mock me? Faith Len lashed. He attempted to charge towards the Black Elf to deliver a piece of his bruised mind, but he was physically stopped by Petra and Findrum. This not the time for childish squabble boy. There is still much work to be done. Petra reprimanded him as he dragged the fire-blooded young boy out of the senatorial hall. An equally bothered sigh escaped Alden's body to signify his reciprocated displeasure of Faith Len's rash behavior. The kid has simply no cloud of talent in the subtle dance of diplomacy. I have done as much as I can to all of you people of the Empire of Slaeja, but alas, a general without an army is like a sailor without a ship. 
I do ache to announce that I under the direct orders of my midnight Camarilla that I must formally declare the Great Black Tree Pact's withdrawal from the Zanagrad continent. Vokhol addressed eloquently to the rest of the midnight Camarilla's message to the Empire regarding the recent events. I must now beg for my leave. A galleon bound for Jaisalum will embark within the hour. The Black Elf General gracefully left the podium and with a deceitful smile masked under a burlesque tour of contentment over how the first chapter of the Midnight Camarilla's plans moving forward in this crisis has now been completed. Upon Vokhor's exit, the attendees realigned themselves to the immediate case in hand of defending the Empire, drawing their focus onto the wide war table in the center of the room. A great many of refugees from the eastern provinces have been flooding into Herring Point every day and as ordered, we have been re-diverting their caravans to migrate northward, we have also been able to collect over four thousands of able-bodied men to replenish the legion's numbers. One general reported, I have been countlessly reassured by you, all of my faithful generals the Imperial Legion remains as capable and battle-ready in spite of the crisis but my curiosity has been elated towards our adversary. The other world is themselves. Alden raised, if I may, me to the crow master, who throughout the time inside the room had been quietly leaning over one of the many pillars of the great hall roguishly absorbing the drabble being spread about by the high tables of society. However, beneath all of that sea of imaginative speculation amalgamated with fractured facts. The Crow Master had sent it a hint of something not tallying properly. What is it Crow Master? Owen asked her, the Black Elf. He seems to be awfully in a hurry to leave the capital so swiftly. Despite his current stature, she cautiously chose her words to convey her suspicions. The Midnight Camarilla is not the most patient of folks in all of my years speaking with them and their vibrant kindred, Owen answered. I mean no disrespect to his losses, but the way he made his speech earlier, of how he talks about his so-called victory, his demeanor is rather fearful for someone who had managed to hold back the invaders all the way to Tyrion as he said, Mita aired her suspicions. What are you implying? He had just lost thousands of his men. Owen pressed, the way he held himself, it was like if he was just a prey who had barely escaped a hunter's trap. Did you not see his bandage wrappings? I wouldn't feel as fervent if I finished a quest only to be as brutalized as him. Mita shared her empathic acumen. There was a premonition deep down hidden behind all the bravados the elf had me agely ransomed about his loss to the imperial court. Crow master, I believe you dally in a place that is unnecessary for your brilliance to waste upon. Owen realigned her focus. What we must drive our current attentions is to the defense of Herring Point. The crow sighed. There was much more pressing matters than a military withdrawal to put her mind to about. Perhaps she was indeed overthinking too much and not narrowing herself down to the task that matter. As I was speaking, Huguet grabbed both of the two masters' attention towards him. Herring Point's supply caches cannot sustain the current population of both the city's burghers and the refugees. In addition, our close proximity to the front line has left the Emperor and the Imperial Court in a most vulnerable position. The Marshal explained. What are you attempting to say? One of the nobles asked. It is with a hesitant heart and my thousands of apologies for this offense I am about to state, but we must, if the crisis does escalate, all non-combatants of Herring Point are to be evacuated from the capital to allow the garrison to further entrench the city, including the imperial family. Huguet answered forthrightly, this is preposterous, and allow them to ravage the cathedral? The college and the Grand Lodge. Owen raised his voice in protest. Many more of the nobles and lower of ranked officers of the Legion joined in the protest. Herring Point was not only the strongest fortress of all the bastions of the Imperial lands, but was the beating cosmopolitan heart of the Empire. To abandon the city, to allow the risk. Silence. Alden yelled, with only one word, the assemblage's protest swiftly quelled albeit temporarily. What the Priout Cadliza speaks is undoubtedly without his own justifiable merit of his thought. Alden explained. But we must learn to compromise ourselves. The Black Elf, as much as he was an interesting character to host within our halls had bought us time. A week. The Emperor defended his marshal's plan. A week. 
To preserve the continuity of the Empire is what I speak of. Sir Hubert adjured, we must rescue whatever relics of power, people of influence, and what little strength the Empire has left as it escapes towards the north where we can re-establish our control. Even if the capital fall, we may able to still have the soul, the spirit, the idea of the Slay Aegean Empire lives on even of Herring Point if were to valiantly burn to ash. One week, Owen muttered, it was such a short time, and not nearly enough time to evacuate all the important archives of knowledge the College of Magi's libraries had, nor to evacuate the magical relics locked inside the cathedral and the Grand Lodge. For the Grand Master, he had to make a very much difficult choice without the ability to discreetly subvert himself into an advantage. Some of those prized treasures will be inevitably lost no matter how much he pushes to save them. He has to choose which gets saved and which will be defiled. I have accepted if God's fate it that if Herring Point may fall, that if the other worlders are to devour me and my men, all I ask of you, although the materium capital would be raised and its ashes grinded to the earth. I can die honorably knowing that the Empire's soul, its people, its history, knowledge, and treasures are safe. The Marshal issued his proclamation, Can you do this one simple? Wish for the Empire I have fought for my entire life for that I love and cherish for? He challenged the congregation. A moment of silence lurked within the hall before one such senate raised his hand saying signifying his approval of the plan. He was then followed by those attendees sitting beside him followed by those across him. Before long, the whole senatorial hall erupted their hands in unanimous concordance. The senate has agreed with the whole of their hearts. Huguet smiled, knowing his hopes were answered. Then all is settled. Every one of us shall contribute to the preparations for the defense and evacuation of the imperial capital. Alden stood up from his throne to address the congregation. With a heart revigorated by the sage counsel of his generals, the Empire of Slaeja may yet be able to fight on even at the very midst of this. We have only a week to. The Emperor was about to dismiss the assembly but just as he is about to say bless to ducks, the Senate Hall's grand doors were forcibly barged open. A heaving knight entered the chamber to the newly locked gaze of the Imperial Court. What is the meaning of this? The Emperor bawled towards the gate crasher. I, are the demons. They are approaching the capital. The knight exhaled his answer, dash. After a tense skirmish of the peripheral defences of the imperial capital, the combined manoeuvre battalions of eastern and western army groups have now herring point within their sights. It took a day of a hasty replenishment of supplies, men, and materials to fully capitalise on the breakthrough both forces had managed to carve around their respective areas of responsibility, previously speaking. The Federation's intelligence teams had also been reaping the rewards of the most recent invasion by scavenging the battlefield for valuable artifacts and documents useful for both military relevant information and scientific data gathering, specifically from the recent Battle of New Argonia with all of their discarded elven equipment and anomalous fauna laying around for them to dissect and analyze. The heavy defeats inflicted upon the Imperials had bolstered the mood between the two armies as overall confidence soared amongst the ranks, especially the newly formed Lanier army of Prince Clovich whose men grew ever more confident that they can achieve another victory with this momentum with their new equipment and growing veterancy as a modernized force at hand. This is it, once we break down this wall it's only just a fjord's ride away from planting the seven-ringed flower at top of the imperial palace. Holyfield marveled from his view in person view of the city of Herring Point, its lamplit skyline flickering across the minor agricultural lands that separated the combined youth and Lanier army from their prize. He wanted to personally oversee with his own two eyes the conclusion of his latest military campaign coming down from the Aurora to see the Ufif Stagger deliver the coup de grace against the Empire. By now, he had already written up the plan of battle once the coalition's forces break through the walls. Polonsky's men would help secure the civilian sectors of the capital and focus on crowd control and other support functions whilst the Prince's Lanier soldiers will push through all the way to administrative districts of Herring Point. As for him and his marines, 
They will focus on neutralizing the commercial and industrial areas of the city to secure Prince Klovich's left flank facing the waterside. In addition, intelligence gathering groups led by his own Navy SEAL teams coordinated by Agent de Sutte will storm three key locations, the Grey Order's Grand Lodge, the College of Magi, and the Cathedral supported by several new magic countermeasures and detecting equipment courtesy of Dr. Malona's research and APARA Corporation funding. De Sutte was unusually enthusiastic almost awaiting with sadistic catharsis readying to burst within him when it comes to the prospect of being the one to kick the door down on those three power centers of imperial might that it had unnerved both Captain Rose and Colonel Polonsky. But Major Holyfield reassured him that if there was anyone who can turn a serene sanctuary into a marauded mangle with anything worth of value that wasn't nailed down taken, the Bureau of Intelligence agent was the man for the job. Do not forget the banner of Tyrian, Prince Klovich reminded. Remember, this is also my war, not of conquest but revolution. He tightened his fist ardently. Conquest and revolution are the one in the same Prince Klovich. It is a victory against an adversary. The culmination of one system. A way of life. An idea triumphing over the other. Holyfield argued in our case, a system of the old ways versus and the new, and we are the new. He stated firmly as his arms articulated expressing his devoted enthusiasm to final victory being just within sight. I agree, but I must remind you, these are my people Major, and this is the Imperial Capital. By all accounts, the next great acts we will undertake this day shall be heard throughout the world. The Prince answered. Sir, Pigeon is in flight and is ready for the broadcast. Is the Prince ready? A communication officer approached the two men. Yes, yes, the people of Herring Point shall hear my voice. The prince nodded. He was escorted to a nearby tent where equipment designed for a live holographic broadcast was set up for the prince. Klovich had insisted that ever since the beginning of the conflict that this war has officially started by him rather than the Federation. And this war was not of conquest but a revolution a war of salvation to stop the Empire from their hubris. Although now that he thinks of it, what is the difference between those two words? Regardless, his claim to the imperial throne and the backing of his other world or patrons must be legitimized by the people he will soon rule over. He sees all of his generals who followed him from Tyrian and his federation allies and advisers as they await his word by his beckon. For Prince Clovitrian, he had once been their puppet of violent masters but now like the wise emperor of Japan Meiji of Earth Sold had prepared, he made his king's speech stepping forward to the visual capture of the red flickering camera. To the people of the imperial capital of the empire of Slaeja, Herring Point, this is Prince Klovich of the formal vassal state of Tyrian now the leader of New Zanigrad. I come with my newly armed legion known as the Luo Ed Arfog New Zanigrad all blessed with weapons and magics that your legions have no chance of defeating. All of those supplied by these other world as you call the United Federation of Earth. We have marched from Tyrian to exact justice upon the Imperial Army out of your unreasoned fear, naivete and reckless in conducting unreliable divination magic, this legions hastily branded the other worlders as demons and my people as corrupted thralls with zero evidence and understanding of who the other worlders truly are. This result in the burning of half Tyrian and the death of 600 innocents of my subjects. My people along with dozens more of the Federation's own men, women and children. The Imperial Court along with their Grey Order and Magi conspirators perpetrated this heinous act which will not be unanswered for nor forgiven. I arrive now with my army upon the site of Herring Point to see that these offenders pay for their act of not only the crime of unjust aggression but the very betrayal of my trust. Between Legion Vassal especially made UAV flew across from the coalition's position to the battlements of the capital's defensive walls where it hovered before the alerted sentinels. A holographic projector attached to its snout displaying a mirror image of the prince displayed alongside high decibel speakers, as powerful enough to fit inside the UAV, to relay his words. 
However, those of innocent of burghers and of still common sensed within the city will be spared from our righteous wrath. I know most of you still believe me as some kind of demonic puppet and the Federation are the demons of old, but as my final words before I commence the assault, I ask for every soul in within the city, stay in your home and do not get in my army's way if you value your lives and I assure you by my noble honor that you will not be harmed. All of the misunderstandings of this rebellion and this second demonic invasion shall be resolved once the Slay Egen regime has been appropriated to my control. Clovich grieved for air as he concluded his speech to the silent ovation of his followers who bowed before his conciliatory words of choice. He was a man of his ideals in spite of his young age. His only hope now is that his message has come through. Sir. They shot Pigeon down. The UAV operator quickly breached the tensed silence of the room. He hovered over his monitor screen displaying a magical missile fired from one of the mages stationed atop one of the watchtowers of the capital smite down the bird before falling into static. Emperor Elden is making a mistake. A grave mistake. Prince Klovich clenched his fist as his nerves pulsated by the suicidal defiance by his former imperial masters. There is no other way through but through the walls, I am afraid my lord. Edmerl pushed his walking staff to shift his body towards his liege, with a heavy heart. He confessed to the grim reality. It has seemed so. Do I have your word to commence the assault? Colonel Polonsky, who also wished just the same to personally see the conclusion of this war with the planet's natives on the ground asked. Do you do it? But no longer than what we agreed upon. Clovich reluctantly gave the order. Rail hammer this is shield father. You are clear for the attack. Commence five minute barrage on all targets within phase line Bronco. Start the show. Colonel Polonsky ordered. Affirmative. Cannons bringing the house down. The 4th Artillery Company's commanding officer answered. Having just pre-sighted their Militech earthquake SPGs and dull MLRS onto phase line Bronco, otherwise the Imperial walls of the capital on their geometric calculations. The 4th Artillery Company loaded their artillery's 155mm shells and Jericho cluster missiles to their launchers. After one final conditional check on their firing trajectories, callsign Rail Hammer unleashed the Federation's fury upon their cannons. Prince Klovich capped his hand atop of his eyes as he looked over the sky's horizon as the firing trail left in the artillery's wake zoomed over the sky. At first, like birds who soared near to the heavens, but as they traveled further, they began to descend like howling ghosts upon the imperial walls. Being the very beating heart of the Slegion's grip, generations of imperial emperors, long-minded of generals and architects had invested extraneously in exotic and expansive improvements to the battlements from stations affixed with an arsenal of siege engines and defensive countermeasures, the replacement of standard quarried stone to the much hardier imports from the dwarven mountains to the enchantment of protective magical runes to supplement the wall's impressive integrity. But as the Federation's high command blanketed the sky with humbling fire, their eyes gazed upon noticing that several of the shells began to prematurely explode stories high of the city limits, harmlessly illuminating the skyline with high explosive fireworks. At a brief glimpse over the horizon, one can see the faint refraction of light shaping itself into a dome-like structure over the imperial capital as if it was a sanctimonious shield angelically protecting the city from harm. At first, the Federation paid no heed upon this minor setback, thinking it was one final pitched attempt to prevent annihilation but as minutes passed, and more shells and missiles ineffectively detonating over Herring Point, the commanding officers of Operation Haymaker were taken aback as they concluded that their enemy has elevated their war game. God damn it, how strong is that shield? Rail Hammer radioed. The artillery commander's vexation on air for the commanders to hear. He and the rest of his artillery team, who had so far had devastated many of the Imperial Slay Aegis finest with the utmost impunity were humiliated as their mandated five-minute barrage had ended without any so effect to the city whatsoever from their efforts. 
They had wasted over a hundred of their artillery shells for their bombardment. Looking over the horizon with their binoculars as the commanders of the coalition army can spot the faint refraction of light weaving around the city in its warding grace. It was like the building wired shields from before. The resilient sphere spell as they call it, but a much stronger one encompassing all of Herring Point. Major, the Slaegians are counter-barraging us. Polonsky raised as suddenly. Several youth positions were being harassed by several storms of arcane and elemental magics throughout their camp. The youth thief and Lanier did as best as they could to brace for impact, but still, they obtained casualties doing so. Blasted. Get me the Indian Sea on the line. I want that shield glassed at once. Holyfield gnashed his teeth. He was not a patient man, nor was the party and high command back home were too. He would turn the city of the dust if he had his own way of the rules of engagement. Colonel Polonsky quietly nodded, equally sharing in his sentiment. It would be an embarrassment if they are to be behind schedule of what this otherwise to be a simple pacification campaign. Colonel do not do that. Samantha yelled abruptly as she and the rest of her squad rushed themselves hastily towards the commanders of the operation. My calculation from the Isaac's mana sensors told me that although the orbital bombardment can break the shield by its kinetic power alone, it will also level the whole city to dust. Collateral damage and loss of life will be too high for anyone back home to stomach. She grieved her protests. The Major intrigued his wrinkled forehead as he leaned his gaze onto the red-headed officer. Then how do you propose we should instead Captain? That shield is stopping us dead. He knew that the Captain and her abilities give her a degree of merit unique to her and so far he calls, although not by the book nor as conventional at first thought had always produced the most amiable of results for him as of both the Major's and Colonel's tour of glee easier. They wonder what sort of plan Captain Rose has concocted now. Carlia, tell them. Samantha gestured meekly to the Slaegian defector. The shield protecting the Imperial capital is being powered by a series of devices known as mana obelisks, enchanting the spell from within the city, the college major elucidated. Within the city, the major questioned. As a senior member of the college, I understand the full details of the mana obelisks. The shield is connected to each other through a centralized mana geomantic web through a giant mana crystal, the mirror of Ancelus, acting as its source. The mirror's energy is dispersed evenly throughout the city through these mana obelisks that are publicly accessible landmarks embedded all around Herring Point. Carlyle further divulged. Web, like some sort of power grid? Holyfield inquired. So, these obelisks are used by your former collegiates? Verily, the obelisks are used for the city's defenses and the occasional research activity into the Ethereum's winds for the college. Carlyle nodded. So? We find these mana obelisks and destroy them to get rid of the shield? The colonel inquired. We must not destroy the obelisks. Doing so would allow mana energies from violently implode upon us. Severing its connection from the ether, the mirror of Ancelus, is much more prudent solution. Carlyle strongly called out Polonsky's barbarous plan. A ritual must be cast by an adept to sever its power. She added, so just turn it off then? I see. The colonel bowed. Do that and the shield goes away, the shield would gradually scale down to cover less of the entirety of the city, the less mana energy being allowed to circulate throughout the city shall in turn allow your soldiers to summon your great weapons from afar. You can also pay no worry about retaliation against the mages that are levied to defend them the more you sever the obelisks from their power. She nodded. It looks like we don't have much of a choice of what we can work with Major. Polonsky turned to Holyfield. We have to send boots to those obelisks and hold them long enough to wipe them off the board. Indeed, that mana network will surely give us hell even in partial operationality. Holyfield shook his head. Carlyle, where would this mirror of Ancelus be? We are also interested in that artifact too. It is unlikely they have moved it from its vault within the College of Magi. I know of a route through Kobold's Hollow to allow us entry while avoiding most of the guards. The collegiate nodded. The kobolds hollow? Dasard asked. Aye. A series of underground tunnels used by the citizenry of Herring Point as cool storage rooms for their food, 
an underworld sanctuary for the rogues and beggars, and a safe shelter in case of sieges or other disasters that may befall on the city. The collegiate answered, I am one of the Grey Order guildsmen who can navigate the hollow with ease. Interesting, maybe trouble for us, or useful if we are willing to risk going in. The agent eruditely rubbed chinned up. There is the problem of reaching obelisks though. Samantha raised her hand. It was an afterthought that her court Carlia, in her rush to end the siege quickly soon discovered. How will she and Samantha enter the kobolds hollow now that the city has effectively locked down all means of entry? May anyone here give counsel? Carlia turned for answers. The shield doesn't prevent the entry of personnel? Ooh, people? Dasat clarified. The intellectual capacities of the Yuffie frown table absorbed the defector's information carefully. How could they deploy their men into a heavily hostile area? The obvious approach won't do because of the shield stunting our firepower. You would be cut off. Polonsky shared. There are eyes everywhere and the place is locked tight with structure enhancing runes for months. Years even. We can't fly them either. If the sphere can stop artillery bombardments. It could also stop airborne drops too. Plus, the pelicans will be vulnerable to zealous amounts of enemy mage fire. Holyfield added. He could still remember the haunting mayday cries of his airborne troops taking anti-air fire from magic missiles by the evocative battle mages all throughout the operation. No amounts of flares and electronic countermeasures would protect those unfortunate pelicans from crashing. It was as low-tech as it could get for fighting aerial opponents. Wait for the pelican to hover low while said ambusher is low themselves before blasting arcane fire onto the wingbeat beast. All of Herring Point's buildings were tightly packed bergs of commercial and residential areas with roads too narrow for a wide-spreading pelican to touch down soldiers onto without being exposed to the heavily entrenched defenders of the city that now swarm the area. The feasible landing zone simply put to too many possible ambushing angles for the defenders to counterattack. If we can't go over or through it then what about? Going underground? Diaz radically proposed. Carlia, does the resilience fear spell stop? Sapping? Digging a huge tunnel under? He asked. No, not at all. Carlia's eyes widened to this new proposal. We kick the door in on them and rush towards the obelisks and we switch them off, yeah? Dig in and hold them until the calf comes. Diaz smirked. I know for a fact about those Maximoff people bringing out some of their heavy industrial machines from their ships that are bound for the Aslrix. A fun corral of heavy mining drills called the Hypermoles. The Corpo relayed his unexpectedly extensive intercorporate intelligence to the group. How and why would you propose this? Samantha asked him. I know a guy who was in the exact same position as us right now. We mole ourselves past the walls and then emerge out then run to the mobilisks and waste anyone that tries to stop us. Diaz waved. Besides, I always wanted to know how this baby cuts. The corpo brandished his actocolite thermocarbon katana. Yes. Yes. If your team can move fast enough. Captain Rose. This might work. Dasat nodded. That could actually work. Samantha grinned astonishingly of the rather insane yet potentially effective proposition. Get your team geared for a hard long fight on all sides so the mages can them off. You will only need to sever the weave of three obelisks are closest by them. Carlyle further divulged. Good. Get those obelisks offline. I need that. Once they are down this should give us the break. We need for the troops to rush in. Once the walls are gone it's game over for the Imperials. Holyfield smiled coyly. And Herring Point shall be liberated from Emperor Ralden. Klovich raised his sword pre-celebratorily. He could now taste victory's sweet sucker mere inches from his mouth. You are adept in accomplishing impossible tasks let you rose. I place all of my prayers and faith complete unto your errantry. Prince gave his humble support. Just a head up though. The Hypermole's supply bay at its emptiest can at max maybe also hold eight of us with full gear on each if we squeeze tightly. Diaz added, his voice wincing me slightly. Basically, once we and we got to hit them hard and fast. Crocker cutting through all the formalized lingua. Then it is best we all gear up to the teeth for an intense firefight. Dig our pockets deep with extra ammo, grenades and drones to help us dig in on those keep positions. Samantha ordered, 
I will call in Mr. Yonantov to get those drills over stat. Colonel Polonsky acknowledged, dash. Several hours had passed within the Afif camp but Mr. Yonantov finally came through. Arriving in Maximov serial haulers swiftly from New Albany to Herring Point, three hypermole mining drills were being disembarked along with its driving crew ready for the dangerous task ahead. For each drill, there are to be three teams of men one of which is Strider Group lead by Samantha. The other two are with a fully recovered Hodden and King Martin of both express through enchanted hands twitching lustfully to smite with arcane fury against the people who had persecuted them. They were escorted by a selection of hand-picked seals from Major Holyfield equipped to the teeth with all of the best weapons and godspeeds the Federation can arm them. They are the Federation's vanguard, the sharpest tip of their spear against the heart of the Empire. Captain Rose triple checked the functionality of her FBR 20 bullpup and a pair of frag grenades on her payson as she nervously exercised her breath to console her pre mission fermentations. Among all of the missions she had undertaken so far, this wild eyed plan was perhaps the most dangerous she had been tasked to accomplish. Thanks in no part to Diaz's unconventional imagination. Even with her powers, there was still the choking fear Samantha sensed within her bones as she loaded the last cartridge of rifle ammo for her rifle before she sallied out. The mission is either going to be a success or she, knowing what the Imperials will likely do to her. Undeniably they will seek to capture her alive for her fabled powers. The captain can still remember the harrowing pleas of those natives preaching of their dogmatic religion of her destiny and their relentless determinism to claim her for themselves. She shudders to think of what they could likely do to her if they seize her knowing the medieval means they will likely use to correct her enthrallment as the saying goes. Closing her eyes to soothe her nerves, the captain pat her hands across her combat rig to remember where each of her essential tools are located at all times and making sure they are all secured in place. Looking onto her squad. She allowed a comforting facsimile of a smile to her squadmates to express outwardly confidence that she within still struggled to grasp onto her enduring self. Howbeit, seeing the sight of her companions stoically hanging ten near the edges of what little space they could muster reassured her that they too share her tensions. Crocker was at his usual stoic self, holding his LMG at the ready while brandishing his knightly Hercules exosuit. Clay tightly held onto a box-shaped container that held a Militech Janissary turret, a device useful for the inevitable defense of the obelisks. The same can be said for the squad's combat engineer. Kane who did the final checks of his flamethrower's nozzle and secondary carbine rifle. Iris meanwhile was by his side enchanting the very last few grenades with a variety of elements. The vampire witch caught Samantha's eyes and she smiled confidently about herself, reassuring her she will be at her very best for the coming fight. Diaz and Aliathra held their hands together. The elf cybernetics interacting with Diaz's carbon wired compressor augmented palms as Diaz held his katana vertically, the corpo being also equipped with a protective vest alongside his iconic tech pistol ruiner. The elf cleric was recently issued a brand new composite bow of the Aparo Corps design, boasting a superior drawing strength thanks to its moving pulley cables and well handled ergonomic compared to her old elven one. Although she did share the thought that when given the chance, she will paint the black aluminum surface of her new weapon to green as she finds the charcoal color to be too depressing for her tastes. Abidaya had armed himself tensely with a Mare 5 rifle modified for close quarters combat complemented with an underbarrel shotgun as his breath boiled as a hunter's anticipation seeped into him. The anticipation for a new kind of quarry, the most dangerous ones he had challenged to track and kill in all of his old life. His focus dead set against the alliance for killing his wife and daring to harm his only daughter. Such inimical eagerness permeated the drumming vibrations of the hypermole, as the Maximoff engineers bravely tunneled through below the noses of the Imperials. Oi, hustle up back there. A voice interrupted their conversation. It was from the Maximoff engineers piloting the drill. GPS is about to be green, we're just below the wall. He relayed, move and quick. We only get one shot at this. Crocker rallied the squad. Watch the roofs. 
watch the windows, watch any place the imps could be waiting for us. The captain added. The hypermoles engine howled impassionately as its titanium thermocarbon drill tip galvanized to its maximum output, tearing through the Gleesian soil with rapacious furor. The scheduled time of the assault was a few minutes past noon, as when the Imperials on watch above the walls had the planet's sun glazing into their eyes. At first, the yeoman paid no heed to the strange vibration thinking the rumbling below them were the march of their colleagues aroused from slumber, the walls were deployed double the foot count of watchmen as hastily demanded by Sir Hubert after all. Patrols were strict and their reconnaissance continuous reportings of any unusual movements they observe coming from the Federation's war camp whose horde of iron beasts and black-eyed warriors stand just a shy breath short from the range of their arrows and the magics. As of their arrival, the watch report activity outside of the other world as war camp being built up, a ruse the Federation fabricated to deceive the defenders of their true actions. Is Yer Tumbucha going out again Willie? A yeoman grassly turned to his partner. His fellow watchman paid no heed initially, longingly waiting for the relieving cockcrow of their watch station's Cody Adbird to signify the end of their shift where a warm bed and meal awaited the two. The creature every quarter of a day awake tweets a loud song that the Xenograds would often use to signify the beginning and end of daytime. But just as the yeoman was about to dismiss his partner's alleged flatulence, the rumbling intensified, spiking him away from his frivolous state. Before the bear could react, the ground where their feet rest upon on the watch station suddenly caved in as the two fell screaming down into their doom alongside any unfortunate countryman nearby. As from the abyss below, three great worms of metal skin emerged from the earth tearing through the surprised Imperials with rapacious abandon. It had slug-like bottoms that trough through the streets of Herring Point as its mighty nose shrieked like a banshee's wail as it pierced through even the most steadfast of spear walls beelining each separately to a different mana obelisks like a famished child racing for a meal, as the beast tore through the defenders of the capital. The guts and blood of those who foolhardily attempted to stop its rampage drenched the worms with an abominable odor, in a way, to those exiled old dwarves of the Aslrix. These worms seemed to bear the resemblance of one such terrifying construction they had attempted to bring the extinction of many cycles before. It was as if its ghost arose from its grave to seek its vengeance personally on those who had desired its elimination. Slot these imps fast. Crocker roared as the hatch doors of the hypermole burst open. Strider group hurled themselves into the fray of the bedeviled slayagens. Their weapons and magics seared through their unready formations like wet worked butter as they raced the cobble slab streets of the imperial capital. It was only a short sprint from where their drills had stopped till the teams each arrived at their designated obelisks. Carlyle's intelligence was correct when she mapped those magic disbursement devices on how powerful they were as the captain can attest. The mana obelisks were towering three-story tall rune-carved menhas that radiated with magical power. They were in ancient times used and erected by the first mages of the Slegion Empire as a means of drawing magical energies and as Carlyle spoke, a means of defense. Over time, as the imperial capital, the obelisks became impromptu landmarks that the burghers and visitors to Herring Point used to center their commercial activities near around. Looking on to such a magnificent specimen for Samantha, her mana hunger dripped wet with desire starving for the tempting power emitted out of her reach. It took the plucking of her combat rig from Corporal Cairn to fixate back to reality. How long do you need Carlyle? Samantha asked the defector. I just need a few moments to sever the connection. The collegiate answered. You have ten. The captain shouted as her eyes peered across the boulevard to the sight of a band of hastily half-armed Imperials charging across the blood-drenched streets of their city. Defensive positions now. Samantha, Clay, and Cairn gritted over a set of fetid odoured barrels where the latter deployed his Janissary turret with his C.O and squad radium and opening fire with their weapons. 
The automated turret was loaded with armor-piercing 5.56mm ammunition belt fed into its twin barrels that rained an unending flood of lead against the Imperials approaching from their east. Carlyas was immediately guarded by both Crocker and Daliathra of whom their symbiotic defenses, one of Terence Steel and the other Elven Abjuration kept her safe from those who wished to disrupt her ritual on the obelisks. When it came to offense, Diaz had taken the lead over Iris and Abidia. His mechanical augmentations along with the sword and pistol of his katana and Ruina made very short work of the legionnaires and battle midges above the rooftops. His enhanced body, and reflexes to the Imperials, the Crimson Demon massacred anyone he came across with inhuman speeds that many of the weaker will flee from his sight. Even managing to neutralize the mages crewing at least two altars of Talon that were responsible for the earlier counter barrages. For it was like a child trying to challenge a tempest when it came to the corpo's whirling blades. Iris elemental outbursts, and Abedias sharpshooting for the Imperials who only had at most a blade and the sandals on their feet to contest with. It was truly is the apocalypse when the Empire's proud legions were outmatched against the other worlders in every way imaginable. This is scalpel team. The lich turned the obelisk is offline. Clay's radio blared, then followed by static Blackfoot here. The little green man is singing. We should be done in 60. Over. Carlia, are you almost done? Samantha hollered. I need. Almost? Carlia gritted her teeth. Damn, they just keep coming. Crocker unnerved as he knelt down to reload his machine gun. Echida. Carlia smiled as she stepped away from the obelisk. As the collegiate had said, the obelisk's mana flickered away now cut off from its mother source. Samantha's growing hunger over the sight of power dissipated just as the light of the men has runes died away. With its harmonic ley lines disturbed, the resilient sphere spell, the Imperial Aegis over Herring Point began to wane. The crack in Herring Point's armor began to be exposed as the shield's safeguard left whimpering away from the Imperial Wall. It had only taken a second for those mages atop of the battlements to realize what had just happened before a barrage of the size of 150 mm and 100 kg worth of explosive payload obliterated them. A thousand cries of terror from those Imperials above the walls before sudden silence. Dust clouds of ashes and broken soot blanketed the outer districts of Herring Point in a grey winter as Strider Group and the seals emerged from the snow-like rubble. The silence left a tense moment for the special force team as they stood by attentively listening for an echo of sound as the dust slowly began to settle away. It was not long before the soldiers heard the sweet hum of a motorized vehicle. Two eyes, illuminated from behind the smog of what was once the very symbol of Imperial Slaage in power as an Arabian armored personnel carrier ported upon its back a leading squad of Tyranni Rafuir. They stoically braved over the crumbled walls with their halberd rifles at hand facing forward the new future they are about to create. As they looked on, hundreds and thousands more of Federation and Lanier troops and their vehicles began to overflow into Herring Point as the joint windmill flag and the Federation's flare o Septanks flew triumphantly towards their destiny like a bride with her groom. Dash. The shareholder had done it. It was a complete and utter rout. Prince Klovich witnessed from over the reinforced safety of the APC he rode upon as his steed or in the terms of the Federation's military doctrines equivalent to command vehicle the sight of his men flooded through the Imperial capital, tearing through the barricades, bastions, and bars that separated him from his prize through the weight of his numbers and iron beasts. Many of the survivors retreated deeper into the Imperial capital in strong points to mount up a final stand but eventually. They will fall just as the rest of the capital will. Those numbers who wavered behind immediately surrendered to the overwhelming coalition soldiers. The prince staringly emerged his fair face above the hatch of his Arabian steed to the sight and joy of his soldiers, elated to see with his own eyes that justice for his homeland and a new era is about to begin. My lord, a glorious victory shall soon be yours. Sergeant Bunin humbly bowed. The prince basked in this moment. A triumph over the old order for a new Zanagrad he will create. Malinri's approaching warmth over him allowed himself to be transformed. 
No longer will he be the vassal prince of rural principality, but instead the new emperor of a new nation under the god's creation of Gleesia. Yet still, he remembered the lessons he had learned from the earthlings, now with the empire's traditionalist leaders now effectively on their knees, it was now this moment he must prove to the world what kind of ruler he intends to be. Soldiers, followers, and allies of mine, do not ransack, rape nor raise this fair city. Our war is a just war against a corrupt and decadent system that had for many eras enslave of what our nation's truest potential could be. The prince nobly spoke, if a legionnaire surrenders, disarm his weapon and treat him fairly. If you must lay your fingers upon the burghers of Herring Point, do so gently and with respect. But lastly, remember why we are here and why we fight. The Lanier soldiers cheered oh so much louder when they heard their leader reinforce his ideals, ideals indoctrinated to the hearts of his men fueling their zeal. Bunan, he turned softly to the heroic militiamen, my lord. Your continued gaze humbles us further, Bunan lay prostrate over his stature, the prince stepped off of the APC, going by the steed's tail where a flagpole that attached the Tyrianis red-green windmill banner, he plucked the flagpole off of its embedment and passed the symbolic cloth to Bunan, I present you what is the highest honor I have given to anyone within their service of me, for the one who saved my life. Prince Klovich placed the flag on Bunan's hand solemnly. I give you the highest honor of this new land, the task to raise this sacred banner over the Imperial Palace to evince our victory over Herring Point. Bunan marveled his fingers across the soft fabric of the Tyrian heraldry. In all of his life, the red and green were only an identity of where he hailed from, but now today, this banner, with its ever free windmill spinning whimsically across his peasant A's, means a whole new symbol for him. A dream of a new Xenograd world free from want and fear. A new empire where one can live with dignity of life together with one's neighbor. Earnestly gripping the flag, the heroic Lanier soldier rose up in attention to Prince Klovich. Go with the swiftness of the Weidel and the braver of Garnaguaz. Klovich embraced the sergeant affectionately like a father sending away his son. A thousand hearts are by your side. See you soon. Bunan gave one final bow to the prince exemplifying a knightly-like honor to his lord unseen of by the officially sanctioned knights of Klovich's retinue. He turned away from the prince as he galloped his feet alongside his squad as they marched, the Tyranny banner flying proudly above them northeast towards the imperial palace. The fighting within the city erupted with close-quarter firefights and melees happening in several dozen pockets of resistance. Using their superior mobility, the coalition isolated these pockets of resistance to kneecap any cohesion of defense to support Prince Klovich's march under the capital's marrows, the seat of imperial power itself, the palatial Hyanafiad district. On their way, Klovich and Bunan met all different kinds of obstacles, from straggling legionnaires to desperate citizens trying to flee before the foreign army. The citizens were left terrified over the sight of the Federation's strange warriors clad in nigh-alive olive fatigues and their thunderous staves that cursed anyone with death upon its sight. Yet Prince Klovich gave his personal discretion to his men to address the imperial citizenry's fears. Taking advantage of the fact his army, despite their modernization still retain many aspects of their legacy such as their folkwear and the language customs of the vigory speaking Tyranny. The Lanier made sure that the burghers of Herring Point did not interfere with any kind of disruption, intentional or not that Prince Klovich is enacting upon his will to the Slay agents. It took only the gentle push and warnings from the Lanier and Rayfleas to leave the city dwellers flabbergasted over the sight of these allegedly marauding demons and their thralls. More shockingly, the Lanier went out of their way to haul off the weak, elderly and injured to safety as to clear the advance into the Hyanafiad district. Still, there were those of zealous or misguided attempts of resistance and even appeasement from the more despair-filled denizens to halt their advance but the Lanier swiftly addressed that complication through the butt of their rifles. The same basket cases of civilians were encountered by the Afif who had to contend with them alongside of locking down what remnants of the Herring Point's garrison going out of their way to not lay a finger on the local burghers of the city. 
instead focusing on the legionnaires and those brave foolish souls who raised their arms against the Yafif Laniya coalition. Such a modest behavior for an allegedly marauding horde of demons confused the inhabitants, expecting them to be raping, pillaging and burning their beautiful city to defiled ruins like all despoilers who broke through a city's walls should. It took until the late afternoon when Klovich's first regiment began to storm the Imperial Palace. The rules of engagement remained generally and clear throughout the intense room-to-room -room fighting between the Laniyu and the defending honor guards of the palace. Kill anyone who raised their arms in resistance, but give honorable mercy to those who surrender immediately. He did give a special bearing to Emperor Alden's two children. Princess Istris and Prince Arthur for knowing that they are too young to comprehend the grievous sins their father and uncle Grand Master Owen had done to his people, but even with the discretion being ordered about, the prince's word did little to nothing to spare the palace's interior and facade from the ravages of war, the once opulent estate, built upon the ancient grounds where the original Slaeijan Kingdom's keep was to be reduced into a bullet-ridden derelict of its former self as the last of the Praetorian Anaconda guards perished dying admirably to the last breath defending every inch of the palace. Just as Malinries was about to dip her golden feet across the ocean's azure horizon, Sergeant Binnan, using one cleave of his mighty axe, tore down the blue gold cornucopia flag of Imperial Slaeja atop of the Imperial Palace, ungracefully falling onto the ground in a final insulting display of the waning Imperial power of Slaeja's old traditions. Immediately thereafter, upon the cheers of his fellow countrymen, Benan implanted atop of the palace's stone-carved dragon icon the red-green windmill of Tyrian, Herring Point, the imperial seat of the Slaeijan Empire of all of Zanagrad had fallen. Dash. Now is the time to move Matriarch. If we punch through Benham 3's atmosphere now, the feds wouldn't be able to sniff at us. At least for a long while. A lone space vessel quietly thrusted itself across the void of space before arriving at their newest destination. Unlike the heavily standardized Federation naval ships or the swift yet spaciously efficient Megacorpo cargo tankers, this vessel prescribed to an idea somewhere in between long-term survival and nomadic flexibility, and unlike those two kinds of ships, the people and the trade this lone vessel performed was anything but legal. Very good. Those dits from Kesselheim were correct. This place is and will be a land of opportunity. Milk and honey for every one of us. A venerable woman atop of an authoritative seat smiled gently. She is the matriarch of this vessel and the captain of this boat. It was her responsibility as any other to see through the well-being of her merry band of outcasts, destitute, nomads, soldiers of fortune, exiles and scoundrels. Or in legal speak, space pirates. Find us a nice place far away from those earth-born pigs navigator, drivers and tech. We are going dark. All crew, prepare for plant fall. The matriarch ordered. I want to get ourselves nice and comfy with our little own Hermes. She smirked, exposing her golden teeth. As her crumbed hands tapped enthusiastically, the pirate vessel's netrunner jammed the Federation Navy's quantum radars patrolling near the Aurora and the tenacity for a short few minutes. Complementing such surveillance reconnoitering, the matriarch's own vessel had their stealth drivers electronic countermeasures that negates any means of long-range sight via specially made materials as her ship made plant fall onto Gleesia's atmosphere beneath the Federation's noses. Chapter 54, To Bleed the Bleeders, the capital had been violated, devastation had been brought to herring point as the Vulgarian Otherworlders defiled the most sacred of bastions of Slaeja by their profane presence. The panic within the Senate had been intense with guards aiding fainting noble ladies and soothing the outraged lords and princes of this most unconscionable of denouements. All around the capital, reports of routs and defilements soared through the imperial elite's ears that many began to despair, doom saying that the end of all times had finally came for Emperor Eldin, his imperial majesty of the Slaeijan Empire. 
he has been cruelly trapped in an unceasing yet oh so graphic daymare, a horror that he could not wake up from no matter how hard he fought to rouse away from its grasp. Such manifestations of his many aged anxieties have now come to seek its fruition for the long ruling steward of Sanigrad. All around Elden, the very long aged enemies of the Empire appear before herring points enshrined Burglehart the Lich King Martain marching side by side with the Goblin Hordes and the Beast Folk Tribes had lain their obscene presence upon the Immaculate City of Herring Point, try as his legions had might, but their strength alone was simply not enough to withstand such a cataclysm. All the lifetimes of diligent work by his ancestors and generations of the Slaeagian peoples have begun to crumble, nay, burn before their very eyes as the other worlders devour all they touch. Worse, some legionaries report that the shareholder herself is butchering the fellowship of the light along with her vampiric mistress, the corrupted elven princess and the treasonous Carlyre. He couldn't comprehend that chosen one known as the shareholder and secondly Lady Silverdane would turn their swords against their people without hesitation or thought. Were their previous attempts to dispel their enthralling too weak to disenchant whatever spell they were permeated by? Or were their wills held a deeper of tales behind such seditious acts? Yet despite all of those betrayals, the most frigid of them all had now braved his treacherous head for all of the Empire to see. The sight of the rebellious vassal prince himself, Clovich Rian who had vivaciously announced his treasonous act of amelioration atop his demonic steed, brazenly staking his claim upon the imperial throne for his own selfish grandeur, boasting his patronage to his new demonic masters. After all that the empire had given to him, his land, his titles, his wealth and yet it was not enough. Such a callow announcement of his delusions, now insultingly unfolding into reality before the Emperor's eyes would have enraged the aged sovereign to a temper he had never fathomed of seething. What great transgression that he and the Empire had done that the gods abandoned all favour of to him and his people. My lord, Sir Hugot hurriedly bowed before the Emperor. What more grief can you give me? Reddened tears fell from Alden's eyes as he looked at the Legion's Marshal. I bring none my lord. Hugot explained himself, but your bodyguards, the Teaglay Garda, urge you and as many of your court and imperial possessions depart from the capital at once whilst there is still a chance for escape. The Emperor caught his heavy respiration. Escape, escape. We must flee away from here. Walking urgently as his weary body could to his luggage and his two children. My lord I am afraid we are not likely to save all of our possessions. Grand Master Owen approached the Emperor. He was accompanied by a now placid albeit anxious Faith Len, Meter the Crow Master and Sir Eric Dorf. The Crow Master crashed her fist by the wall. Her suspicions of their previous elven guest confirmed that Black Elf lied to us. Meter snarled. There is no other means to explain how the other worlders came here so fast than his army was defeated by the demons. I delayed them by one week. The pale woman mocked his condescending lardy accent. She had always distrusted in general with the elves of Alphalnora, although she is marginally allied to say the politest of terms with the Entente. She never hides her disdain for the Black Tree Pacts. Always seem to eloquently speaking in words with double meanings. We may get our revenge against that fabulous one day crow master, but there is much work and killing that we need to do today. Faith Len's blood boiled. What relics should the college and the adventurers guild escape with? Petra Rukdorf stepped forward. Enchanted items. AA and scrolls from the Arcanum. We will need them for the coming tempest ahead. The Emperor answered with what little clarity he could spare. What do you advise for what remains of our legions? He asked. Having them all gathered in one place will only put them at risk. I have already sent messengers to halt the northern legions from advancing southwards and told them to garrison every fort and settlement north of Marvs. I will, with my retinue march northward to congregate with my forces with the chosen one Sir Garmhaik to organize a resistance against the invaders. As for you my lord and your court. Ambassador Hantumel has arranged due passage across the sea to gain refuge within Eth Island under King Eslenador's sanctuary, from the safety of the Entente. You and the surviving officials of the Lyward Rathmurdral can continue to rule over what remains of our lands. 
How much time then do we have until the other world is fully overrun the capital? Petra asked the marshal, for as long as we continue to hold the last three mana obelisks, we could still hold them off to allow the escape of as many of our people as possible but at the rate the other worlders are flowing into our city, I fear we may only have just the day until they cut off all avenues of escape. He answered of strangely fortunate tidings, the other worlders do not seem to be that much interested in pillaging the bergs, rounding up the populace away from their fighting with my men. Hugit answered his voice dipping upon the last stretches of his sentence. By the gods, they're corralling them like cattle for the slaughter. Owen wailed. Faithland clenched his fist. They shall surely pay for this atrocity. The chosen one barked. This. Unfortunate. Revelation however does leave us a hopeful prospect. As this behavior un- Owen cut him off. How can you speak those words of our people? The demons will devour them whole to multiply their numbers further. He exclaimed, Grandmaster, forgive my asinine words but my focus is the survival, the continuity of our dominion over the realm, our people need leaders, heroes to guide them through this dark time. We cannot argue here and now whilst the barbarians and traitors run loose on our streets searching for us, we must leave and save all that we can so that we may have a glimmer that we could return to our former strength. The marshal explained. Owen was silenced begrudgingly, the marshal was right. All they can do is flee and fight another day. There is nothing to gain by valiantly standing here in a city doomed to be conquered by the Allbones hordes. Even the emperor had to reluctantly conjoin to his thinking. Continuance is the antecedents of this day. See it done then Sir Hugot. Begin the withdrawal. Alden affirmed. Your will be done. The Grand Master. The Chosen One's party and the Grand Marshal bowed. Father, Estrus tugged Elden's as your royal robes. Do we really have to leave? She asked. The Emperor dropped his noble demeanor to the character of a father as he knelt down onto her height. My daughter, you have so much life ahead of you. It is for our own safety. Alden explained as much as he could. Alphalnora is quite a wondrous place to visit. Not even your storybooks and all the paintings around our home could match the elven homeland's splendor. We will be safe there? I hope so. Arthurfra whimpered. My lord, we must begin the evacuation starting with your household. One of Hugit's guards walked towards him and bowed. Grabbing their precious possessions, Alden lead his children, their personal servants and their servants' families into the kobold's hollow. It was a grand network of hallways underneath the streets of Herring Point that is used by the denizens of the Imperial Capital as a means to store their foodstuffs and other important supplies safely in a cool environment and as an additional, more discreet channel for navigation avoiding the hustle and bustle of Herring Point's cosmopolitan surface connecting many major landmarks and important centers from the Senate Building, the Cathedral, the Elven Ward, the Docks and even the College. However, the Hollow also housed a seedy reputation as a popular congregation. An entire gallery by citizenry is to say of the less scrupulous members of Slay Agent Society. Such playful findings range from tariff-dodging merchants, bestial-focused establishments and the disreputable of cutthroats and what not of the archetype of the word rogue using clandestine hoods to allow them to travel incognito through the chaotic crowd of panicked imperial city folks and blitzed of legionnaires trying to control the masses' fears unnoticed. Their destination being the College of Magi where within the Great Chamber of the Mirror of Ancelus a ritual spell is being prepared to evacuate the imperial elites away from the fallen capital. Meanwhile, Faith Len along with his party went ahead with Grand Master Owen as they swam through the Sea of Souls ahead of the Imperial Entourage, their task as stated by the highest authority, coordinate the rescue of precious relics from the three of the most important buildings of Herring Point that houses them. The Grand Lodge of the Grey Order, the Cathedral Vaults and before lastly the College of Magi itself where they will evacuate from, dash. At long last. He has arrived at the hornet's nest. Clear. Agent the Sut shouted as he backed off from the main entrance of the Grand Lodge. The headquarters of the much bothersome of foes, the Adventurers Guild, or the Grey Order. Setting aside his new toy, 
an experimental item given to him the courtesy of the partnered work of Dr. Malona and Miss Iris Kadahagan, a rune calibrator. This device, modified from a handheld integral hands smart tool allows the user to imprint and dispel enchantment runes with a custom-built unbinilium battery. The scholarly doctor seeks to one day mass-produce this device and distribute them to the armed forces specifically the assault engineers who will appreciate this tool greatly during their tour in Gleesia. The main entrance of the Grand Lodge was doubly guarded by a massive oak door enchanted with runes that deter block outsiders from entry. His UAV Regan had also observed the inhabitants of the guild building sealing off every possible orifice of entrance in preparation for a siege. These adventurers are not going to be making this asset liquidation mission of his easily. It was quite an amusing read, researching this organization of how they operate and all that's required by his high commission masters, these adventurers as they call themselves, were collectively responsible for the most amounts of Ufif Lanier casualties during this conflict. Their lightweight gear, unconventional tactics along with their individually diverse experience dealing with multitudes of adversaries from their own quests ranging from monsters, bandits and other what not of this world made them the ideal guerrilla fighters. Unlike their more conventionally minded legionnaires that coalition had no trouble of making short work of, with a centralized institution of networked interests to prop their regs and coordinate themselves independently of their imperial masters, the Grey Order impressively made the Federation set back several sabotages and men throughout Operation Haymaker. These Grey Order guildsmen were perhaps one of the most challenging recusant groups Agent the Such is tasked to dismantle in his 14-year career in the Bureau. Not as the same level as space pirates roguish corporations or extremified separatists back home as he is used to, but these adventurers are still highly dangerous in their respective ways both new and classical in terms of comparable characteristics. The site was quite the marvelous example of architecture in the world as the intelligence agent says so himself, it was a castle-shaped landmark that towered above the lesser of built Romano Baroque-like architectures, only falling short of the great cathedral whose height is bested by the Senate Dome, the height of the building being a sign of importance and prestige in Imperial Slaeja. Within the lodges halls were twin silo-shaped buildings of contrasted width that spaced themselves equidistantly on the lot. According to Carlia, the first pot-bellied tower, located closest to the front gate, is the main hub of the Grey Order institutions containing bureaucratic offices to handle the processing of quests and other day-to-day -day internal and external affairs for the guild, followed by rentable lodgings for exclusive to guildsmen who seek a hospitable respite in between their travels in Herring Point with a variety of guild-only amenities and finally a plaza of privately owned artisanal workshops that treasures the finest crafted arms and artifacts of this world's finest of adventurers for the right price and prestige. It is the publicly accessible wing of the complex conventionally speaking, but the second tower of which the previous guards, one toweringly gaunt above its paunchier twin is the real prize, accessible to the higher ranking of folks, both members and patrons. The second tower contains the personal offices of the leaders of the Grey Order alongside the real target of this attack, the repository which safely keeps uncountable treasures. His targets were, the relics of magical items that pathfinding individuals had excavated from old dungeons and ruins collected and stored for study and display followed by the Grey Order's archives in which the intelligence agent wishes to gain access to magical law books that the guild was allowed to house a collection of independent of the vision of the College of Magi and finally the roster of all Grey Order adventurers reserved for future sanctions when needed be. In terms of defenses, he can expect magical booby traps and enchantments meant to keep him away from the goodies alongside an indeterminate amount of highly skilled and highly cohesive defenders with home field advantage, any improvised means of home defense in regards to that said advantage, and of course, the option of stealth, not being much of an option time relevance wise. At first glance, the Grey Order's Grand Lodge is a vault, 
a fortress within a fortress. But for Agent the Sut in his 14-year career as a Bureau of Intelligence agent, all he needs is 50 good men and he can impregnate this bitch wide open. Sir de Sir de Carlyle proffered, fumbling her tongue upon the Bureau agent's name. Once we enter, Please can spare the staff and the younger adventurers from the wrath of your men and yourself. Many of them are my friends and people who look up to me as a mentor, she requested, appealing to Gary's seemingly distinguished aura he radiated. None, no guarantees I'm afraid that will happen fully Madame Wiesel, at best the Flash and Taz's. It may be a rifle but will stop some of them without actually hurting them too much. But I won't hesitate to kill them if they try me. He replied softly as he checked his ammunition cartridges. You know how to cast a paralysis spell you then use it. Hit them with it before I do something to them I will regret. Dasat reminded her. Carlia sunk her head, her hood hiding her cracking eyes as she struggles to abide by what she is about to do. She had a choice in the matter to save those people she cared about, but nonetheless of her virtuous intentions, this is high treason Carlia is about to enact onto her guild friends and collegiate. However, she knows that if those adventurers would zealously spirit away the powerful artifacts the guild holds which will only perpetuate this futile war for irreparable damage is to come. She could almost vomit upon imagining their broken bodies before her, eyes locked with a final soul-piercing gaze upon her. Their so-called betrayer. But she looked up above the city street the other worlders gathered upon in preparation for their siege of the Grand Lodge. One of the most macabre sights the Imperials display in their city is how they enact justice upon criminals in contrast to their civilized architecture. Gibbets to hang criminals, both dead and alive of many degrees of penalized intensity. One such nearby hanging corpse stuck out, a body of a young girl, barely middle of the blossoming maidenhood that she grisly recognized. Her rotting corpse hung a sign detailing her tragic fate, treason. The sight of her body chilled the collegiate's bones, but revived her courage. She wished no harm on her former colleagues, and although she knows they may not likely all listen to her reason, she will do her darndest to ensure they will not befall and the fate of cold oblivion unlike her friend Olera. Grandmaster Owen will pay immeasurably for the thousand hells he had befallen to their country, their world. Stay behind me U the Sut cocked away from the safety of his magazine fed fast cycling semi-automatic shotgun, a personal choice of his whenever he needs to directly act upon his assignments. Its barrel baffled with a hybridized muzzle brake and suppressor, he led his fifty good men, youth navy seals courtesy of Major Holyfield to huddle next to him by the Grand Gate as they made their insertion into the fortified building. The seals were methodically ruthless in their approach, weaving through the barricades and defences, not like a brutish flood, but of a dance-like presentation, a ceremony more like it, of their prowess. For any rudimentary of obstacles, the seals quickly humbled them to heal not with strength, as Carlyle force supposed by their cumbrous ebony armour with an unexpectedly contrasted level of finesse. The first circle of defences can be considered wooden in both interpretations, mostly of intermediately armed adventurers who more or less were furnished to be lookout and early warning than for any conventional confrontation. With the time it took for a drop of rainwater to drip down of the stone floor, the SEAL teams eliminated the majority of the initial defenders. Those guildsmen have survived that weren't immediately taken down non-lethally by Carla's discretion hastily retreated just as the seals poured onto the courtyard as they hugged the walls of the first tower. Upon entry, that is when the full hammer of the fully cultivated close quarters actions the seals brought down upon the adventurers. Room after room, grid after grid, hall by hall, unless of course, they stumble upon an obstacle that requires her arcane expertise. The special forces grinded the defenders upon a wake of dead and breaking bodies. Despite the Ufif's advanced tactics and weaponry, the adventurers remained ever so tenacious. Like the ants that they were, they retreated deeper and deeper to the slowly eroding safety of their core as the seals had to halt their pushes upon several occasions just to resupply their gear from the rear echelons. This burned through valuable time, time that both brought ached equally on both sides. The more the Grey Order stubbornly pushed off the Federation, the more the seals amped their aggression back. In fact, 
It didn't take long for the adventurers to resort to equip themselves with the magically powerful artifacts they were meant to evacuate as they desperately stood their feet to hold for time so that their compatriots could escape. The news had tightened amongst the adventurers and like cornered animals, to Carlyle's horror. They resorted to volunteering the young, the old and the meek. It was a massacre, but unlike those of helpless ableness, La Dewey Silverdane can allay its destruction. She quietly sprinted forward, not too far away from her seal team escort but quite far enough that they won't immediately see her without much of an effort of trying. It didn't take too far off the beaten track before she encountered a holdout of the guild defenders. Put the sword down man. I don't want to hurt you. The collegiate pleaded to a young receptionist a woman she easily recognizes in her days visiting the lodge. Manal pointed threateningly towards her an iron short sword for her own self-defense. I know you, you are not a fighter, but Manal shouted back. H how? How could you call I? How could you turn against us? She feinted a thrust of her sword to keep the corrupted mage away from her and several defenseless adventurers and other guild staff whom the young receptionist girl is their only shield against the destructive force Carlyle now represents. We looked up to you. You were the paragon. The adventuring mage. How could you throw all of those you love away to the demons? Money? Power? Slaves? She cried in distraught. I did not. I can explain everything. Please. Carlyle pleaded again. Yet her words fell on deaf ears. Die traitor. The conscripted receptionist swung her blade in a forlorn attempt to fight. Not wanting to harm the desperate girl yet also knowing that the nearby seals will gun her down the moment they see her in the hallway holding that blade, the mage heartened her courage as she conjured her magics for a paralysis spell. It strokes perfectly on her mark as the receptionist froze dead mid-swing. Her eyes unable to shut as the collegiate quietly pushed the sword away from ink-blotted hands. Everything will be all right Manal, it will be over soon. She hugged the receptionist girl just as the seals who heard the commotion rolled into the room to see Carlyle with the frightened civilians. Quietly. She reassured the other worlders that these people are no longer a threat to them and that if anything is to happen to them it is her responsibility to answer, but for now, they needed to get out of here. Turning back to her fellow countrymen, the mage smiled softly as she ushered the shaken people and one awkwardly frozen living statue away to safety as the siege continued to rage around them. Like an angel of mercy. Carlyle rinsed and repeated her process, softly attempting to persuade them to stand down and if they don't she will go out of her way to disarm their weapons and strike them with a disabling spell before the seals and rear echelon soldiers hastily escorted her and her knees away from the fighting. It didn't always work. However, sometimes the commotion she creates trying to stop the adventurers from needless throwing their lives away for a misunderstood cause ended just as she did not wish to see. Their bullet-ridden bodies laying on the lodge's illustrious floor. Yet even then such failures only fueled the collegiate to push forward with her bardic camp campaign to advocate her countrymen to yield. For Agent Dessard in contrast to the collegiate's means of pacification, he is as those adventurers fortunate enough to escape his moors alive, describe of him as wild dogs starved off for days looking for blood to sink his teeth in. If the seal were likened to a horde of locust. The beat of their boots thundering along the halls as they that sweeps through and devours all in their path before halting to breed their numbers anew. The intelligence agent would be likened to an implacable or perhaps better to say, rapacious ram of bullish hell bent. When he is not coldly gunning down the adventurers who had resisted, he marauded their corpses and rooms in search of all things valuable not bolted down. Yet sometimes he would try to take those that were bolted down too. He brought hell upon their doors, oftentimes laying his hands maliciously upon the morale-broken adventurous as hostages to leverage for the continued capitulation of the rest. One time he would maim the one half of a lover's pair of adventurous in order to solicit the still-defiant half to yield. Another time, he was caught in surprise by a huge brute of a beastman but managed to overpower him with his timely judo throw. Tossing the poor sod off of a ten-storied window to his fatal descent, many despaired at this unstoppable force who seemed to shake away everything they throw at him. By the gods, this cannot be hap, 
an adventurer despaired before his chest was blasted open by Dersat's fleshette throwing shotgun. Raising the gun upwards to the ceiling, the bureau agent smirked as he sees his eyes before him his grand prize, the Grand Lodge's repository. He knows he had arrived upon the description of a silver bar door inscribed with protective runes to prevent entry. Jewess? Jewess, is all is quiet? Is it over? A voice emerged from behind the magically sealed barrier of the repository. Playfully he knocked back on the door it looks like the cats have become the mouse. The bureau agent rearmed his rune calibrator gadget once again as he carefully raised his hands over towards the magic runes harmonically webbed around the door to protect it from harm. Carefully, with a few mishaps and taunts, he quietly disabled the runes one by one. You can still come out and play you know? Or surrender. Gar taunted them. You are running out of time. Let me just of those nice relics you keep inside that fancy bank you have behind this door and I will let you go. There was no response from the voice behind the vault door. I know about those tunnels too by the way. He added. You are running out of space to run to. The agent bluffed leveraging his knowledge of the secret passageway in the repository only known by the high ranking of the guild's leaders in case they needed to evacuate the relics in an event like this. In reality however, the Ufif soldiers tasked with clearing the kobolds hollow aren't that far in to intercept just yet in this time of day, yet this he hoped, should force remaining adventurers to attempt a breakout where he could corner the last remnants of the guild. Then I as my sworn duty as the venture captain, you demons will not dare defile these sacred relics with your corrupt hands. The voice shouted, destroy the artifacts. The sad sighs widened as his heart skipped a beat. He could not allow this to come to pass not when he is so close. Get charges now. He ordered the seals. They rather destroyed the repository's treasures rather than let them get his hands on them. A scorch earth tactic. Hurry. High explosive semtex was immediately set upon the now unprotected vault door as Dussard cleared for a breach. One final thrust to slay the beast and claim its treasure. The resulting explosion tore through the gate and any unfortunate soul about seven feet or so less away from the radius as the seals swarmed into the marble chamber of the repository of the Adventurers Guild. A few bursts of their guns swiftly eliminated those survivors as the smoke in from the wake of the explosion came to see. He kneeled down, grabbing whatever unburnt documents he could whilst chewing away the blood-stained but ultimately intact magical artifacts. The bureau agent wiped the sweat off of his brow. Seals meanwhile did the same rescuing whatever paraphernalia as they could before whatever enchantments the enemy mages had attempted to embed upon the artifacts. Carlyle assisted in cancelling out whatever transmutative alteration spells that would have otherwise adulterate the artifacts into useless junk. Spearhead, spearhead. This is Deimos. I hit the jackpot. The Sut radioed. Confirmed Deimos. Holyfield answered, bag up everything you find, then exfiltrate. A carder of assisting rear echelon soldiers immediately arrived upon the agent's call. They carry wide box chests filled inside with smaller containers and even a few specialized Ziploc bags for good measure. They were typically reserved for the confiscation and preserved containment of contaminable evidence for those under the employ of the Ministry of Interior's coverage umbrella. In a flip of a mental switch, the mode of Dersat's mood had switched from a bloodthirsty slaughterer back to his serene, no-nonsense temperament as he sheathed his shotgun for a pair of surgical gloves. Grabbing one of the evidence chests and began to collect all the various objects in the chamber. Neatly, he stacked whatever important-looking document he could obtain together alongside the books neatly in pre-labeled cases and the weaponry and armor on others. His brutalized hands now giving great care to these items with an almost loving affection of respect, marveling on the magical artifacts with lust wonder dies that at one point, while holding a particularly master crafted runic sword, his finger pricked itself lightly upon the blade's edge. This is quite the work I cut myself for. Ouch. Dasat licked the drop of blood off of his finger. So many, Carlyle muttered as she was left speechless of the grisly scene. There was much death that permeated the Grand Lodge's halls as this morbid assault came to a close. For every adventurer, 
she saw only two of five of them yielded, most of whom were either of lower rank of lesser resolve compared to their more venerable ranked of colleagues than there was the staff who were no fighters, to begin with. Still, there was still some legacy of the guild still salvageable albeit now in the Federation's hands. Carlyle hoped that this devastating capitulation would finally end the war with the Empire once and for all. Deimos, this is Spearhead. Miss Carlyle Silverdane is needed as per request by Strider Lead. Colonel Polonsky radioed from Desart's chest. The sappers have cleared out the hollow and Captain Rose's team is readying to move in on the college. Over. Affirmative shield father. Desart acknowledged. It looks like you are needed elsewhere. Madame Wazelle. Au revoir for now Miss Silverdane. He waved goodbye as the collegiate made her leave under an escort of two seals. Chapter 55 Summer Imperio. Samantha gritted her teeth, as she waddled through the gutter-like caverns of the Kobold's Hollow with the rest of Strider Group. The army grunts had finally after a grueling clearing operation a path for her squad to gain entry into the college's tunnels inside the Hollow. There were still several isolated holdouts of resistance and the still erratically behaving populace of whom the occupation forces are now tasked into screen over for whilst the assault troops breach the last strong points of the defenders. The military operation over Herring Point has been an almost overwhelming success with negligible casualties on the Federation's side but maximum damages on the Alliance's. The coalition troops had eliminated several more of the minor obelisks with the help of King Martin and Hodden. Slowly but surely, the fires of war began to crumble into embers. Yet still, the defense of Herring Point stood against such overwhelming forces albeit hanging by a thread. The loss of the walls and most of its garrison has immediately shifted the remnants of the defenders into fight or flight mode. Screaming sheets of radio chatter reported of multitudes of masses of people fleeing the imperial capital to the north via two gates that the Ufi Flani are hurrying to plug any crevices of escape, lest their human targets escape beneath the blanket of refugee caravans. Yet still, many of the Imperial leadership has been fighting on to continue to either buy time for the civilians to escape north or to enact a final stand against the Otherworlders. Most of these last-ditched efforts were empowered by mages who use their spells to stubbornly push off the Coalition's assaults. These holdouts are by Major Holyfield's intuitiveness that is stopping the Federation and Lanier from fully conquering the city. The source of all magic powers that the city's remaining defenders still maintain a weakening yet present grip on, the mirror of answerless by the College of Magi. If they can capture that source of power, all whatever is left of an adequate resistance within Herring Point would be crushed. The plan to capture this esteemed institution had many prongs that seek to tear the college apart by the weight of the Federation's technology. A diversionary assault from the ground would commence affixing the college's defenders into focusing their fire onto them whilst Samantha's squad leads her elite team into the underground tunnel network to sap the enemies from the inside. Strider's objects would be tasked to neutralize any mages they can come across specifically those specializing in offensive-based destruction spells and the very last still active mana obelisks that situate themselves within the middle of the college that needs to be neutralized. Both tasks are in conjunction with the second phase of the operation that is the support of an oncoming airborne commando attack from the Tenacities and Ship Marine Corps. With the support of the Marines, the defenses will be crumbled upon the weight of their assault clearing a path to the main chamber where the Mirror of Arzalus is supposed to be. Shush! Carlyle urged the group into silence as she gestured for them to stop. She was leading Strider into the tunnels, the same tunnels that she and her fellow students of the college used to discreetly walk in and out of the campus of the scholarly building for academic work or to contact any underground governs within the Kobold's Hollow. As they made their way deeper into the caverns, the squad could quietly feel trotting above them, footsteps, heavy, very weighted of footwork that trembles like heavy rain. They were likely right above knights and mages who are scrambling in defense of the college as they speak. Great danger is ahead. Aliath Rez ears perked up. Hers is much more audibly sensitive than the rest. Let's go to work then. Ready up. Clay muttered. Captain what's the ROE? Kane inquired. 
you're free to engage anyone that tries to kill you. Samantha ordered them as she readied her bullpup rifle. Carly, I know that you know that we won't hesitate to kill anyone in our way. I want to be sure that. At the added benefit that our journey through the school would be as smooth as possible that you would pacify your fellow students. Non-lethally I am right. She turned to the ex-collegiate. I assure you, I will see to them they will not harm you. Carly nodded. Good. The less blood on anyone's hands the better. The captain smiled. The squad soon reached the end of the tunnel where a clandestinely hidden brick wall that bore, once shone with mage light an invisible insignia bearing the heraldry of the College of Magi, a sun shining hand sealed exposing its palms where the arcane sigils, symbols representing of the schools of magics being idiosyncratically evinced in the arcane scholarly thought. This somatic gesture is called by the elves as the gull bore or the flowing hand. Carlyle flicked her finger onto one of the concrete bricks of the wall as a magically powered mechanism gave way to an opening. It was a threshold contrasting the dark, dilapidated underground of the kobolds hollow to the stately glow of carpeted hallways of the College of Magi. Follow me. We must hurry. My college's obelisk is not too far away from here but we must pass by the dormitories of which I am sure will be patrolling with soldiers and students. Carlyle funneled stride a group through as for the mirror of Ancelus is at the other side of the campus and there will be many of my fellow mages between us and our goal. Keeping their arrival as cloaked as possible for a nine-man infiltration team. The squad weaved their way through the college's halls under their guide's lead. The school was as prestigious in name from the outside as it was in the inside as Strider passed through semicircular archways that peeked over doorways and windows. Bricked hallways made of the snowiest of stone and candlelight, the magic spell, receptacles illuminated dimly the pathways through the college which gives the building a fey like aura compared to its more mundane neighbors. Sam couldn't honestly wait to take some photos of the building for her own personal album if it were not the fact that in contrast to its supposedly prestigious visage, the foul disease known as the war had infected itself inside the campus. Ransacked classrooms and dormitories were barred of anything usable for barricades that Kane and Crocker had to lift away to allow access through, several windows to darken the school into a derelict state and of course the occasional rush passes of the patrolling student body and legionnaire remnants that scatter about from the school. Let's take them out. But quietly, Samantha ordered as she rolled into her gladius pistol's barrel a silencer. They needed to sabotage as much of their defenses as quietly as possible and so they proceed to do. Carlyle demonstrated that each of the students, who most of are still wearing their uniforms wield a badge on their persons that signify what field of magics they are studying based on the arcane sigillary of the schools. They prioritized neutralizing the ones who bore the badges of the destruction and alteration magics as much as they could disable the defenses to smooth the final assault into the college they did, practicing extreme restraint in contrast to Dursat earlier that day. Samantha, alongside Ailey Aethro and the brutish Sergeant Crocker went out of their way as much as they could, to incapacitate healthily Carla's fellow mages much to her appreciation. They used a combination of clever misdirection alongside a few grappling techniques and some restoration magics to as much as they can harmlessly neutralize the college mages on their passage by. There were still at times when either Stride or Mr. Tango who was about to attack them or were simply about to get caught that they have to tragically shoot down quietly but it was inevitable, albeit not as perniciously expected in quantity for Miss Silverdane. La Dewey Silverdane, Athras, what are you doing here? A young boy, carrying war hastily fletched arrows, materials for spells and several rations destined for his roommates who took up defensive positions by their dormitory. Strider group quietly sat behind away from the child's line of sight as Carlyle volunteered to personally deal with this young boy and his friends for she recognizes them all. Their hope is that these students would listen to her and give up. The young boy looked by Samantha's eyes no younger than twelve or so autumns old, 
not like the adults such as she and Strider were used to dispatching of. Over his colored college uniform was a breastplate too large even at the most minimum of specifications for the little lad to wear, with gaping hollows between its surface and his body's girth, was simply sub-ideal let alone properly protect his fragile body from what sorts of lethal gadgets Federation's soldiers had in the disposal. His equally armed compatriots wielded crossbows, their own set of spears and swords for their preparations for the inevitable defense of the college, all wearing a crudely painted armband of the Imperial Legions upon themselves, bespeaking their allegiance. There were seven other students in the room, three on watch with crossbows and their magical wands at the ready, the other four preparing their supplies for the coming violence ahead. It was obvious from the start. Much to the disturbance of Strider group what they are, Iris winced. Even vampires wouldn't be that cruel. The vampire which recoiled on such a sordid sight for a squad of soldiers. Nitin darling. Carlyle knelt down. What are you doing? W. We were ordered by the Canriad to set a line thing of defense around the windows of our rooms and not let demon enter the college. The boy explained, feebly recalling his orders. What do you expect to accomplish with yourselves here? Carlia questioned their motives. Nitin, Mabin, Jacob, Elza. You are still children you have so much more to live for than be here. Their teacher pleaded. No barbarians shall pass as long as we are here. Replied a little girl, no older than a decade who sat by the battlements. Her body, like the rest of Jacob's friends. Fatigued with worry, as long as their eye is still one true slay agent to defend even one pole of the nation. Then the empire is not lost. This war is over. Samantha emerged from her squad's hiding spot. Don't waste your lives here. She held out her arms up to show she is not intending to harm them but kept her FBR-20 and Gladius pistol quick on the draw if the situation slides south. Samantha, have I not told you I will handle this? Carlia turned to the captain. The children in the room eyes widened in abject horror, recognizing the newcomer's name. The fact that Samantha's distinct and alien equipment, not helping her case of blending in amongst the medieval renaissance-styled populace for that manner. A. A demon. The rumors are true. Nitin dropped what he carried and swiftly pulled out his short sword, thrusting threateningly at both his now former teacher and Samantha. He was followed by the rest of his carder who pointed their weapons towards them. The shareholder, the corrupted heroine has been brought here to our door. Why Samantha? Why do you fight against the forces of the light? Abandon and betray your people? Your home? One of the child's soldiers behind Nitin asked. The rest of the children pointed their weapons towards her and Carlia, readying to strike both of them down by the twitch of their fingers. Captain Rose upon closer examination of their fortified position, realized that those students don't stand a hair's chance in even surviving the first few volleys of shots once the main assault begins. They were improperly holding their weapons upright towards her despite the graveness of such a threat directed. Some even shed tears, exposing their fragile state to them a lost innocence that was eroded before her very eyes. Boys and girls plucked from their studies and play to be thrust into a hopeless war, barely trained, barely armed, and barely able to accomplish nothing but die tragically for a regime that is now beating its final heartbeats. A recipe for a disastrous and tragic end to such promising youths. Rose felt the weight of their fate hang by her threads. She needed to do something anything to avert this tragedy. Carlia and I will explain everything later. Samantha warned them as she cocked her hand to ready a spell. Stand down. Don't make me do this. She set out her final terms. Silence gripped the room before Nitin nodded, denying the reality he is in. One of his classmates took aim of his crossbow and squeezed the trigger. No, Samantha shouted as she cast her spell, conjuring on her hand a small yet tangible amount of mana. Samantha flung a minuscule magic missile with cat-like reflexes. Within a split second the bolt misaligned the trajectory of her assailant's same causing the bolt to land harmlessly a few inches away from her and Carlia. I am sorry little ones. Carlia glowered as she too casted her magics. Using the sleep spell, she enchanted each of the eight students in the room to be lulled into a deep, magical slumber. Their bodies fell numb as they collapsed harmlessly. Sam and Carlia, 
being there to catch their fall. The captain ordered Crocker, Diaz and Iris to destroy the children's war supplies so that even if they wake up, they are in no effective capacity to fight back against the Federation's assault or for any other defender that chanced upon these items. Meanwhile, the students were carried off to a nearby room where they will be locked inside for their safety until the college is secured where Carlyle will personally return to them. A sigh of relief escaped Strider as they finished their tasks and regrouped back at the ruined dormitory as they huddled up for their next orders. Child soldiers being forced to be made to murderers and mindless beasts. I, I, this is an affront to everything the All Mother's teachings. Unlike anything I thought I know of the noble humans of Slaeja. Aliathra shuddered. If you have seen what I have seen Ali, wars can turn anyone into monsters. Crocker huffed, his fist tightening as his sentence passed. Abidaya, beside the Sarge too was also equally shaken by those children. The audacity of the Grand Master. The Council, the Emperor, Carlyle exclaimed, instead of keeping safe of the younglings, they instead turn them into mindless thralls. Her disgust aired for Samantha to breathe in equal revulsions. I know Carlyle. Let's hurry to the Mana Obelisk now and shut that rock off. Samantha synchronized her watch. They are at a time limit and it won't be long before the inhabitants of the college realize what is about to be happening. Once the assault begins. We push up towards the mirror and we end this once and for all. Strider consigned with their team leader, moving away from the sleeping children they made their way downstairs where the last mana obelisk is being guarded. A light complement of guards and caretakers that were oblivious to the looming predators that approached them. With Aliath resade in illusion, a few suppressors, and the timely reflexes of Diaz, the squad disposed of the guards without alarming the rest of the denizens of the college. Carlia and Sam quickly went to work severing the monument's connection from the Wii for several minutes as Strider watched the area for any threats, silently eliminating anyone coming to investigate or were unfortunate enough to pass by. It didn't take another moment longer for the mages to fully cut the connection of the obelisk from the ether. Immediately, the effects of mana were now being felt all over by the defenders. Their magics began to weaken or fail entirely with none of them the wiser. Calling stride a lead. This is red belly one to three. Over. No more signs of the magic field being up. Can we begin the assault? Clay's radio sparked to life. The code name that was overheard was from one of the air reconnaissance commanders. Reading you red belly one to three loud and clear. Clay answered. It is confirmed. The mana obelisk has been destroyed. You are clear to commence the assault. Over. In the distance, thanks to Samantha's team, the assault faced minimal resistance from the severely weakened defenders who at best casted several weak magical missiles of their own fire before being swiftly overrun. Outside of the makeshift battlements, the squad saw the Yafi forces making their push towards the college. Their earlier sabotages against the defenders had blunted their abilities to fight back resulting in less casualties as feared may happen by Colonel Polonsky and Major Holyfield. They easily overran the various myriad fighting positions through the strength of their fire or the fear within the defenders' hearts as they lay down their arms and surrendered. It only took within a span of five minutes for the soldiers to swarm into the interior of the college. Strider, one of my drowns has spotted priority target. Colts are moving a hundred meters from my position with about fifty foot mobiles over. Sending you the coordinates. I, I think they are trying to get to checkpoint Mike Alpha to escape. Red Belly 1 to 3 divulged. Strider group collectively were pulled into by the CO's words. Their heart racing, remembering their briefings about the terminologies used for the Federation's targets. Within Herring Point, Colts are being the code name for Emperor Olden himself. Objective Mike Alpha a simplified term for the initials of the Chamber of the Mirror of Answers. In all likelihood, the Emperor will attempt to use the mirror to escape from the Federation's grasp. If this opportunity to capture the King is wasted, then in all likelihood this war will be prolonged to more agonizing days ahead. Captain Rose, you heard him. Colonel Polonsky voice pushed himself into Clay's channel. Your team is the closest to the mirror. Move in and intercept the Emperor. Dead or alive, he ordered. You heard the Colonel. Crocker nodded. Fish on. Time to motor strider. Samantha leapt as she led her team, kicking the door forward. 
Now was the hour where no longer stride of eye for patience and subterfuge. The heat has now been turned up stoking Samantha's passion as she raced through the college hallways as there. Protect the Emperor. An Imperial Knight rallied, but just as he was about to raise his sword, his body burst into the blood causing him to collapse into the floor as Strider group blitzed through anyone and anything between them and Emperor Ralden. They didn't stop to count nor look at the eyes of those whom they killed, the rush enrapturing the squad as they inched closer to their objective. Just as predicted, Samantha caught a small glimpse of the slay each and Emperor being hastily retreating the sanctum of the Mirror of Answers. This is the only entrance into the chamber. Carlyle clarified as Strider conferred by a grand and engraved onyx door. The Mirror will likely take the Emperor and his closest circle away from here. This is it Strider. Check your weapons. Samantha ordered the squad. Let's all go in at the count of three. I don't think so Captain. Crocker protested. This place is still crawling with imps all over. If we all go in now, they might sneak up behind us. How about some of us stay here and keep our six secured while the rest goes off to get the Emperor? The Sarge elucidated the Captain's youthful energy. Aye, we can do that. Ken nodded. Who will stay and who will go? Iris questioned the Captain. Samantha gave a moment to pause to collect her thoughts. It didn't take a second longer for her to spark her decision. Crocker, I want you to stay with Ken, Clay and Abed here. Diaz, you're the fastest among us. Come, the Emperor will not go down quietly without a fight, she ordered. The squad are going to need their best foot forward beyond this threshold now more than ever. Dash. Alden shook away feebly the disorientation he had felt when his bodyguards spurishly carried him away from danger as soon as he and his inner circle arrived at the College of Magi. His heart skipped many beats when he was informed that the other worlders were beginning their assault to overrun the college and that his chance of escape through the mirror's teleportation spell diminished the longer he dallied. Among his inner circle were several essential ministers of the imperial ruling elites with their families alongside with Mogul Dolman's followers. Guarding them were the Praetorian Dewey's with bodyguard alongside several high-ranking adventurers and mages. We must hurry with the portal and escape this god's forsaken city. Grand Master Owen roused himself faster as his hands conjured magical energies channeled from the mirror of Ansler's adept. What is the plight of our city right this instance? He turned his gaze to one of the attending mages they met. Grand Master, there has been a setback. The adept stuttered. Speak swiftly of it then. The Grand Master rushed. Your order of retrieving the sacred crystal heart so it may be moved to safety. Our people cannot, he explained, his voice faltering as he reported. Cannot? What do you mean cannot? Owen yelled. Those sent to retrieve the heart speaks of a powerful force field that denies us access to the artifact. The adept explained. By the gods. Must I do this myself? The whole city is about to be overrun by barbaric demons. Owen if he still had any hair left would have torn them from their roots. Instead. His agitated hands met the cloth of his outer-worn white robes, tearing them in half. Grandmaster is everything all right? Mogul Dolmond approached. Why yes. None of your concern, Owen reconstituted himself. We must evacuate you and your people out first. I just have several affairs for the college to take care of before I make my departure. He explained. Owen caught his breath as he absorbed the new facts. He needed to evacuate that crystal heart out of the capital before the other world to get their unholy hands onto them. They will need its power if they are to stand back against the coming darkness ahead. But for now, all he can do is evacuate his master's people out of the city. The heart will have to wait for a few moments longer. Head count. The portal is opening. An adept called out to the crowd. Teleportation magics is a very mono-intensive ritual to enact directly proportionally increased by the weight of what people the said spell is displacing. Luckily the Mirror of Ancelus plus the Adepts were hand-picked by the Grand Master for such an immense task. The first batch of souls were the households of prominent Legion Air, Grey Order, and College followed by several Grey Order guildsmen carrying on their toe several magical artifacts that managed to be evacuated from the Imperial Vaults. 
The next batch would be the terraced dwarven retinue of Mogul Dolmond and a second wave of evacuating artifacts from Herring Point's precious vaults and safe keeps. Their destinations being the city of Marv's north of Herring Point where they are ordered to march from their head start northward up to Garner's Wall close to the frigid northern frontier colonias. The third batch would be the Imperial Household of Stla Ejak accompanied by the retinues of Marshal Hugot and the Chosen One Faith Langarm Haik accompanied. Need. The final batch is reserved for Grand Master Owen and the Archmage of the College. This second half of the evacuees are destined to cross in a one-way cross-ocean displacement to the elven continent of the city of Eth Island where they will enjoy the refuge under King Aslenidor's court and form an exiled administration generously given by the elves. From there as a safe power base to rebuild the Empire's strength. Alden and his lieutenants can plan out the continued defense of what is left of Sainagred with Aslanador's support. The first quarter group of evacuees were swiftly displaced without trouble, the adepts channeling the mirror of Ancelus to swiftly displace the very important people to Marvs, their bodies dissipating into residual mana dust. Meanwhile those that remained collected themselves to ensure that their belongings and loved ones are all at their needed place for the next arcane discharge. The Emperor made the final checks of his luggage and personnel, counting his group of fifty people abounding, forty even, forty-eight, forty-nine. He mumbled quietly, counting his people before reaching the end where his heart skipped a beat, the last of his count were to be his two children. But only his son Arthurfera was present. My son, where is your sister Estris? Alden shook his single child accounted for. She. She. The boy stuttered. A quick and desperate shake from his father however loosened his tongue. Qua ran away to find her friends. He confessed. She did what? The brass of that girl. Alden roared. My lord, the mage's mana has been replenished. Please step into the portal immediately. Hugit ushered the emperor. But he resisted him. No no. Alden wailed. My daughter. The princess. She is missing. Alden cried. The princess? My lord, if you allow me, I volunteer to search for your daughter. Faithlen knelt down. Out of the question boy. You are too valuable to stay behind. I should look for the imperial daughter. Let me stay behind. One night s. Of the march of Jifrey Thorda, Ledui Heliani Elas Noel volunteered. Don't move. A voice echoed in the hallway. Five figures emerged from above the chamber's seating podium. One wore a jacket as red as blood carrying with him a magical wand. On one hand, a curved sword of gleaming actocolite on the other. The next individual, in contrast, was a woman of blackest hair and snowiest of skin that made the Emperor and several of the guards' amulets alert to that this female was a vile such a full harlot of ageless arcane might. The last three individuals however were faces familiar to the Imperials. One bore an elegant elven braid of finest gold beauty, yet her body bore the corrupted effects of the otherworlder's influence, the fallen princess Aliathra. The second one was far more sinister of sights, the chosen one, seduced by the dark powers, the Ranupata, the shareholder, Samantha. But the last one was by far the coldest of treachery that invokes chilled hearts and fiery ire of all of the people present in the room. One Carlia Silverdane. Samantha, you dare raise your hand against his imperial majesty, Emperor Alden of the Empire of Slaeja. Faithlen drew his sword as he stood before her and the trembling luminaries he swore to protect. He was followed by Petra, Findrum, several Teaglay Garda and brave adepts who also challenged the other world is alongside him. I have heard of you and what you have done to my land's shareholder. Mogul Dolman's anger aroused him away from his beleaguered family as he unsheathed his axe against the captain. My ancestors, my people's ancestors and all the dwarfdom will curse your name in a thousand cups of our rancor, and I seek to end your abominable rampage now. I am tired of running away. The mogul stepped slowly to Faithland's side as tension arose the two warring sides into an impasse as they looked each other into their eyes face to face. The captain scanned her gun across the horizon of tangos in front of her. Sweat dripped from her beret as she cleared her throat to speak. Enough talk. This war. This pointless war ends now. She raised her rifle. Surrender now and I will promise all of you clemency. The rest of Samantha's companions too readied their weapons, 
faced against the congregation. So you must be the shareholder, one by the name of Samantha are you not? Stepped forward Grandmaster Owen, his eye carefully discerning and secretly admitting to admiring the composure of the captain as he stood resolute in her gaze against him. How many more lies did the other worlders fed you shareholder of us? What sweet nothings did all bone tainted into your mind that cause you, Princess Aliathro and I dare say, one of what used to be one of my finest students, Ledui Silverdane herself to fall into his wiles. He questioned their motives. No lies. Just the truth. Sam smiled. What matters now is that this ends today. You want the stars. Owen flailed. But I assure you, we will stop you to think. You are the daughter of House Luther. Eliathra can fall so easily. How could you turn your back against your own people? Elves of honor, virtue and prestige. You. Now consort with these disgusting creatures like the vampire and that thug behind you? Ambassador Hamtumil, Eth Island diplomat to Herring Point lay an accusatory finger upon Aris and Diaz who stood beside the elf. Your entire family have been gravely mortified by your disgrace. No matter how much you excelled, you could never rise up by your older siblings. Perhaps it was better that your parents had followed their advisors to have you hidden away as his third and youngest within the walls of Hellion Palace until you are of age to be Ma. Aliathra immediately cut the ambassador off. You speak of virtue, prestige and honor? Fire boiled from the elf's words. So, you sent the Cephid Liad to steal money from one of the empire's richest cities, attacking Tyrian and killing children? This is what the true elves of Alphalnora are now? We are no better than the Pact and their Camrilla, no better than the demons you claim to fight against, she rebutted shedding cathartic tears streaming on her cheek. Then what of you Ledui Silverdane? You seek to now make union with these violent sinful creatures? I thought better of you of one of the Silverdane bloodline, but now, look at you. Owen mocked the ex-collegiate. Do not invoke my family's name you backstabbing. Backstabbing. Corazon. Carlyle lashed, intentionally foregoing the honorifics that Owen didn't deserve. She initially struggled to curse but found it in herself, almost disturbingly for both her and everyone in the room to gain the coarse valor to speak with such emotion. You are the villain in this room, not the other worlders, she refuted. The Slaegians were taken aback, insulted greatly from the collegiate's words. Your crimes far exceed whatever transgressions they have done. Carlyle's words shifted into the offensive. I know of your dealings with Mogul Dolmond of suppressing the terrorist dwarves so they continue to be indentured on the whole dwarves' rule by destroying their non-magical inventions, but that pales to the great crime of fraud for self-gain. Spirin's will? You forged his handwriting so that you could become Grand Master of the College instead of my father, Kima. Then sent my father on an expedition that you could easily dispose of him so that you can secure your power. All of these times, the cloaks and daggers, the bribery and the deceit. Also you can maintain your grip of being the Grand Master? And what of that prophecy spell you used on that very mirror? What did it truly say? Or perhaps it is true that you had fought so hard to prevent only for it to come all into fruition? The end of the Empire? The Grand Master at the College? Now cornered and exposed by Carlyle's piercing accusations recoiled. All he had done was to protect the Empire from threats. Those he trampled along the way are simply unknowing hindrances to the growing star ascendant of Slaeja. It didn't matter who they are or where they come from. He must squash any challenge to the status quo before they are left to fester into an incurable cancer that could destroy the magistocratic balance of society. You can call us anything you want. Freaks. Monsters. Demons. I don't care. None of us care. We all stopped caring anymore until now we have you cornered. Sam snickered. And you know what's so funny? She asked them. You all act so perfect and mighty on the outside but you're all rotten through and through. All those freaks. Monsters. Demons. Hell should I say. Peons you blab about? In all my travel so far. They are more virtuous and honorable than all of you could ever be, Sam proudly states, remembering all the folks she had met, helped and befriended, from the gumptious Luya Amirian, the desire-seeking Iris Kadahagan, the hope-searching citizenry of Tyrian and their dreaming prince, 
the good-hearted Sanjulf, the loss now found Aliathra, the freedom crying Hodden and Kimura, the redemption seeking Galia Silverdane, the aspirant Olera, and lastly above all, herself who now sees herself founded a higher calling, perhaps even greater than her father's name ever could, all of those peoples and her own strengths converging into her soul in that very hour, clearing Samantha's mind forward as she challenged the mountain in front of her, dead or alive, you are all coming with us, the captain raised her gun, that is enough of your poisonous words demons, I will not hear any more of it, Emperor Alden shot her off, he is adamantly confident of their overwhelming advantage of numbers and overall combined potency of their talents they can overwhelm five individuals with Faith Len alone being the greatest of them. Shareholder yelled a taunting Faith Len, raising his blade upwards to rattle himself before combat. I have learned much, improved much from our last encounter many powerful spells and many fighting styles. I even have forged myself my own armor and sword that you and your minions had tried but failed to prevent me from obtaining from the Dwarven Mountains. You will not best me a second time, the youth bragged. In guard, he charged forth. The captain silently accepted her rival's challenge, not wanting to entertain this boy's bloated ego. He was ultimately just another obstacle and no more to her. Samantha's eyes were on the Emperor. I have dominion over the elements of Fireball Barrage, Thunderstorm, and many more. I wonder what I shall strike you down with what spell? All of them perhaps? Conjectures of varying magical energies circled around Faith Len's body as he readied his full strength displayed for all eyes in the chamber to marvel at his prowess. Sam, be rid of that brat swiftly. Remember there are much larger cattle to steal. Iris roguishly goaded her, placing her faith onto the training she delivered onto the captain many months ago. Such an overly pompous mage such as Faith Len still has not learned that those spells he described he can master were never meant for dueling other mages. From a practical standpoint, great if accomplished but simply too risky to cast in such a tense face off such as this. Taste my wrath. Faith Len hurled himself towards Samantha, his sword and sorceries at hand readying to burst forth his impetuous powers under her. He launched a barrage of elemental magics onto the captain, all homed in to obliterate her. It was predictable. As last time for Samantha to foresee. It's always the amateurs who go all out without any such backup plan or plan at all. She can tell easily by the way he composed himself that he was all muscle but no thought. Stepping forward, she imbued her leg and right fist with electron nuclear discharge that enables her to dash at Faith Len at a blinding speed. As fast and as unexpected as the crane's dive, Samantha thunderously uppercut punch onto the so-called Bane's torso him with thunder force of the spell she learned Thunder's fist sending him hurling back to his allies at their side of the room. The duel. To put such an event into question mildly, was over in just a single stroke. It was a simple spell, meant by mages to immobilize targets without the messy shedding of blood, yet effective against single targets of any kind when you apply the right force somatically or through artificial means of capacitating the mana energies needed to produce such a devastating attack. Who how? Alden jolted. Was this the power of the shareholder be made witness by his very eyes? You still know nothing child, I saw that from a mile off. Samantha shook her fist that was made rather stiff from such a high stopping power force it had produced even with the shock absorption of her Hecate suit. Faith Len wiggled himself back upright albeit barely, shaking his now ringing head. He stared into double the sight of Samantha in front of him with bloodshot gaze. You still think? You truly. Bested me. I. Won't. Let. His head rang the more he attempted to stay conscious to speak to Samantha only for him to collapse onto the ground where his followers caught him as the young man spat blood from out of his nose and mouth. I. I will. It is not over yet you evil witch. Final transmutation. Faith Lent shook away his helpers as he attempts to cast one more powerful spell to recover from such a devastating strike to his vitals. I would not continue on with this fight at your state if I were you. Aliathra shuddered when her ears twitched upon hearing the Bane's youthful arrogance but her warnings fell on deaf ears. 
for Samantha's intuition of the other arcane. Her opponent Faith Len yet again has made another perilous error. So perilous in fact she didn't even need to act, simply standing still as if awaiting the Bane's best shot. Overconfident as he is always, Faith Len readied himself to enchant himself with the final transmutation spell, gifting his body the exponential strength of a legion of soldiers to turn him into a warrior worth a thousand men. Only for his body to fully fail him as he collapsed cold onto the floor his body giving out to the debilitative state of mana exhaustion due to overcasting. Sparks of latent mana escape his body as blood began to seep out of his orifices, just as Samantha had predicted. That's a nasty case of overcasting. Samantha commented on the defeated chosen one. Definitely not want to be like him now. She coughed. You scholars of the college allowed him to study within your halls? Iris questioned Carlyle. That brat just can't duel with anyone that is his equal. The ex-collegiate embarrassingly nodded, confirming the witch's suspicions. I never thought the other professors would. After all I have seen allow him to learn such high demanding spells without going through the basics of body flow. She looked down pitifully at Faith Len's exhausted body, an embarrassment to his name and to mages everywhere. He is such a fool. Perhaps he should reconsider being some lord's private fool. The vampire mocked upon Faith Len's injured state. The captain couldn't help but give a playful chuckle to this. Faith Len's so-called prowess as a warrior was so lacking that it felt more like a crude joke being played on a weekend cartoon than anything else more serious than this display if you could even say it is a display. Yeah, I win again. Thanks to you Iris and Daly. She nodded to the elf and vampire witch. I see clearly now, what Petra and many others speak of you is true, shareholder. The Kadahagan scion and the corrupted elven princess has indeed trained you to the best of your form at present. Your arcane skill is indeed master level and this is the first time I see a mage channel their magics through the leg to cast the spell. Where do you come from? There are many places across the realms, and beyond I know of many. Where is your homeland shareholder, whose bloodline you belong to? Surely I must know that there is a part of you in there wanting to protect this world from the forces of destruction. If all bone wins, this world and all that is good in it shall be destroyed. Owen interrogated her. You know what? I will entertain that one. Samantha smiled. Bound Cherville, Quebec, of their rose bloodline she immediately answered. Her cheeks flushed with blush, it was her hometown. Bausha, Quebec, forgive me, I have never heard of a rose bloodline. Owen was momentarily stunned of Sam's answer. The name was exotic but he was sure he could remember the dialect somehow within his memory. Is that like a tribe from the south? Maybe one of the nomads or grass folks? The Grand Master asked. Earth, I am from the earth. Samantha indulged in this amusement further. You come from the underground? Oh. You mean you are from the southern deserts then? I remember one such tribe of nomads who would hide their brethren in caves to protect from sandstorms. Are you one of those folks? Owen asked shooting his answer from the hip. Why they are dumber than shit? Diaz whispered. I never knew you can be a cunt when you wanna be cap. He barely held his laughter. That is because this planet is not my home grandmaster. Samantha delivered her gags line. I am one of the other worlders. And this, she exposed her chosen one brand of the Ranupata from her glove to the Slay agents. To their horror, the brand was indeed the genuine seal as bestowed authentically by the Sacred Crystal Heart's infinite wisdom. I was not a mage, yet the Sacred Crystal Heart of yours chose me. Now I can tap to the weave just like you all can. But better, Samantha revealed. The heart. Chose you? Another worlder? The Grand Master froze. No, no, no. That's not true. The heart. That's impossible. He despaired. All of his followers, the rulers, their guards, and servants stood silent as Samantha and her team continued to aim their weapons towards them. You better believe old man. Samantha smiled. No, Owen denied her once again. The room's heartbeat skipped a beat. I do not believe one word of you. The heart would never brand another worlder. You are brainwashed by the demon all bone. You have to be. 
he stubbornly exclaimed. A cruel finger pushed forward by the Grand Master that all of this lay Egen witnessed. Relona Maxima. The Grand Master fired the powerful dispel incantation onto Samantha. Its blinding light filled the rule in at its radiance, but as the light faded, to the Imperial's shock, there stood again the corrupted shareholder unfazed and undeterred by one of the most powerful evocations of the wizard's book. Men, children and the faithful of the Empire, if the shareholder continues to speak and act blasphemies under the dark powers then we have no choice but to liberate her ourselves, dispose of these demons that have beguiled her and take shareholder alive. I wish to leave with her as my guest. My captive guest. Owen desperately ordered. Samantha gritted her teeth. They were not going to lay a single hand on her as long as she stands. The Imperials followed the Grand Master to the letter. Those that are willing to fight charged forth towards Samantha and her friends whilst another contingent of them shielded the elites of the Empire with their bodies. Owen. Open the portals. Ordered Sir Hubert as he clutched under him a cowering Emperor Alden who in turn shielded his son Arthurfra. Both the Marshal and the Grand Master agreed that as long as the Emperor and his court remains in Herring Point they are in mortal danger. Turning around under the protection of a protective ward and using the last bits of his energy he can muster left, Owen began to conjure a portal. Its destination the northern fishing and shipbuilding port of Marvs. Alden cursed himself and was left into a flurry-hearted stupor over the revelation. A part of him wonders if what Samantha speaks of her being not of this world was true. Meanwhile for the captain and her braves had their hands quite literally full with the several dozens of elite guards and adept mages trying to power through them by their superior numbers. They were much more stubborn and much more capable in a fight compared to their regular counterparts, thus giving honor and respect to their high positions. Using their superior numbers against Strider, they made their charge against Samantha through a pincer attack seeking to outflank their adversaries. The Praetorian-like T-Glay guards wore the best quality of armor that is able to resist both the blade and magic with a degree of bullet resistance in addition to several magical enchantments given out by the adepts to boost their prowess in battle. Diaz danced around their formations with his high-frequency katana, relying on swift thrusting expansions of his body, probing skirmish fire from Ruina before contracting back for a parry thanks to the T-Glay's alluvium defensive focused sword and board fighting style that clashed with his rapid water aggression, as faith in Aparo engineering had have it, it only took one dead centered slash of his blade to strike down T-Glay through their armor as its molecular breaking frequencies eradicated all forms of solid cohesion on their breastplates to them, the corpo was like a blur, a cursed cloud that, wherever it walked, the spilling of blood followed, as for the adepts a heavenly show of arcane fire of every spectrum erupted inside the chamber, both opposing parties powered greatly by the nearby mirror of Anselus. Yet Samantha, Iris, and Aliathra alone were more than a match of the two dozen or so adepts that met them. Aliathra using her abjuration magics to shield her allies whilst Samantha and Iris strenuously lasted arcane fire over wide their intended targets, the projectiles flying meters ahead of them much to the slay each an adept's relief. Samantha, you are missing, Carlyle cried. Watch, look, Samantha demonstratively pointed as sweat dripped from her brow. It was a technique that she and the vampire which were inspired by a category of Federation weapons dubbed smart weapons and their cybernetic micro-missile bullet technology by applying a little willpower via summoning techniques to control summoned puppets as per principles from the Conjuration School of Magic, one can take direct control of their magical projectile, they can precisely land their spell casts from more challenging ranges and terrains. The homing spell technique was devised by Samantha in response as a bypassing means against wards and the simple act of hiding for cover that many mages and normal people would do when facing against a mage. By the time the adepts realized those missed attacks circled around a pass like a spear thrusting cataphract it was too late to raise any response as they were shot down in arcane energy. The downside to this tactic was that it was slower and cost extra effort for the caster to successfully fire off compared to conventional attacks. At best given the situation, 
it can only bring down about 10 of their attackers before the rest manage to close the distance. Aliathra blasts some water on the ground. Samantha cried. The elf shifted her hands and cast atop of her create water spell, unleashing an aquatic flood of water that spilled onto the chamber floor managing to slip many of the charging enemy combatants clumsily onto the ground. At first, those tangos didn't understand why would their adversary blast them with an ultimately harmless spell as, despite their embarrassing state, they are still alive and can climb themselves back up. Yet it was another creative ploy of Samantha. Just as the Slay Aegeans were about to stand back up, a blinding light from Samantha's hands fueled by lightning magic's flash before their eyes. Fried tin cans coming up, Sam announced as she fired lightning a single lightning bolt onto the wet floor. The conductive properties of Aliathra's water spell allowed the lightning bolt to seed itself greatly across the wet area that those unfortunate hostiles found themselves in. They were electrocuted, volts escaping from their mouths before falling down dead, the electricity stopping all life inside them. This cannot be. Dolmond wailed. The elders couldn't believe that these three mages were besting the so-called best and brightest of the empire with such little effort and so little input of magics, using supposedly weaker spells and some kind of unholy sight being able to exploit such powers to ends not fully understood by even the Grand Master himself. Don't you see now Grand Master? Carlyle called him forth. Do you remember that invention your people try so hard to stop its birth? the steam drill from the Astelrooks. This is the power it has if you had only given it a chance. They will destroy me. Those sniveling peasants would destroy me and everything my ancestors built for. I will not allow your measly lives to desecrate my sight no longer. Mogul Dolmond brandished his axe before he and a cadre of geomancers hurled themselves into the fray. They let loose a hail of rocks made out of the broken marble plucked out from the chamber's stately floor intending to use suppress the other worlders off their balance. Don't lose focus, Carlyle shouted to Samantha as she cast her magics to counteract the dwarven barrage. The rocks were pulverized to dust, encapsulating the room into a thick and choking smog impairing vision short of a couple or so feet. Samantha quickly activated the Hecate suit's built-in helmet visor allowing her to retain her vision amidst all of the smoke. Immediately a painting of silhouettes. All of the humanoid shapes from those of at least average height to those deemed dwarfish illuminated on Samantha's sight. All of whom were tagged with the glow of red signifying one is deemed hostile based on parameters of weapon, mood, and several pre-existing inputs that Isaac had fed into that helmet. They were blinded and dazed either trying to expel the smoke around them or to escape the disadvantageous ground. Without dawdling at the moment. Samantha took aim with her FBR-20 and allowed herself to be consumed with bull-angered fury, bursting her bullpup rifle onto the group of hostiles passing over each of them indiscriminately. Eight bodies she dropped onto the floor, mostly of dwarfish size before the choking mist dissipated in full. For all of this death, it took 25 rounds of 7.62mm bullets an entire clip to produce this devastation. It was by far the most visceral act of violence the young captain has made in her entire soldiering career. Dolmond, a dwarf and woman cried from across the room. Laid before Samantha's feet was one sumptuously dressed dwarf, adorned with jewels and carrying an equally luxurious beard idax signifying his elevated status whose body was pierced into. The dwarf noble life slowly ebbed away eyes wide open to gaze onto his killers as he holds his still warm body together. A second later, his hands that stifled his bleeding body faltered as the gaping cracks within his resplendent armor from the FBR-20's armor-piercing bullets discharge blood that stigmatizes the white marble floor in sacred highborn blood, Mogul Dolman's blood. Owen, get that portal open now. Sir Hugot desperately pleaded. They needed to escape now more than ever or they too will be put down onto the floor like sheep awaiting slaughter if they dally any longer. The Grand Master needed more time to properly input the correct amount of mana into the slowly materializing floor. By all accounts, this next spell would not be as so clean and straightforward as the last teleportation earlier. As soon as the portal opens, it is the point of no return. 
He had faith in the remaining healthy bodies still left to contend with the corrupted Chosen One that the Grand Master can hold out just a while longer. It's over, Sam declared as she raised her FBR-20 towards Owen, but just as she was about to pull the trigger of her rifle, her gun was knocked away by a magically phantasmic sword, violently diverting her plan to disrupt the Grand Master's ritual. No further, cried Sir Petra Rukdorf, who emerged away from the group of guards protecting the Imperial elites to enter himself into the fray. He summoned across his body dozens, a weapons rack full of magically summoned weapons to his beck and call. Their material form was of a crystalline yet still a faintly visible sight. He released forth his weapons that darted towards the captain in frightening speeds. The dwarf and monster hunter Findrum and the crow master Meter charged forth towards Samantha's allies whilst Petra had her all to himself. Samantha barely had enough time to conjure her shield to protect herself. One such of the armored knight's magical blades cutting a glancing pass across the captain's cheek before her defense was fully set up. If she was a split second shorter, that magic blade would have delivered a crippling blow to her shoulder. Now the tables had turned on Sam as now she is forced to be put into the defensive as Petra besieged her with his storm of magic's blades. It wouldn't take long before those vorpal weapons of his get much luckier strike on her than just a simple scratch that now heavily suppressed her. I will defeat you shareholder. Petra charged towards Sam, his heavyweight knocking down Samantha to the ground, his frontal attack a ruse to hamstring her senses allowing Petra the opportunity to tackle her into the ground. The armored knight had more than enough experience disposing and facilitating the arrest of rogue mages in his many adventurers. Samantha being no different. Mages require immersive amounts of concentration to perform their spells. If one can imbalance that, the mage's extraplanar abilities can be stifled by those of lesser of arcane prowess or none at all. Targeting the captain's two arms, the magic knight grappled for her arms so that she will not be able to fire her magics properly and nor escape thanks to his superior weight mounted atop of her. Master Owen. Hurry! Petra huffed as he locked Samantha down. The portal by this point has reached its fullest strength. Its destination, the Sanctuary of Marvs. His task completed the Grand Master to step away from the portal and came down to assist Sir Ekdorf in seizing and securing the corrupted Chosen One. Meanwhile, the Imperial Elite's eyes raced with excitement, seeing salvation finally arrived. Already the first few peoples rushed towards the portal enjoying the salvation of Marv's immediately upon coming across through time and space to reach its sanctimonious blue ocean coast. But as for Emperor Eldin, he stubbornly against the good intentions of his bodyguards to dislodge from his frozen state, not without his daughter Astris of whom he cannot fathom to leave behind. We shall have a much more intimate time together from this point forward shareholder. Owen smiled as he approached Samantha. Fear, panic and anger gripped the captain as she attempted to kick, rattle and cry for help. Catching glimpse of her squadmates, she saw that all four were preoccupied fighting against the Teagley guards assisted by the dexterous meter who struggled against Tyrus whilst the equally tenacious Findrim dueled with Aliathra whilst Carlia and Diaz kept the enemy Praetorians away. They realized too late when they saw their commanding officer being dragged away beyond their reach, bound and gagged. Not likely. Sam gnashed her teeth as she concentrated her mind into work. Casting upon herself the spell blur, the captain became briefly surrounded by a silvery mist that made her body become as empyrean as incense smoke, something she had learned from the Black Elven Sisters of the Blade upon reverse engineering their spell techniques. This allowed Samantha to slip away from Petra's grip before the magic knight could react. Reimposing his battle stance with his floating vorpal weapons at the ready to attack when his crafty adversary reappears. Hey! Samantha shouted from one direction. Petra launched his weapons, their strikes intending to maim the shareholder so that they can facilitate the ease of her capture. But just as the tables turned, Petra himself was fooled by a playful trick of Samantha's own. For that Samantha was an illusion, a misdirection to draw his attacks away from where the captain truly will strike from. Displaced atop of Petra, 
Samantha ambushed the armature with a hammering axe kick dead striking onto the area between his shoulder and neck. The strike instantly knocked the magical knight onto the ground. A soft sigh escaped Petra's mouth as he faded into a lethargic state, his magic swords dissipating in due part of his now dislocated right shoulder. Landing roughly onto the ground, Samantha was about to pull out her backup secondary sidearm to open fire at the escaping Imperial elites when suddenly her body stiffened into a standstill. She has been paralyzed. With no physical weight restraining her it was all in the likelihood that she was being magically bounded via the hold person spell. She had dreaded being under such enchantment as it leaves her most vulnerable against anyone's mercy as she not only cannot at most perform most if not all of the spells she can cast but also her limbs to fight back. This relies instead in another spellcaster or with some force of will on her own end to dispel the enchantment away which already those two countermeasures alone invited all sorts of tactical vulnerabilities. You have been causing too much mischief for far too long shareholder. Owen caressed her rose wine hair perilously as he marveled for a brief moment observing Samantha's Hecate suit. The Grand Master turned his gaze with an elated glee to Samantha's still struggling squad mates. Kill them all. We have our greatest treasure about to leave right here. He besmirched his palm atop of the captain's head. Sam struggled with her willpower once again. They will not cut down her friends under her watch, not whilst she is standing, not while she can still fight. Forcing herself off of the arcane bindings, Samantha channeled what remains of her will and the limits of well beyond what the current incarnation of the Hecate suit is intended to capacitate her powers for. Owen barely fathomed what the shareholder is about to do when Samantha's olive eyes bloomed brilliantly in arcane light. A focused yet scorching beam of energy escaped her from her oculus, powerful enough to give force yet not as so due to her own bodily limitations cause direct harm that repulsed the Grand Master who held her captive away flying across the room before crashing violently onto the podium seats of the chamber. Upon the instant Samantha's sudden outburst faded away, the spell on her broke allowing full bodily control of herself once again. The captain was left in a gaze as protective saline tears secreted onto her eyes. Such a powerful output of magic had nearly caused permanent damage to her corneas. Meanwhile from up above them, Strider group can hear the violent drumming of super ospreys hovering above them as the doors of the chamber sprung open and out swarm a flood of the Federation's soldiers descending down the stairs readying to tighten the noose on those remnants of the Empire attempting to flee. Sammy. The Emperor is about to escape, Diaz warned her. Regaining her senses, Samantha can see that Findrum and Mita had dragged off Faithlen and Petra away to safety as the stubborn Emperor who witnessed the whole spectacle was being slowly escorted off with his retinue to the slowly dissipating portal. Catching herself, Samantha grabbed just as she originally sought out to do and took aim with her gladius. She aimed center mass intending to fatally shoot down the Emperor as he is about to escape when he got a clear shot onto his vitals. She squeezes the trigger, at her, cried a young female voice from out of nowhere. A girl of green long hair wearing a modest blue and gold robe of the Imperial colors aslant Samantha's arm away causing her to miss her shot, careening harmlessly of course. Merched, Hedred I me, Alden cried out, reaching out his arms desperately as he and his son Artafa were forcibly dragged by Sir Hubert into the portal. Faith Len's retinue had already limped away towards the portal ahead of them leaving the Emperor, his son, and his marshal being the only people left to evacuate this now doomed city. We must leave now, Hubert shouted, reluctantly, he had to make what could perhaps be arduous of difficult choices in all of his life. Expending all of his strength, the marshal forcibly pushed his still belligerent legion his son into the portal before he too jumped into its illuminated embrace just as the magic dissipated and their exit closed away leaving a disappointed strider group who stood down as the rest of their fellow Federation soldiers secured the chamber. Samantha without thinking pushed off her pint-sized assaulter away angered that she missed her shot. A moment of last-minute nuisance had just caused the Federation the prize of the Emperor's head. Standing up quickly, 
The captain grabbed the girl and locked her flailing arms into grapple trapping the rebellious native in her hostile clutches. Objective is secured. I repeat shield father, the mirror of Ancelus is secured. A Ufif squad leader radioed bollocks. He got away. Crocker grumbled frustratingly witnessing firsthand of how the Emperor had slipped away by the skin of his teeth. Hey Carlyle, this brat is getting feisty here. Can I get some help? Samantha called the collegiate as she grappled the interloper roughly to prevent any chance of escape. Let me go. The girl struggled, tears of tribulation shed down her porcelain cheeks, staining them with a sanguine blush. The collegiate, however, stood there silently staring down onto the short young woman that Samantha held captive and defiant. Carlia instantly, to her astonishment and horror, recognized the young girl. That brat is Princess Istris Lae Jack, daughter of Emperor Ralden, she explained. A rather embarrassed Samantha had her body electrocute stiffed as her blood froze. She gently let go of the girl that she had apprehended so callously as the custody of Estrus transferred to Carlyle. The Imperial Princess wasted no time, using her lithe bare hands to batter Carlyle with weak hammering blows on her thighs to signify her defiance. My father and the chosen hero will return for me and slay all of you villains. I will never allow myself to be married off to the wicked Prince Clovich. Or. Or turned into some kind of sacrifice for an evil ritual of evil. Estress roared. She had read of many stories of what many villains and cretins do to fair noble ladies such as herself and feared she may be befallen of such a fate if not for the dreaming hope of a knight in shining armor bravely sallying forth to her rescue. Not wanting to get the trouble of such a feisty subject, Carlia quickly cast a simple sleep spell onto the Imperial Princess of which she immediately calmed down and fell limp onto the Collegiate's arms fast asleep. I shall take care of her for now. Estrus must be taken away from all of this madness. She simply cannot fathom any of this. Carlia nodded to Strider. She is the daughter, right? That's one hell of a card we could play against her father. I say we don't waste it and jiggle a lay I'll de off of winnings yeah? Diaz suggested. God damn it Vinny this is a kid we are dealing with. Clay protested such an appalling suggestion. A hostage is still a hostage kid. Even if they are well. An actual kid. Still. I suggest for now we should keep her under house arrest until command figures out something to deal with her. Crocker says his piece. I do believe Prince Clovich will likely has final say on what we should do with the Imperial Princess Sir Crocker. Carlia cradled distress into her arms carefully. So just her? The Emperor's kid? Barely worth a damn. Abidar disappointingly kicked the loose rocks that lay scattered around the chamber. Captain, objective Colzaro is a bust then? I command needs a status report. Clay wielded his radio and asked Samantha. Hold on. Did I not see you hurl the Grand Master over there? Carly reminded her. Now grasping that there could still be a prize worth capturing in the Federation's claw crane gambit, Samantha leapt from her stand and raced towards where she saw Grand Master Owen crashed onto, as expected. His unconscious body laying almost tranquil amongst the broken splinters of seatings amongst the podium. Cocking her pistol and holding onto her, special magic cancelling handcuffs, the shareholder slowly approached Owen ready to take him alive or dead back to her commanders. As she was mere feet away from him, the wizened old major woke from his wounded slumber. A single painful moan emitted from his mouth. You will not have me that easily, Owen growled. Casting mist step, he faded into smoke as his silvery form began to dash away just before the captain could get a shot or grasp of him off. Vapors of smoke tailed his back as he evaded the Federation soldiers. Chase him. Don't let him get away. Ken shouted. Samantha's mana thirst kicked into her as she gave chase. Her squad following with her. Dash. That is. Unfortunate Colonel. I expected better from you. Prince Clovich answered his disappointment stressing his word as he returned the radio back from his personal adjutant. He was just told of everything that had transpired in the college from his Federation allies. Of how they were so close, but alas the prized slipped away from right under their reach. With Emperor Ralden and most of the vital members of the Imperial ruling elite successfully escaping from their grasps, the prize of total victory escaped the usurper prince. 
it will be a long if not grueling interim of time before an opportunity similar to this wasted event to arise, thus resulting in a more stretched out civil war between his faction and the imperial remnants, a war he simply desired to see the shadow of war taint his homeland, but alas, nothing ever truly goes guaranteed as planned there are always setbacks and for now. The prize of Herring Point and its geostrategic position within the Empire has acquired him albeit superficially substantial claim to the Mandate of Heaven across all of Zanigrad, but still, there are many challenges of his self-declared claim that would disrupt his newfound prestige. Although he may have the industrial and mercantile sections of the slowly grumbling empire into his dominion, there is still much of the agricultural heartlands that he will need to seize from his foes most especially now that harvest season has arrived on Tuzanagrad at this cycle. By all accounts, Alden is plotting his retaliation of what remains of his empire as he stands idle on his former seat of power. He must act quickly if he is to secure his position. Speaking of his foes from out, he also faced challenges from within. Despite his best efforts the ravages of war still defaced its visage and to much of the lands between Tefret and Herring Point with many men who would have otherwise be in their farms or in their homelands never returning back which that too will leave a gaping hole into the future of his new empire's economy. Much as it pains him, but he will have to curry favor with his patrons within the Federation for their aid even if it's against the sensitive wishes of his newly conquered subjects who despite all of this, are still considered by many within his homeland of Tyrian to be their kin. Meditating on his words, Prince Clovich exited himself from the ruined imperial throne. Once the seat of Emperor Alden as he made his way out of the newly annexed imperial palace. In all his honesty, it will be the last time he would sit on the throne. Now that his revolution is about to achieve so many great new leaps forward that it had become a relic, a painful relic of a past brought low by its own hubris. Making pass his personal guards who celebrated with their federation allies over the victory he called into attention all men who can hear him. Brothers and sisters of the new Zanigrad, of all the cycles of time I have seen, experienced, and journeyed through, None of them have filled me with greater anxieties than what we have all accomplished today. He began his victory speech to his men. About 10,000 attendants, soldiers, and civilians alike flocked to hear him speak. Some burning with the same hope Clovich bore into his heart. Others, most especially the newly conquered burghers of Herring Point fearfully hearing the words of what their conqueror intends to do with their fair city. From the southern tale of the Asluriks. They say that little hill can never yield, to the depths of the sloughs of the Dragatoi Eyes coast of where one demon lord's folly cost him his conquest. They say that Mania's bluff could never be conquered over the walls of this mighty city. They say that the very heart of the empire, Herring Point, could never be overcome. But I see you now, here where emperors stood firm on their dominion as far as their eyes could see that we, the Laniu of New Zanigad have achieved the impossible, an orchestra of cheers bravado Prince Clovich with thunderous applause from the land year whilst the newly conquered shuddered silently, the prince's speech sounding more of a conqueror. But, even then, the prince digressed after all we have done. I ask you once more my followers, to follow me one more time, not through swords, shields, and other such arms. I ask you to turn your weapons, not of war but to protect those of what you cherish your lives to see and grow into a mighty tree to stand the test of times. To turn our blades of old whose cadaver we now stand upon from symbols of the old order and of a past unneeded into plowshares, to building hammers and quills. I speak to you that this war with the misguided old empire is far from over. A new type of war, Perhaps this or even more paramount than the battlefield is the war for structure. We must bring about a new Zanigrad just as many have dreamed. We shall dream unto truth from the corpse of the old world a legacy to last ten thousand years. We shall bring unto thy realm, paradise onto our lands. Free from fear and from want, what we have brought upon ourselves that us to are equally guilty of its bringing is a broken inheritance, a shattered homeland. It is our fervid duty, now as the day graths to nightfall, tomorrow shall bring about a new rising star over all of Zanigrad. I shall end my speech with one single, 
daring question unto all of you, what is the Sainagrad you wish to leave to your children and their future? The crowd cheered and hailed his name once again to a vigor stronger than he had received back home in Tyrian. Clovich humbly descended down upon his elevated stand as he met up with his closest advisors and attendants. They have much work to do if they are to see his dream to fruition. Dash. Owen locked the door behind him, his body begging for breath. As he inhaled and exhaled heavily, using whatever is left of his powers, he managed to evade the now rampant patrols of demons that swarmed Herring Point, using his own disposed knowledge of the Hollow's shortcuts to reaching to the holy sanctuaries of the Grand Cathedral. Quite miraculously, the building remained immaculate despite the devastations brought forth albeit most of the abbots and clergy had either fled into hiding north or were captured, in all likelihood. He might be the only living soul left inside the building. After a brief moment of respite, he stood back up, grabbed a nearby torch, and began to descend into the cathedral's sanctums. Thanks to the sanctified ground of the building, Owen could feel assured that no demons would dare step foot under the God's holy presence into this sacred structure. Walking past the half-desecrated vaults filled with holy treasures and relics of the Empire's pantheon. There was one object he needed to rescue before he could leave, confident that he is crafty enough to smuggle the sacred relic out of Herring Point on his own means. Thankfully, the door to its respective vault was previously unlocked during the extrication. Oh! It is you again! How quaint! The voice of the sacred crystal heart greeted coldly the Grand Master, its reverberated voice capable of piercing his bones. You speak to us now, I must hurry and hide you under my enchanted bag of holding. We must leave this place at once whilst Malinry still shines north of us. The Grand Master informed the relic. He attempted to lay his hands on its crystalline body but as he attempted to lift the sacred heart off of its velvet cushion, the object refuses to allow gravity to enact its will upon it as if firmly attaching itself to its pedestal and no matter what desperate attempts the old wizard tried to dispel whatever enchantments it emplaced into itself, the relic simply to his horrified chagrin refused to yield. Do not waste your efforts again old man, I will not allow myself to be moved from my rather lofty abode by the hands of most especially you, the heart protested. What blasphemies you speak of. Owen couldn't believe that he is having a tense argument with a grandiose piece of sentient magical rock at such an ill-chosen time. The demons are about to come into this cathedral and defile this place off all of its treasures, you included if you do not allow me to carry you. Why do you even bother with me? I have already fulfilled my purpose, what more do you want from me? The heart pressed the Grand Master for an answer. All of this prophecy. We are about to be devastated by these other worlders and we need guidance on how to enact the Empire's salvation. Owen explained himself, still continuing to pull away from the heart from its stationary position. I saw the monstrous beasts that came out of the void to swallow our world. Have you not chosen three people to be blessed with your brandings? We need guidance to save us all. We are lost now that the capital has fallen. He cried. Several tense moments passed before Owen could hear a faint yet repeating beat rhythmically arising from the sacred heart. It had sounded like laughing. You are just a slaver into your own fears of losing your so called salvation that you so desperately sought. You have been running away from it this entire time, the heart answered. Owen silently stepped back, frightened of these mysterious revelations. What was this relic speaking of? I shall admit that my choice of those three chosen ones is indeed the best of choice given the circumstances I have appraised and measured over thousands of scrying calculations in all of my existence of being, it is simply, as I now have to explain to such children such as yourself, but your so-called interests for the empire is not in concert of my predetermined calculations, the heart explained, his tone sharpened to belittle its hearer. I never expected your nation of troglodytes to stand a chance to begin with. W what, what are you speaking of? Owen lashed out, the sacred crystal heart began to shine brightly, similar to its holy radiance when it activated to choose the next chosen branded, a ray of its light then directed itself sharply onto Owen's face, but instead of fluttering his eyes in natural instinct, 
His eyes lay widened and unblinking as a deluge of magical energies was forcefully being fed into his body all at once by the relic. Let me speak you the many truths of this world, the heart began to lecture Kuldo. Was never the hero you thought he'd be, Owens painfully screamed. But there was nobody for him to hear his pleas, dash. Clear, Samantha shouted as her team entered the sacred crystal heart's vault. It had been a long a grueling chase in Herring Point as they tracked down the whereabouts of the runaway Grandmaster, thanks in part to the Hecate suit's ability to track magical traces, specifically the unique frequency of magical spells being cast, Samantha's squad tracked down their quarry into the Grand Cathedral of the Imperial Capital. They didn't have time to stop and admire its opulent religious artwork as they turned on their flashlights to illuminate the room. Immediately they spotted Owen, in his white and college heralded Grandmaster robes laying prone onto the polished stone floor. Ken approached the Grandmaster and examined his body, placing his fingers onto his neck as his googles observed his conditions. He silently turned to his CEO and nodded disapprovingly. At 8 p.m. the Grand Master of the College was found dead in the cathedral vaults. His eyes and mouth balled fluids alongside his body that stiffened to the touch. Cause of death, suicide by poison consumption. Just as Samantha was about to take a sigh of dissatisfaction that all of her efforts in hunting the VIP down had all been for naught. Until she heard a voice coming from across the chamber. Greetings Samantha. You have taken a long time to finally get here. The Crystal Heart spoke. Chapter 56. Agenda of Many Faces. Greetings Samantha. You have taken a long time to get here. The Sacred Crystal Heart spoke to the captain. A cold wind brushed along Strider as they turned their gaze upon the shining stone elevated reverently at the far end of the room. It was adorned in an altar of abandoned incense burners, still pristine murals of myth and melted candle wax, if it was a person, the heart was of a king that speaks forth its will upon all subjects present in the room, the heart, it, is speaking to us, Aliathra bowed humbly before the holy artifact, the elf was also followed by Carlyle who lay prostrate with her, you are it aren't you, Samantha treaded softly closer to the heart, you are the one responsible for this mark on my hand, Samantha took off her gloves and showed her branding amidst all of the cybernetic augmentations that now dotted her hand into an amalgamation of the human flesh, the metal augmentations, and the mysteries of the arcane. Ranupata, the shareholder, Samantha Rose, the one not of the blessed. Now becometh one with the Illyrium, the heart responded. Having achieved many great accomplishments and gained the fellowship of fascinating companions during your travel so far Miss Rose, your achievements in the Asterix, the conquest of Brian Bark, and the defeat of the Black Elves in New Orgonia. How did you know of all that? Samantha asked. The brandings that I have shared among you, Doubter Malona, and Boy Faith Len are a part of my functioning collective intelligence. Samantha, I see what you see and feel what you feel. I saw your pain, your doubts but also your triumphs and that I am well pleased that my calculations of your character were within acceptable parameters. With a few deviations. The heart answered, hold on, collective intelligence, calculations, parameters, are you some sort of computer or AI, Ken raised, such terminologies were unexpected to be spoken of a sentient relic of Gleesia's allegedly primitive origin, that depends on who is asking, the heart cryptically replied, but within the context, you may call me Abacus. It spoke formally. Strider group were left aghast but stood eruditely as they continued to hear of what this sentient object has more to say. I shall be direct with you now for I cannot stay silent no longer, the heart announced. I thank you greatly for upon driving off the Alliance of the Light. With them on the run it will not be long before the truest in the most subjective sense of the next age may begin. I had selected the branded carefully for their specific role to act in this grand design. You speak in Riddle's heart. Carlyle shook disbelievingly. Why create the Chosen Ones if you intend to have two of the branded belong to the other worlders and the one to the Empire? From what all happened so far, both sides wish to kill each other. Crocker added, folding his arms. 
it is with great assurance to all of you present that the worst aspects of the war are far past you now that you have driven those so-called alliance away from here. Those poor fools rely too much on past glories and heroes for their own good. The heart commentates unlike you, Samantha, saying her name ominously. Why so? The captain questioned. I was told you create chosen ones to help save this world from dangers. My purpose is always the well-being of this world Samantha. The here defended itself. Glesia does not revolve around just the Empire, the Elves, and the Dynasts. Your purpose in the grand design of the coming age is of an ideological and philosophical alteration of the course of this world's impending fate rather than a grievous existential threat. But then again. Is there a difference? That the old ways must die so that in its ashes, fertilize the seed of the new order ascension? Abacus lectured. In essence, you are all merely educational instruments for a grand requalization, not heroes. Explain. The captain pressed. Chosen ones, of whom like to call themselves heroes, but they are merely agents to me, components to catalyze the conditions required to allow the sprouting of the coming age. You. The Istigal, the Gweninager, or Lara as I calculated are doing what they all naturally would do. That, I am certain you will continue on your journey to correct what Cool Del and Albone's mistakes were, many centuries ago, Abacus explained. Mistakes? What do you mean by the Founder King and the Dark Lord's mistakes? Carly inquired. The story is much great and may take too long for me to speak all at once. Samantha, the heart evaded. But perhaps this old fellow laying down here you can speak better than I ever could. He left a message for you before his passage. The heart began to emit brightly as a holographic light materialized into a humanoid shape before Strider Group. It took the form of the late Grand Master Owen who lay dead, suicide by poison. His facade from what the squad discerns was slouched, filled with a great burden that weighed down upon the old man as he gave out his final words. Hello, Samantha, Strider Group. And Ledewey Silverdane. The holograph spoke. Carly recognized that voice amidst the static that the heart imperfectly replicated. It was Owen's. The crystal heart had shown me the truth of everything had happened in this world from the past to the present and it broke my mind and spirit. It revealed to me, through what little compunction I have left of all my guilt, of all of the horrible things I had done in the name of my selfish pride and greed. I realize now that I no longer deserve to live anymore. The prophecy, the one where I saw Gleesia burn was supposed to be our salvation, yet in my foolishness, I perverted and corrupted its message, causing your people's arrival into this world, the needless death and destruction this war has brought, and will continue to purge all blights that plagued our lands until Gleesia is made pure owns again. However, whether the prophecy could be interpreted in any other way, the result is still the same. The slay each an empire must perish for its ashes to sprout the coming age's dawn. I blame not only myself but my fellow countrymen that we have followed the wrong path like King Cardell when he fought against Tallbone. It was no wonder now I know. That just like the stories, he disappeared in shame after winning against the first demonic invasion because he realized that the demons were the true victors of the war not the light. Caldell was simply just. Branded to be only all bones containment. The legends were a lie, Samantha concluded. Meanwhile her fellow friends Iris, Aliathra and Carlia collapsed into themselves in their own ways, barely able to stomach of what they had just heard. Carlia recoiled behind a wall whilst Aliathra stared longingly into her holy pendant. Meanwhile, Iris held closely to Cairn's hand for his warmth. I know it is too late to ask for your forgiveness but if you search my bag it will contain all the intel you need to deal with the remnants la Aegean's empire that I wrote. I hope with this, I can at the most I can do now is help Prince Klovich. Now soon to be the new emperor of Xenograd's mission to ameliorate all of Gleesia. Farewell Strider. For not only the deepest darkest voids await me. But also Ysperin, Keemle and all of those I have wrong are waiting for me there too. I am glad you and your people have arrived in Gleesia. Do not abandon your mission Samantha. We never had the chance to see our future. Owen bid goodbye as the holograph dimmed off. What do you have to say now Samantha? 
The heart turned to the captain, son of a bitch, she cursed, crouching down on Owen's deceased body and grabbed several parchments of paper as he described he would have. I, I don't know what else to say, yet you do Samantha, you have much things to say of yourself, you have always wanted to be a hero. Just like your father, and his father and their fathers before haven't you not? The heart challenged. I got to know firsthand the strength of your character when my brand linked into your memories from when it first embedded itself onto you. Know this for I have passed judgment of you now. You are one who doesn't leave everything to fate if you can help it. No matter how many times everything, as if all of the easier wish to stop you. Your actions is always what you believe is right. You, Samantha Rose, branded of the shareholder have always pushed yourself and those around you forward. In a way, you became the weaver of destiny and nobody else can take that gift away from you. Abacus strengthened her. Captain Rose. This is Wrench Squad. Samantha's radio arose to life. It was from the new Albany Militia's resident CPRN team, of whom are tasked for the confiscation of arcane objects recovered in Gleesia for the Federation's study. Have you found what you are looking for? Command wants us to move the anomalous object back to HQ immediately now. I believe it is time for me to move into a new dwelling Ranuputta. It is optimal that I present myself to the Istsigol before the day is done. We can accomplish much more together within his abode than chatting together of the many truths of this world in this dingy old pile of rocks. The heart, rather excitedly nudged the captain. Yeah. You are right. Samantha stood back up and pressed to reply on her radio. This is Strider. Follow the stairs down three levels and a move forward until you find a large door. We will be waiting on you to make the move. Dash. It was easy to bask in the laurels of the Imperial Palace for Prince Clovich, the warmed marble floors, the spacious hallways, the decorative facade and the luxurious furnishings could easily soften the muscles of whoever claims mastery over this lavish estate, yet the rebellious prince feel a certain unease simply being within the premise, perhaps the victory he had achieved today was beneath all its grandeur was hollowed when he heard they had failed to capture the fleeing emperor and his court. Such a capture would have decisively stamped out the old empire's leadership in one fell swoop today, but now they roam free at the northern provinces awaiting to plot their next move. Or maybe, it was the doubts of the weight of his revolution slowly chipping away at his once stoic demeanor. One door opens, and now two more have taken their places as he gathered his closest followers, yet nonetheless, the former emperor's residence, now the slowly emergent tenderfoot seat of power for the new Zanigrad amelioration Gwynidjith was an almost heavenly elevation of prestige compared to his ancestral keep back in Tyrian, yet his advisers and ministers, both foreign and of his own roused him from his victorious hebertude for he is only one a temporary, albeit key upset, the iron must be struck while it's bar. The emblematic future of the realm still remained able for his hands to sculpt, led to the recently abandoned war room, a large map of the empire, all of its holdings, its trade and supply routes, colonies and more lay before him. In attendance was his foreign-born advisor or attache Sir Thomas Sight alongside his trusted captain Sir Bardimag, his lifelong sage of all things arcane the Major Edmolm Vallel. The representative of the Federation's armed forces is Colonel Polonsky, two diaphanous members of the famous Strider group Dewey Silverdane and Princess Aliathra, and then lastly, on call from their youth's communicators is Dr. David Malona whose voice mimeographed his presence even if it's just only his voice and attentive ears rather than his bovine self. All right then, map of the whole empire is coming online in just about a second. The colonel fiddled his handheld gadget, Polonsky had been finishing inputs of his portable geographic device, encoding the newfound wealth of data the warum with its library of scrolls of their predecessors administrative documents over their domain. It didn't take a minute longer for the holographic map to come alive in vivid eye-catching display onto the table, a comprehensive map of unparalleled accuracy of cartography for Clovich and all of his confidants to oversee with unrestricted ascendancy. 
Everything of what he has achieved and yet to accomplish became surreal unto the eyes and ears of the prince. All the words of his confidants blurred into his head like a storm that it was hard to keep up with the finer details. At best he can only outline whatever filtered essences of each of his advisers' words before formulating his response. Sir Mag briefed the prince into the situation, the holographic map visually updating as they speak. The newly conquered territory of what areas of the now broken empire of what their territory consists of the Duchy of Tefrate, the Duchy of Suville, the principality of his native Tyrian, and finally Herring Point. From his accumulative knowledge of the territories, he has effectively cut off the southern and eastern blood veins of the empire's consumption not to mention its lumber supply of the Cambervale forest. As for his opposition, the imperial remnants could count on the last major port with access to the western sea which is Marv's. The vast majority of the empire's farmlands and a relatively intact northern legions of whose veterancy fighting Dos and Barbarians is part to none in all of the imperial legions. For the emperor and his court however, according to Owen's last testament acquired by a Dewey Rose and Strider group, they had fled to the sanctuary of King Aslinidor's court at Death Island in the Alphalnora by this time. As for the military leadership of what remains of the seniority of the Legion, Adventurers Guild, and the College of Magi, they had fled to North to continue to challenge Prince Klovich's claim with what remains of firmly imperial territory. Thankfully, Polonsky informed him that they can convert the now abandoned township of New Argonia into a joint federation land a year military base to jumpstart any expansions northward. About five battalions or 3,500 men's worth of military power, 21st and 23rd infantry with the 88th Mountain Brigade attached, 45th Armoured, 53rd Engineers and 99th Motorized their next offensive dubbed Operation, Northern Sweep the optimum number of soldiers he can press for the offensive with reserves planned ahead from his marines when needed. Its objective, capture all remaining northern imperial lands up until Ghana's wall fortress. The additional attachment of native guides mostly from the centaur biased folks would be key to carving out territory at the hardy northern provinces. Yes, find them and track them all down. The prince said, we won't rest until all of the empire is under our banner. Speaking about remnant imperial territories, there was also the debate on what shall be done on the Slaeach and colonies down south on the untamed frontier beyond his own native Tyrian. The same will likely be the fate of the north but albeit a secondary priority for the amelioration until the heartlands are secured. Still. If he can decently recall the stories he had heard of the southern expanse beyond the eastern deserts and the suzerainties, they tell of vast untamed, unexploited and fertile forest plains that the colonies are the sources of exotic goods such as rare animal merchandise and spices. There are several conflicts between the Slaeagian colonists and the local tribes and wild monsters in the area but such events insignificantly disrupt the Empire's importation before the Federation's arrival. Ultimately, if Klovich wishes to diversify his new nation's economy to stand on par with the Federation, his next target will be the South subjugation. There was also the fact that they should also consider of is the possibility of an elven intervention coming from Ulthil Noro across the western sea as warned by Aeliathra, specifically her homeland Sontont who would surely rally their armies against them once the word has befallen that Herring Point has been taken over by an army of demons. For now, the priority of the amelioration is on the home front as Sir Mag and Colonel Polonsky argued, if they dared to intervene the tenacity and the aurora will be on call to intercept. They will, one way or the other must come into the fold eventually, Klovich says his piece. His mind burned with all the oncoming concerns besieging him. He trusts his general's ability to put these enemies by his gates all by themselves. Klovich's proverbial sword, to eliminate challenges. However, if the amelioration were to be destined the successors of the old empire's ashes, he needed to legitimize his right to rule starting from what he now has in his possession before working his way outwards. Consolidating his unquestioned dominion over his new lands will be equally as key.
he needed his shield. Edmo, using again the scrolls of documents found in the room now gained a basal view of the internal situation of the Empire's home front prior to their invasion. The Astarok eruption had devastated the majority arable land of the Empire resulting in the cycle's harvest being ruined just as harvest season is about to begin. Thomas Sight feared a famine is about if not already happening in the Empire. Limited reportages of the stockpiles indicate that the Imperials have only about a fraction of the food stock accessible from their side of the divide. The opposite could be said about his own nation, however, thanks to his earlier permissions with Ozai Corporacy from the propagating Eden Ashino, they can be sure that their food supplies would only see surpluses. Their people fat with nutrition once their vertical farms and food distribution centers are fully built and functioning within the realm. For now, the Colonel Polonsky has suggested a temporary solution to buy Ledui and Shino the time she needs to secure the food supply, the distribution of their own food rations, meals that his own Laniya soldiers enjoy quite fondly during their marches, the meal ready to eat rations. He found it quite amusing that those packets can create fire from water. This famine must end. See to it. Klovich approved. I will tell Miss Shino the good news. The colonel nodded. Then there was the internal security of the matter. There are likely clandestine holdouts still within the conquered territory under the allegiance of the old empire that needs to be put down before such a wound is allowed cancerously grow within the fringes of his grasps. Enforcing martial law and occupational checkpoints throughout all conquered territories, existing and future should establish the authority of his amelioration at the cost of relying on his patrons for their aid of whom foreign presence will inevitably cause a stir with the peasantry. There was also the fact of Princess Istris of whom he to his own shock had been successfully captured by the intrepid Strider group. No doubt the exiled Emperor would input handsomely for her rescue once the word has gotten out that she is under their captivity. For her safety, she was very quietly transferred immediately to Tyrian. Hopefully, that his sister Arya and her handmaidens could take good care of the young girl as the war progresses and also knock some sense into her delusions of Tyrian being a corrupted hellscape. I will have my troops, once they are ready of taking over the safeguarding of the realm. The prince painstakingly reminded Thomas and the colonel. Klovich calculated quietly of the negative consequences of his reliance on the sky people to be not too great. His new subjects, as hard to admit to his patrons would like to hear, a stubborn people. If he doesn't show that he can independently rule his lands without the help of the Federation, the more he can wrestle the mandate harder onto his side. Their words are valuable and equally powerful as they might. Their presence is ultimately an alien, almost radical shift of power that remnants of the old order would be hard pressed to listen, let alone submit to. His first actions would be the groundwork of establishing his new regime now that the imperial capital's administrative apparatuses and strategic advantages over his adversary. He needed to work fast and revert sense of normalcy back into the lives of the common plebeian so that he has the room to enact his reforms. Looking back at his prototype constitution, a copy of the same paper he had drafted with his earliest followers back in the Federation's home planet of Earth, the Prince establishes the organization of his new Earth style Lywood Wrath. 1. The first generation of the Senador Senate and the Sin Ritchie Owir or the House of Representatives will consist of trusted nobles and scholars from his native Tyrian and Suville, followed by influential power holders such as large farmland owners, merchants and craftsmen. Gone will be the days of hereditary politics as now all are equal of merit and ascension under the eyes of the new Zanigrad. 2. Establish new centralized governing institutions called a drana for the administrative divisions of education, defense, agricultural, finance, commerce, judiciary, and magic. Subsequently appointing of the first heads of each a drana. Some of the likely candidates for these positions however are of controversial choice on the matters in spite of their excellent aptitudes. 3. The Laniya shall undergo additional training of the Ufif's military doctrines with the funding for an expansion of their roster and equipment for his soldiers to be on par with the Federation's army. 4. 
authorization of the reconstruction and modernization of vital infrastructure, specifically roads but also the construction of several electrical power plants ranging from solar, wind and nuclear powered shall be built alongside a railway system to better connect the lifeblood between all of his fledgling nation and hasten the industrialization of the realm. Soon, very soon, he dreamt, for more scientific pursuits, Prince Clovich had authorized the chosen one. Dr. Malona to be given unlimited access to all nodes of the previous research of the College of Magi for his own studies and developments. Such a privilege only reserved for the Archmages was unprecedented, but the whispers from his scholarly tongue that slipped into his ears indicated he was on the verge of many breakthroughs on the study of the Aetherium. His team was well motivated, equipped, and funded by both him and the Federation for what next wonders they may discover next. He was ultimately motivated by both discovery and money's own sake. Selfish, but not necessarily malicious beneath his enthusiasm, especially with the fact another check of 10 billion Federation credits is being signed onto his team's budget as Thomas Sight gave his promissory notations to the scientist who nestled almost as if the laboratory became his second home back at New Albany. This new endeavor into the Federation's exploration to the arcane is dubbed Project. Spellbook, its objective the mass collection of all academic data and resources, whether human or material onto the Federation's own documentation drives for future exploitation and research. There is a sizable albeit damaged pre-existing library of arcane knowledge that a Dewey Silverdane has the familiarity of that can form the basis of this new initiative. That is also complemented by the fact that they can pull the various captured student body and faculty of the College of Magi into the good doctor's disposal. At the moment, their earlier actions had deemed them to be prisoners of war by the Afif but with incentivization to avoid further reprisals could convince several of them to join his fold and contribute to the amelioration zone ends. Bring out the word to your former collegiates Le Dewey Silverdane, the prince ordered. It was his greatest hopes, that with this shield he could establish the incoming era of the realm. The ameliorator sank down on his chair, his eyes heavy with wear. Such hard work made exhausted him greatly offering little to no quarter for such a dream required Clovich to move many mountains to see its fruition. But if there was one thing that gave him strength, as he reached down on his pocket was a memento from his younger sister Arya. A necklace of her face and the preserved image and scent of her favorite flower to reinvigorate him. Prince Clovich? Thomas Sight broke him from his stupor. Will that be all? He asked. Yes. The prince nodded. Do it. Shall we take you to the emperor's bedchambers my lord? You look drained. Sir Mag noticed Clovich's sluggish posture as he stood up from his seat. N no. He softly refused. Prepare my steed. The Arabian. I wish to return to my war tent. The palace's uncanny embrace suffocating him that he wished to not be inside this place no longer. He had little to no plans to return to Alden's former residence in the foreseeable future. Dash. Do you have them? Bobby Bianchin dropped and then smothered his roll of tobacco onto the soil as the corpo emerged from the shadows as the midnight moon or lack thereof shone its absent radiance onto a shadowy hillside off the now ruined walls of Herring Point. A truck carrying a valuable new form of cargo for the Apara Corporation is about to make contact with a business representative. The incoming vehicle was in rat supply truck commandeered by a squad of mercenaries all paid twice their rates for the undertabled assignment they have just accomplished. There were several noticeable expulsions of unnecessary machinery of the mechanized supply truck in order to make room for the precious cargo being delivered. Twenty inert pieces, the lead silverback PMC disembarked from the rat. His men behind began to unload the precious cargo, more exactly the containers consisting of twenty individual large black bags, large enough to contain a treasure chest's worth of items but discreet enough that they could avoid suspicion when smuggled out under the noses of the youth. As much as their honor is to their alliance, business is still business for a Paro corporation. With this cargo, once delivered to its intended destination will be booming. Finally, you are late. Bobby frustratingly commented. I hope you and your men did everything exactly what I ordered you to do. The corpo asked. 
It wasn't easy but my men managed. The contractor reassured him. We ran into a few delays but we scared them off by just puffing up alone. Merely common street trash. Unfortunate but not unexpected. Bobby scoffed. They can be nosy but they are hardly that much of a threat. Do you want bruise the merchandise beforehand? The mercenary gestured, returning the mood back to the marches of commerce. They walked towards the blacks' bags as the corpo representative gestured the PMCs to open several of the bags quietly. The treasure wasn't gold, smuggled blocks of unbenillium, nor magical artifacts. Nay it was much more precious than just material items. Stolen straight from the noses of those government science teams for their project, Spellbook. They had to move fast to gain their own illicit share of the spoils before the opportunity escapes their grasp. Bobby knelt down to one of the bags and placed his fingers around the merchandise's collar and lo and behold to his profit-driven delight and just as the merc says he had, he felt a pulse beneath all of that inert muscles. Don't spend it all in one place, we will be in touch when we require more. Bobby smiled as he quietly handed over a small package of credits hidden on his suit, discreetly placing the money onto the mercenary leader's hands. He then proceeded to gesture his personal men to start stacking the bags away onto the Aparo cargo trucks. Outsourced logistics for the now concluded operation, Haymaker to haul them into their holds. By the time the Federation found these missing assets unaccounted for, they would be long gone away from the planet by then never to return. As he sees the merchandise be dragged into their fate, never to return, Bobby grabbed his smartphone and called these new products send user. Dr. Sforza, your first batch is coming before the month's end. Bring that hey game on with them Frankenstein shit. The boss expects results by the year end, Bobby announced. Dash. Samantha was both well pleased of the progress the Federation and Clovich's amelioration had made in such a short period of time. Hearing everything from Eliathra and Carlia sent to Clovich's presence intrigued her greatly of the future ahead. They had taken the enemy's capital and have the leadership on the run and cut off from much of their precious supplies. However, with progression breeds new challenges for the coalition's forces. There were the multiple matters that they will have to attend to soon such as the imperial remnants who fled north, the elven intervention forces coming west to reinforce them and the matter of the relatively intact imperial colonies south of the mountains who still hold a sizable opposition of repute to Prince Clovich's claim to the imperial throne. It made her head fevered with thoughts of where she and her team will go next once they finish mopping up the last few bits and pieces in Herring Point. Can't wait to get some R and R, commands being generous letting us off back in New Albany for two days yeah? Clay smiled excitedly. What are you going to do brother? He turned to his fellow African Cain. Iris, well you know her. She and I are going to enjoy the town together. Lots of nice places opening up to go out on, don't know what to choose. Ken replied. Oh, you don't have to do all that hard work my dear. Iris sultrily waved. What of you? I guess I will just go out and buy something nice to cook up. I don't know. Something hearty. Tasty and good for you I guess. Clay answered. You can stop by at my farm if you need anything. I sell lower than most marts. Abida proposed. I am gonna be seen April on my time off. Abida proposed. That sounds great. Thanks. Clay nodded happily. How is April now if I may ask? Aliathro inquired. Still quiet. But she is back to drawing with her crayons now so she's doing well. Will you be wanting to see her too? Abida asked. Oh no. I want to have the time for myself too. Aliathro declined. You know Ailey. If you want you can go check out some of the new shops around New Albany with me. You always did say you wanted to free yourself. I can fix you up with some nice threads. Get your hair done and all. Make you real Nova. Diaz suggestively proposed. Look alive just a little longer Strider. Samantha reminded her subordinates. Just need to. 
Finish moving all of this stuff around before we can take the next Super Osprey back home. Their last assignment was the mass confiscation of academic materials from the College of Magi for Dr. Malona. Needing to sort through the mess of ransacked and defiled books for anything of value with Carlyle. Strider evaluating each content was time consuming but ultimately a low risk affair that Strider was assigned before they could leave. They have to individually brisk through each book. Scroll and letters for valuable materials specifically sigil reconstructions, somatic techniques, maps towards unbinilium deposits and schematics detailing arcane apparatuses that will be archived by the Dr. Malona's team. Unfortunately, most of the valuable items were either burnt off or whisked away by the fleeing remnants yet command wanted to make sure no stone was turned, being sure that they must have left something of value during their haste. Diaz was perhaps the least amused of doing such a job, tossing the books carelessly away much to the collegiate's chagrin. Crocker had no problem hauling most of the debris away thanks to his exosuit, but the physical toil was perhaps the most bearing to Captain Rose herself. Her muscles, likely tired from all of the fighting she had undertaken this past week had weakened her body significantly. She could feel a fever slowly heating her body into a frigid deluge of strain that it didn't take long for her laggard poise to be noticed. Samantha, I think you should stop for now. Carlyle softly approached the captain. No no. I am okay. She denied her mercy. I enjoy some of these books. It's okay. I can manage. Samantha huffed as she opened the book to speedily examine its contents. You know. Now my grandfather running around and the Inquisition being no longer much of a problem and everything should be safer for me and other vampires now. If you allow me, I could send a letter to my fellow vampires and see if they too would like to work together with you. Iris mentions. Yeah. Do that. Sam smiled softly as she turned to the book she had in hand. Blowing off the dust accumulated. The air of its degraded venerability encapsulated the captain's nose. The Vigory alphabet, still a troublesome piece for her to read through, but she does know that a certain combination of characters written atop of its cover stated that this book's subject of focus is in indeed about magics. One peculiar trait of the Vigory language is that the writing is read top down then left to right, a bit akin to the peculiarities of East Asian scripts. Opening the book, Samantha skimmed through the pages, yawning heavily in boredom as virtually all of its contents was purely text without pictures. It was a strenuous read that could easily agitate someone who spirited of temperament as the captain. She gripped her head, now throbbing with panging woe as she attempted to breathe in, but as she inhaled, her nose felt a watery and clogging sensation within her nostrils as if she had attempted to breathe underwater. Probing her nose, Samantha realized to her fright that she had drawn blood. Her knees and head began to fell faint as she leaned over to the wall for support to catch her as she collapses into its embrace. An invisible fire radiated within her muscles as her body screamed in agony and her heartbeat became thunderous. Warning, muscle fatigue and hypertension detected. Isaac alarmed her. Red flashes blinked across her UI. I dot I don't feel so well. Samantha exhaustively respired as the color on her face drained to a sickly pale. Sam Aliathro exclaimed. Rushing towards her friend she began to lay her hands on her aching muscles. All ailments have been stabilized. Recommendation. Seek medical attention immediately. Isaac states. Fuck. It stings. Samantha clamped herself. Her hand tightening itself onto the wall as the rest of Strider converged to her. The elven cleric silently went to work with her restoration magics, gliding her hands across all the injured parts of Sam's body. Over time, the restoration magics of the elf did their work. For the time being, Samantha's condition was alleviated albeit temporarily. Knowing by memory, the redhead would need to go through a long rest before she could be back to her buoyant self. Restoration magics can do so much less of a good night of sleep. Can you walk it off Captain? Crocker asked her. Yeah. I, I think. Samantha exhaled. What was that? I felt like my body was on fire and I could hardly breathe. She complained. Your body is being languished from overcast, but that's impossible. Aliath Rez eyes widened. 
You hardly casted much magics for the past two days. Why suffer its maladies now? Her leaf tip tears twitch, perplexed by this sight. Gah. Samantha gritted her teeth, as cold sweat bathed her skin. Suddenly she could feel one of her calves tearing itself in half. Instinctively, she looked onto her suit's self-diagnostic software to asses her body's situation. Damn. Not looking good. Samantha cursed as she read the status report. Muscle atrophy. Loss of. Nutrients. I. I. Her voice trembled as her body shivered, each sensation likened to nails and hammers besieging her nerves with torturous intent. Hold on Samantha. I can heal you. Aliathra pressed herself forward, her restoration magics at the ready once again. Try as she might. However. The elven cleric cried through Samantha's body only to find it in such disrepair that it was hard for her magics alone to keep up with all the damages that needed attention. Restoration magics had limits to its ability contrary to popular beliefs of its miraculous effects. It couldn't cure afflictions of the mind, birth defects, advanced terminal conditions, or at one healer's lonesome. The severely injured, most often than not. It would take the ingesting of certain healing plants, tools, and time. Fucking hell. Someone get a stretcher. We need to get the captain out of here. Crocker yelled. Dash. The stable rhythm of the heartbeat monitor soothed the air underneath the new Albany underground laboratory as Samantha was given a nutritious meal to reboot her atrophied muscles back to life. Being rushed squirrelly back to the Federation's headquarters whilst being backed by a full support team of scientists did have its perks for the young captain as she chowed down on truthfully made grilled chicken mixed in with various fibers, fruits and vegetables, or more specifically, a taco bowl. In attendance to her was Crocker, Dr. Malona and several more scientists who monitored her vitals by the captain's side and four thread attached to her left hand was hastily injected into her with reinvigorating nanofluids to combat her maladies. Above the captain, medical drones glided around her bed, their resonant ray scanners feeding the uncensored picture of her body's overall conditions back to Dr. Malona. Doctor, am I going to be okay? Samantha asked them. Well Captain Rose, based on what the medical scanners found, you had suffered through extreme fatigue caused by overexertion from your most recent physical activity. Dr. Nora, one of David's specialists in the field of human physiology went through the details as briefly as she can. You already knew that your DNA was forcefully overridden to match mage DNA so that your body can accommodate doing all of your magic powers. However, our recent blood testing shows that your body is straining itself to accommodate the radical change in the protein from your DNA mutation. This strain often occurs whenever you perform magic. She added, are you saying that whenever I do magic, I am damaging my body? Samantha questioned. In a way yes Captain Rose. Dr. Malona raised his voice, standing up from his computer monitor to approach Samantha. Whether you like it or not. You are not a natural born mage unlike everyone else you encounter. You became one rather than be born as one like all the rest. Your body is at a much higher risk of mana exhaustion and overcasting as you have to use 30% more mana than normal mages to cast spells but thankfully, that is why you have the Hecate suit with you which minimizes 45% of that risk. If it were not for Aliathra stabilizing your muscle pains before Captain Carpley and Medivac due to us, you would have been in a much worse state. Dr. Nora gave her diagnosis. So, Doc. How can you fix me? Sam asked. Don't sugarcoat it. The short-term solution is using the data I have collected of your recent performances so far. I will have to strip off the Hecate suit off of you so I can have my engineers tune up all of the arcane meridians to improve the suit's overall efficiency, but at best, the upgrade is going to only stretch you out by 10% my best estimates. The more permanent solution is to find a way to make your body adapt to all of the changes so that it doesn't kill you. Dr. Malona answered, the voice. It says you must endure it. Just. Don't listen to me when I say it comes from it okay? Noted. Samantha dismissed, 
We can replace the withered and at risk parts on Captain Rose's body with artificial lace. Have nanites weave some new bone and the muscle fibers around them so that she can improve her strength and stamina, Dr. Nora suggested. It should buy you more time until we can fully figure out how we can stop the harmful effects of DNA overriding. Do it then. Make it quick, the captain immediately agreed. She fell down on her bed as she awaited Dr. Nora to perform the transplant. Surgery shouldn't take too long with all of the good stuff here. She should be back up within the day sergeant. Dr. Malona turned to Lewis. I do want to thank you personally of getting that crystal heart thing to my laboratory. I knew it was hard for your squad but you managed to pull it off. He gave his gratitude. Don't mention it Doc. Crocker nodded. Though, where is the crystal heart anyways? He asked. In its own containment chamber inside the lab. Gives some of my colleagues the creeps though. Because it talks a lot. David commented as he switched the channel of his computer to a CCTV feed of the aforementioned containment chamber. The crystalline artifact sat inside a vacuum sealed chamber attached with dozens of monitoring gizmos where an assigned scientist is tasked to observe its every actions. Still though, with the crystal now in our possession it won't take long to figure out its secrets. Already it has been telling me some interesting new tidbits like how we can make our own versions of the resilience fear spell. But better. David enthusiastically smiled. Well I want to be there when it happens a righty then. Crocker approved. Dash. Wolf hounds howl into the night as darkness fell upon Zanagrad that evening. They have scented blood and are now on the trail in pursuit. For it is slay Aegean blood the pack seeks to sate their thirst upon. But not wolves of fur. Instead these were wolves whose bodies mask like the flesh and shade of trees. They were the 88th Wolfhound Mountain Brigade. You thief scout rangers, the premier light infantry formation of their kind. Environments likely easier are the terrain these brave men excel in turning into their own personal hunting grounds. Armed with rifles and their own tenacity for surviving the harshest wilderness. Carving ahead of the main group, a squad of these wolves pressed forward across the forest hills, scouting out the pathways and dirt roads leading northward. They had traveled far from the foot when they were redeployed from Herring Point tasked with reconnaissance and sabotage of enemy positions. It didn't take long for these wolfhounds to spot their first target. A meaty outpost that had overlooked a tall hill by the main road where the column they scout for is using. It was now time to get to work. This is Bronco 3. Going dark. One of rangers radioed. Chapter 57. Breathe easy. Cal Point stood atop of Suviel's Bay just as Samantha remembered as she journeyed her way up its dirt road. Ever since the letters she received from the late Sanjilf's caretaker, the Goblin Octu, she had been made subject to an official inquiry by her superiors. That Strider group in its collective efforts with the previous owner had, as a group, inherited a piece of land outside of Tyrian. Originally, the land of Cal Point was an important landmark in Suville decades prior with it being the site of the lighthouse that guided sailors safely onto the bay's embrace. One day, the daughter of the lighthouse keeper married a young Sanjilf who had built an inn below cliff space to entertain travelers. Unfortunately, a freak accident and the consequential death of the wife foreclosed the inn's fate into obscurity until now. Much had changed in Suviel post Corsi ad. The Federation's presence has now been well established amongst the port city's denizens. The late villain, Greski Jodent's property had been seized by the reformed bank of Suviel whilst his former villa has now been converted into a consulate to authorize the youth's presence in the region. The former Grey Order office of Suviel has been put into the direct control of the Jukil guards with any adventurers that for a time conducted bandit-style attacks on Federation troops and native collaborators ordered to surrender or face Duke the Bald Sire. There are now whispers amongst the populace of deals being spun into ink brought forth by high-paying and influential nobles of Suviel consisting of landowners are now making deals with the colonists of both private and publicized ventures, as of the rumor milling around the duchy. Many people say that thanks to Suviel's rich lands of plenty and its access to the Western Sea, the duchy will be focusing itself on the industrialization of its fertile farmlands in terms of production. 
for services being rendered, there is the facilitation of foreign trade and tourism into the duchy. Once Prince Clovich's amelioration goes into full swing, it would not be long before such modernizations reach the Dragatoy Eyes coast, perhaps even beyond it from sea to shining sea across all of Gleesia. Suviel being its springboard to what lays beyond, accompanied by Agent de Sart and a couple of construction workers, Samantha, using the time off she has to relax a moment here in Suviel whilst also taking care of some business. That business is the use of this inheritance she and her squad had obtained from old master Suviel before his tragic passing. Due to several back dealings outside of her control, however, de facto wise the property is belonging to the Federation's government, but officially. According to the books of both the Federation and Suviel's records, this plot of land is Samantha's private property. It wasn't illegal per se for the captain to still run private businesses but such unique circumstances were too hard to pass up for her superiors. Welcome. Welcome. Octa greeted the four guests. It was perhaps the most amount of people he had seen in the past few months after that stint with those Tavai smugglers when Samantha had last visited the old lonesome hearth hostel. Or under better days the smiling siren was rustic with wood furniture and cold candles to greet them, it lacked the much expected warmth and welcome reception expected from more active dens of hospitality due to years of neglect. Yet Agent the Sut wishes to change this. I know a thing or two about places like this. My husband worked as a baker in several high-class hotels. Agent Dessart gestured his hands into a panoramic focus as he observed the interior. What would you do then Gary? Sam asked. It's radical I have to confess but a lot of these furnishings must go. Too crude. Too dirty. Too dreary. Dessart answered. We should replace the windows with some glass. In fact. Have the entire walls be made of glass, I can barely see the sun. This place needs more sun. The agent stomped as he swiftly opened each individual window allowing the late morning light to fill the room. Ah, Samantha smiled, the sut was indeed correct. The depressing aesthetic of the hostel had now somewhat been alleviated. Much better. The captain smiled in the rough Quebecois accent of agent the sut's metropolitan. She turned around to a chair to rest. She was still slightly bewildered physically from her recent stint of Manu exhaustion but her refrainment has certainly helped, plus a prescription of painkillers she has to pop every day. La Dewey Rose La Dewey Rose Ox to approach trotted abjectly to Samantha. You seek to rebuild this inn into something Master Sanjilf would be proud of? He asked. Yes. I do. We will have to remove a few things before we reopen this place. I hope you don't mind right? Samantha nodded. As long as you do not disturb Sanjulf and his family's graves. Yes. But what will happen to me after? The goblin asked. Well, I guess you can be a guardian since you are just doing that all the time. Ooh. A caretaker to keep the new place clean when the time comes. The Sut suggested. That is wonderful news. But the will. Octa meekly fronted. Spare me more of this legal bullshit, what more? The intelligence agent gasped, half of his words in French. Old Master Sanjilf had also requested that you also inherit this. The goblin passed along a book written in the native script. It had a picture of a bowl, spoon, and fork at its head. A cookbook? Dasat twitched his brow. Sanjilf was a cook Gary. A really good one. You want us to keep this book too? Sam explained. Not only, but the old master wishes you cook these recipes to be able to bring warm joy to the future guests who come to this place. Here, I prepared one of his favorites, braised sea crutters in sweet chalumbi stew with sea root. I know many of his recipes. He bowed. On an earthenware pot, the goblin served onto two small wooden bowls the samples of the natives stew to them. Sam refrained her initiative to taste, allowing the intelligence agent to have the first bite after slowly scenting its aroma with his scrutinizing nose. Using a wooden spoon, he claims a mouthful of the crimson dish as his tongue embraced its flavor. Wow, incredible, some good fucking food for once. The Sut smiled, a smile that wasn't his petrifying grin of cruelty that tainted him on his line of work. 
It was a rare bona fide moment of felicity just as the progenitor of the recipe had wanted. Okta yipped happily on the man's smile as he finished his small bowl. Seconds please. Bigger bowl. He demanded, that of which immediately executed by a now enthusiastic Octu. Let's to the gist of it Gary. Sam reminded to Sardit. You want to make a brand new hotel right here yeah? Have some. Resort. Not hotel. Hotel implies people just want to sleep and go. Not stay. The Sats are fused. The reason why this place failed is because it is just too far away from all of the action for the natives to go to. But. The opposite is true. He waved. Opposite. Samantha furrowed. I own people. Travelers of all sorts would want somewhere away from the bustle of Glee easier. Somewhere remote yet close to all of the action. This place more than ideal. Kick your feet off and have a few bites before you retire for the night. The agent suggested. I am not discounting that in the future. Some of the Glee would like to travel here for their own business or for the pleasures this place can offer. I even got a few ideas about that too. But the priority is aiming for our own people, specifically, those on business and for pleasure. Ah. So switch the target demographic? Is that what they call it? I get it I get it. But. One more question. But what are you really going to do with this place? Samantha asked him. She knows these government wigs don't just open vacationing resorts. It would be the likes of which that would outrage any hard-paying taxpayer from off the Federation's coffers. Sweet summer's child. The resort is only a mask. Unsight and well poor-legged. To look at your guests of all curiosities they sweeten beneath all of the honey this upcoming paradise shall loosen. De Sutt explained. Discreetly blanketed his intentions. He didn't want to have the two contracted construction workers nor up to, to know of the true purposes of this site. I learned that from my husband by the way. It sounded way sexier when that VA said it. He stuck his tongue out. Samantha sighed, she knew it. Her new property is going to be another government black site behind all the intrigue and luxuries this establishment provides. She rather would keep herself clean on such deep state machinations if she could help it. But there was no way for her to stop it. She would just have to give the facade of cleanliness beneath all of the intrigues about her now eminent status both as the native's chosen heroine and as a star ascendant apparatus of the party's propaganda. Listening only. I don't want to see any blood or whatever crazy stuff you normally like to do. Save that fetishistic freak show you always like to show anywhere else but here. Samantha said her terms. Not even thinking about it. De Sud leaned back, playfully belching in satisfaction over his meal. Dash. Louis Crocker gentle stroked his left knuckles as he sat by the barkeep looking onto the side mirror provided in the chintzy in the El Sigro Borracho pub. This watering hole shies off the city centre that not many well-to-do folks or of the contemporary tastes would dare venture to. Such an establishment attracting the more common pursed of folks such as blue-collared workers or those who seek an alternative, if not antithetical experience to the more well-to-do counterparts. The atmosphere was strictly masculine of federation origin in all aesthetic, urbanized artwork of scrap postings and a bit of playful if not seemingly random graffiti stuck with advertisement stickers gave the pub a seedy street visual. Even the furnishings were decorated or more of just plastered with such gildings. Electro Latino music at a respectable volume housed the patrons with familiar tunes and rhymes from their old homelands. The scent of alcohol and nicotine permeated the noses of Sigro Boracho as weekend-enjoying workers indulged themselves to their hearts content with blunts and shots of vices. The patrons don't seem to mind such a gang-banging atmosphere, in fact it was one such reason why they regularized this establishment in the first place. The bar boasts the strongest mix of the everyday opiates of dulling spirits that relaxes one's stress aches to those drinks used for the most celebratory of occasions. A little anesthesia. The bartender smiled as he passed on to Crocker's molded bar mat a miniature glass of the strongest drink inside the house, around a rum of half of its liquid being of alcoholic content. 
The sergeant immediately downed the first round of the rum onto his gullet, its intoxicating liquids dulling his senses as he readies himself. Placing his hand onto his nose, the burly second in command forcibly fixed his nose. Motherfucker. Crocker cursed as he banged the table with his left hand, nearly toppling several loose articles near him. His teeth gnashed as he gestured the bartender another round of the same strong rum to his side. At least you won that fight. Sadge. Otherwise, that nose would have hurt way worse. The bartender smiled. Yeah, I guess. Crocker nodded. Earlier that day, Lewis went to a gym and entered himself into a cross-service bout between the youth Navy sailors and the Army colonial militia with him being the representative of the latter. A cash prize was given to whoever managed to beat the other man by any means via eight rounds of 120 seconds each. For Crocker's fight. He had to endure the full brunt of the brawl as his equally built opponent stalled for a decision. The fight was a display of camaraderie and friendly competition between the two branches but it also displayed to those natives who so happens to witness the bout the peak physical fitness of the other world soldiers. To his surprise, rather than being intimidated by such a sight, many of those folks admittedly were mesmerized by the bare-chested warriors who fought each other for their entertainment. Not surprisingly, Blood sports are considered the highest class of entertainment in the Slaygian Empire by his experience. So, what's been troubling you? The empathetic bartender lay his attentive ear on the sergeant. Nothing too crazy. Just it gets slowly at work. Most of me time I only talk with my squads C. O and spit orders down. Crocker sighed. I feel like. L. Like. Nobody really appreciates me being there i don't know or maybe i should start planning on retiring from the service soon not much juice left on disole machine he sulked nobody sure about that the bartender gestured behind him playfully turning around crocker spotted to his surprise a flock of newcomers into the el sigro borracho they're dressed in flowers leather corsets twined in strings and skirts that flow like water down to their silken ankles. All articles of feminine clothing contrasting to the otherwise bold robust the El Sigro presents itself as. They were natives from Tyrian, a pack of vixens, maidens, and young lasses all of the opposite gender to be precise. Likely of those who managed to pass through the checkpoints and be permitted entry to walk, browse and interact amongst the colonials within New Albany. Hey Chica. If water was a beauty, you would be the whole ocean. One patron whistled to one Tyranny girl who had decided to dress in blue today. Several more of the men expressed their machismo over this parade of nymphs to make their presence with their collected muley pretty. Exchanging a mix of lewd, gallant, and flirty remarks upon them but they seemed uninterested in the bar's regulars. By the contemplative gazes of their eyes, it seems they were searching for something specific. There he is. One of them called out, her hands piercing through the bar all the way to Crocker himself. The parade of nymphs marched across the El Sigro as they made their way to the bar top. You are the ogre breaker, aren't you? One village girl inquired. Yeah. Is with something no matter? Crocker awkwardly kept his cool, drinking another round of rum to maintain his composure. A great crime has happened. One woman fell into his arms dramatically. Her face blushed with desire. This fine young maiden, daughter of the horse breeder needs fine stallion to raise her young she implored him. Crocker was more than alarmed, confused, flattered, and embarrassed by the implications given the context. He will tire greatly from all of that work Lorne. The ogre breaker needs a hand in soothing all of those muscles of his. Another maiden caressed methodically the sergeant's muscles that popped out of his sleeveless top almost seeming to get lost in the post-fighting musk that Lewis secreted. Such excretions seemed to excite these spirited ladies to higher states of arousal. He could recognize by her uniform that she was one of the bathhouse girls from Tyrian during one of Strider Group's patrols. Look ladies, I am not in the mood right now for any of you right now. Crocker attempted to defuse the situation tactfully. Sure you do, you just need to get more comfortable. Tilda the bathhouse maid pressed her breasts into Crocker's biceps, 
I rather rot than let you have him all to yourself Madleska shoved another woman the masseurs away. Some of the El Sigro's patrons began to brace, if not amusingly for a possible catfight between these women, some excitedly grabbing their phones at the ready to record such a bawdy occasion. Women, women, halt your advances on the ogre breaker, yelled forth another voice. Loud stomps dragged all of the attention away from all of the patrons inside the bar. To Crocker's bedazzlement, he recognizes that voice. A woman, one whose stature easily towers above her peers, of whose hair flowed freely like the wind in intricate tribal tattoos adorned her body as she made her way towards the sergeant. Her body at top was of a human, but her lower half is of a horse. It was Kimura, the Oshantiniadi or centaur war maiden he had rescued back in New Orgonia. There is no point of fighting. Do you harlots think the mighty ogre breaker would desire to pass companionship amongst a group of harpies like you? Shame on you, Kimra chastised. Many of the women soon realized that the Dawson female was right as they turned to Crocker whose blushing face and trembling body over the sight of these women fighting over him. This, in each and courting rituals, would be an embarrassment regardless of gender. The fight was diffused before it could truly start. Thanks. Glimmerer. Crocker sighed in relief. For a second he thought there's going to be a fight in his favorite diving spot. Not yet Ogre Breaker. Kimra shook her head. Women of Tyrian, I have a proposal to share among you. With a blush, the centaur war maiden stripped away from her shirt, which in hindsight didn't cover much of her torso physiologically speaking, merely covering her breasts and a bit of her midriff. She exposed her nubile centaur body amongst the patrons much to everyone's shock, both positive and negative. Some were mesmerized by the war maidens' runic tattoos that are said to summon the bestial aspects of their respective ancestries. Others were astounded by her supple feminine form that either caught several courtly remarks by the green-minded of male patrons and some form of intimidation for the Tyriani women. Kimra blushed as she stepped forward. It is by many cycles immemorial from the northern tribes, the strongest of men are permitted to have many wives. Yet only the strongest turns the privilege to bear his child, the centaur proposed. Such a prize deserves to be bestowed by the strongest female who will bear the strongest of children and that is I. Lewis Hart skipped several beats. He really has no time nor the energy to entertain such a sore didact right now. You? God's damn you beast woman. The handsome champion is mine. Lorne, being the daughter of the horse caretaker of the Terriani cavalry unsheathed her riding whip and began to strike onto the centaur war maiden. Not wanting to be deterred for her prize, Quimera launched a wild punch onto Lorne sending the woman stumbling towards the bar's tables. Such a violent act aroused the other females into a stupor filled as they turned on themselves. A fight for feminine domination erupted in the El Sigro Borracho as women tussled amongst and against each other of whose maidenhood shall be claimed by the gallant Louis Ogre Breaker Crockers. Bollocks. Gimme out to ear bartender. Crocker leapt over the bar's countertop as the bartender opened the back door to allow the sergeant to escape. He bears no interest in being the breeding stud of an entire harem of women anytime soon. He was a professional. That and God knows what abominable sexually transmitted diseases the more ravishing folks of Gleasons could possess. He is getting away. One of the fighting maidens noticed Crocker's escape. You are high. His young are mine, Kimura charged screaming nakedly in pursuit. Dash. Leah would have liked to be here atop of this hill over a lonesome pathway that climbed over at top of their property in New Albany. But alas, this is not of happier of times. If no such times could ever be possible as nothing shall be the same anymore for the Root family. Leah was, upon personal request by the bereaved to be dire was buried behind the Root family farmstead under a loving yet lonely hill that overlooked the entire property, a landmark he called the Lonesome Hill. Abedai wished to spend these two days off with his daughter of whom he picked up from her kindergarten teacher who acted as a surrogate parent whilst he was off on his military service. The wind breezed gently amongst the trees and several native flowers decorated, if not almost breathing Obedia's late love in its earth and embrace with its beatific comfort. It was a somber affair for him and April, wanting to visit his wife once again before he gets redeployed. Their child was still too young, 
or perhaps Abed was still not too sure how to phrase his sentences to explain to April of her mother's passing. Such a grievous wound to never be able to again come to Leah's enveloping embrace, to never hear her voice lulling them to sleep to never be able to scent her lilac perfume as she blessed each chamber with her presence and to never see her warm smile grace their hearts. If a bee dyer was truly alone, he would have kicked the dirt, scream, blame himself perhaps even topple the gravestone in his grief or unthinkably turn his own pistol against himself for he could not bear such burden, not like this anymore. Yet he knew Leah would never want him to despair, not for his own sake, but for April's own being. A bee dire turned to April who was cherishing me picking the wildflowers that littered that lonesome hill. Daddy, April smiled, still innocent as to why her father had insisted to come with him to this hill. Today, the little girl gave him one of the wildflowers and placed him onto his ears, like a wreath adorning his aged brow. Seeing April's smile, it reminded him. He didn't know if it was his own grief twisting his mind, the ghostly whispers of his late wife from beyond the grave, or a mix of all of his life formulating into this one moment. A reason to keep moving forward. April's smile, dash. It was a relief, for Prince Klovich to say the least as he flew back to Tyrian that afternoon. Although Herring Point had its symbolic merits, the city was still too dangerous reeling from the recently conquered peoples, for him to fully move his court. He had entrusted Sir Meg and Colonel Polonsky to pacify the region in his absence until everything has settled down. For now, his old castle back home is the de facto seat of power of the amelioration and he couldn't have it any other way for himself. It was great to breathe in the forest mountain air from the now calm rooks to see familiar sights but most of all to see his beloved sister Arya once more. She had many stories, both joyous and melancholic. Joyous she was when she managed to walk several feet off of her supports with her newfound strength much to his and her maid attendee's delight. She couldn't frolic freely upon the hilly plains just yet but it was better than being bedridden atop of the citadel's towers. Compared to her informal duties as the new lady in waiting for the captive princess Istris Lae Ejak who was transferred not long ago to the citadel to be kept as he quotes hostage in our guest room. According to Arya and her own maid's stories, Princess Istris would sit quietly in her room, avoiding any modicum of interaction between herself and those in charge of her well-being. This has gotten to the point that Arya would most often or not refuse to eat whatever assortments of nourishment that was sent to her side, claiming they were poisonous or were enchanted. When she eventually be forced to eat, she would only input the bare minimum needed for continued survival. Such Spartan-like sustainability was on par with how Astris was also observed praying incessantly when doing nothing else. From what whispers the maids could decipher, she was praying for her father, the gods, or a knight in shining armor of sorts to come and rescue her with the naivete of those fantastic ballads and stories bards and minstrels. Still, it did not deter Arya from trying to breach underneath all of the walls of unease towards Istris. Klovich could only pray that a ray of his sister's words could pierce through the imperial daughter's heart of this lamentable misalignment. For now, he still wishes whilst his sister gentle attempts to Istris, for himself to enjoy the fleeting comforts of his ancestral home for the next few days. But alas not even at his own home that he is immune to the besetting of his duties. Today's business was hosting a commerce forum with the Federation, a convention of the local powers intermingling with the alien traders from the heavens, peddling their eldritch oddities. Such decadent gatherings of materialism, underneath the honeyed words were intrusive if not exhortative in terms of the exorbitant prices demanded in exchange, yet it was a necessary evil for the fledgling emperor of the amelioration, he needed to court for more power and curry favor amongst the other worlders if his movement and glee easier as a whole are to survive. Amusingly, Klovich is entertaining his cousin Duke Thibault and his Suvelli courtiers who came in person to seal the first economic treaties with the Federation and their mega-corporation trade partners. There was even a demonstration to happen with said products that being imported into Gleesia from Ozai, Maximov, Hanjin Shibuzawa, and of course a Pyro Corporation. I do say, this iced cream does do great with the local berries. 
Duke the Bald giggled as he enjoyed the end product that is vanilla ice cream adorned with the native crisp mellow berries which complemented the mellow sweetness of the white cream with a tart taste of the berries. Souville has along with their rich tradition of winemaking also has complements of cheese and smokehouses too, a pre-existing industry that one such corporation wished to tap into. Pre I mean, Emperor Clovich. One such other world avide for his attention. From memory, Governor White calls themselves represent tart tips which was a bit odd since they don't look like they are of a maritime background such as sailors and other seafaring journeymen. May I interest you in a fine new steed? He said. A steed? You mean what you call a car or motorcycle? Clovich responded. The former is what I sell. The other world are explained. He carried along with his hands a strange set of goggles, something similar of shape to that of the Federation's own soldiers with a wide encompassing visor with straps to wrap around one's head. Clovich recognized the device as a virtual reality headset a sort of helmet that allows the user to see illusory objects. A strange curiosity is culturally. Mostly Eason's would pay money to not see illusions rather than be fooled by them. Well, show me this fine steed of yours, the prince demanded. I am afraid I can only show you, for my own merchandise's safety and company policy that I show you this virtual reality headset to show you what great wonders you can bestow upon yourself when you select Bosch Galilei Motorcars that caters to only cater the best of our clientele. He snapped his fingers enthusiastically. What clients buy such steeds that the traders cannot dare show to the ones who seeks its purchase? Clovich questioned. Kings, statesmen, celebrities, important people who only demand the best. Like you, the Bosch Galilei representative answered. Just put these goggles on. It will answer most of your questions. The rep smiled as he fastened the VR headset atop of the prince's head. The prince's eyes were immediately transported from the bustling debates of the Commerce Forum to the ivory interior of what he can only describe as a carriage. He could see, if not almost touch there. The prince's eyes were immediately transported from the bustling Commerce Forum he hosted to the ivory interior of a carriage. Leather seats and mahogany furnishings around him. But the physical intervention of Mr. Byongchin made sure he doesn't get too mesmerized by the theatric image that danced in his head. Bosch Galilei Motorcars would like to introduce to you the custom conversion, the Valdivia Traveler 2210 Sultan Edition. The representative casted Sultan, like from the suzerainities? Clovich asked. Worthy of a Sultan, I firmly say. The representative Gascon aided. This steed that combines to the power of your mounted war horses and the luxuries of a carriage. The traveler sports a stylishly luxurious cabin that welcomes up to two passengers with amenities typically reserved for first class. The representative was then interrupted again by Mr. Byongchin, his usual sales pitch not compatible with this potential client. I mean, amenities reserved for a full service of your own palace. Me, Lord. The rep choked. Fascinating. Clovich smiled. He could begin to understand why such a steed requires that he only glimpses his illusory image first before purchase. Many of rogues would have likely killed, sabotaged and ransacked to steal away such a fine subject, from the horizontal walnut and gold trimmed tables to the diamond stitched reclinable chairs of European leather to allow the passenger the utmost comforts for entertainment. The passengers can enjoy a 10,000 pixel 48 inch satellite flat screen television which can be used as a video conference with state of the art audio equipment for the most cohesive communication possible for all your business and personal conversations. Lastly, the advanced temperature control that can adapt to any environment allows the passengers great comforts like never before. The carriage seemed to burst to life whenever the representative spoke. The chairs moved to adjust whatever position desired. The television, a curiosity from his trip to Japan animated to full effect, and the gilded finish whetted his ego. The traveler was firmly worthy of a sultan as the corpo explained. It does feel quite gloomy. The windows are quite dark. He had to complain once, such perfection was still beyond such mortal reaches. Oh, the windows? If you are the type to enjoy the view from outside. The traveler's windows can adjust the black tint to allow you an unmitigated view. The virtual reality adjusted itself, 
brightening the windows for see a crystal clear view of the outside world. A march of fields that pass too long an old asphalt road. And if that is not enough for you, if you look on top, the traveler also includes a 50-inch panoramic sunroof that allows you to enjoy the shine of your local star without worrying of something insane falling atop of your beautiful new steed. The rep bowed. Malenry's imaginative gaze fell upon Clovich in the virtual world as he turned his head skyward to see her nude body blessing his eyes in its illuminated glory. If traveling was as exhilarating as this, he would have wished he was born a caravanserai than a vassal prince. There was no debate now. He has made a decision. I wish to obtain such a vessel for my personal haulage, the prince announced. Cousin of mine, Duke Thibault waded through the crowd. Have you thought of getting your own imperial flagship now from the sales people? Flagship? Boat? Oh, sales. And sales. Ha! Huh? Mr. Biongchin chuckled. The few Gliesans who can understand English, those of noble powers and of scholarly intent still retain an alienation to the more refined nuances of the English language such as the case of the homonym sales and sales. Boats? Are you mean yachts? We also have a subsidiary company that handles to such maritime needs my lord, the representative said. Yep, looks like to me you guys do want to buy some of the final things in life. Don't you worry, I will help you make sure you get everything you want for the right price once you know what you're getting? Bobby winked. Oh, praiseth be, tell me more, the bald cheered like a child in a confectionery shop. Dash. Elvnama was the pinnacle of aesthetic and function, made from the finest materials from Alphanora was designed with the inscribed shape of leaves to a visually ornate examination upon their wearers. Functionally, the armor promotes a harmonious equilibrium between maneuverability and the protection of the user thanks to the unique properties the elves have at their disposal when they forge these beautiful attires for war. One such variety is the metal-plated armor of the illustrious Dianithor or Star Metal. It was a versatile alloy, able to be effortlessly enchanted over and over again for a variety of applications such as the aforementioned armor and for weaponry. However, it's most often used to forge the latter rather than the former from a logistical standpoint. The lighter version however was a much more potent substitute, Quesess Chia otherwise known as Elvenwood. Harvested from carefully protected plantations across the Elven continent, this light and yet flexible bark is similar to the versatility of the star metal which can be fashioned into a leather-like cloth that can protect the user without sacrificing their body's ability to move around or be made into indelible weapons such as spear shafts and bows, although not as great in hardiness to star metal. The bark is much easier to come by for the average elven soldier most especially the famous Ethylan forest rangers. Yet alas, even beneath all of the elven's many blessings, like the crudest of inventions, star metal and quesestia cannot stop themselves from the bindings of entropy. What is created by material hands from the flesh of Nenith, as Aliathraletha remembers from her teachings, must it also return? The elven cleric, former daughter of the Lithaline now sees her Quesestia rain drama decay in front of her in spite of all of her attempts to mend its gradual corrosion. The hard campaigning and trials beforehand had accelerated the lifespan of her worn-out bodice to its very limit with stitching, cobbles and a bit of slowly waning magic preventing a critical wardrobe malfunction. Not that the former princess of fighting naked however she quite embarrassingly thought but she still has dignity beneath for her own self beneath all of the persecution that had besieged her up until now, cast out from both nation, church, and family. All that she has left was her own self and her friends, the only people who cared for her despite all of her disrepair, stride a group to thank for saving her from the slough of despondency that her former compatriots threw her out to. She does on occasion wear the Federation's Kevlar and spare military wear donated by some but they focused more on function at the cost of substance as she critiques about it and she couldn't rely on their generosity forever. She has to eventually get some new clothes. Ring. The door rang on her home. Ali my dear, 
Be so kind to and get that for me. Iris, her vampiric housemate requested from her. Today she was getting herself beautified with a selection of her glamours called makeups by the other worlders for a jig where she will host Kane. Clay and her own grandfather Martin over this evening. She was allowed to stay and enjoy their company but alas, it wasn't her idea of fun, she wished, nay, needed a gimmick brought forth under her own terms. Leaping out of her workbench, abandoning her old rain drama to its disrepair, the elf skipped across the house and opened the door. Hey Ailey, I just here to deliver some stuff for Iris. Diaz greeted her carrying with him a box that Iris waited for her jig with her nightman. How are you doing? The elf's heart skipped a beat upon his charming entrance. The fast-flying corpo was quite an adventurous person beneath all of his bravado and scented guise. I am faring. Rather. You. Bored as of late Sir Diaz. Aliathra confessed. What's the long face? I hate it when you are sad you know that. That frown doesn't belong there and it's unhealthy for the soul. Diaz playfully referred, my old armor. It is breaking down and I can't just walk around on our next expeditions with only what the Federation is willing to give me. Aliathra confessed. Yeah, I noticed that on your leather armor. I knew it was gonna get fucked. Just not that fast. Diaz nods. You know what? I do know that a store just opened back at New Albany that can get you some nice threads. If you want, I can tell to you princess right about now. I don't get much to do any more other than this quick favor from Kane. The shit he got planned today isn't my shit and I doubt you would want to be here when they have their idea of fun. Vincent cringed. You have been nothing but being kind to me Sir Diaz. I shall go with you. Aliathra shyly nods. Under one condition. Diaz requested. What must I do now? Aliathra rolled her eyes. She was rather annoyed by the corpus entangling use of language. Diaz grasped his hand by her chin and raised her sullen face towards him until her ocean blues met with his earth and calls. Smile and keep on smiling and I will take you to places you never dream of, he revealed. The elf's heart, even if it was only made by mortal hands still resonates with her soul. Fluttering excitedly, like the fair maidens of her youth as she and her sister heard, read and even acted out those daring tales of the roguish bard Bandal Thunderhand. In a way, Diaz was like him in several ways, quick-witted, dexterous, and sharp of tongue. Unlike Bandal, Vinny was more materialistic than motivated by romanticized if not overly exaggerated views of chivalry that the bard represented. Although eventually when one grows up his ideals would be considered naive during her and Ithiel's youth. It was magical in its own special kind of way that not even the ether in all of the mysteries could replicate from the sublime anonymous author. Aliathra smiled, ready to have this chanced prince that against all odds had charmed her to whisk her away from her chambers. Diaz wasted no time taking Aliathra into his Mustang after a quick farewell to Aris who is now left alone to finish her preparations for her gathering with Cairn as they sped through the now asphalt streets of New Albany. Development had accelerated to accommodate the reinforcements from the Federation for the aforementioned campaign such as the hollowed foundations meant for the expansion of the urbanized sphere of the colony. Neon signs, concrete pathways, and bricked architectures were erected on the fertile Gleesian earth, from what was once an untenanted moorland became a sprawling urban forest. A tantalizing prismatic blur from New Albany's neon lights arced around the elf size, a grand adventure that broiled a hidden sense Aliathro had first rejected, a sense of abandon, away from the confines of her conservative upbringing as the Mustang stopped by a particular apartment. Again, its rainbow-colored palette besieged all of her impressionable young soul as Diaz excitedly pulled the elf deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole of this Benozic standard. Welcome to the Pop Kuturkas. Oh it's you again Diaz. Here to browse the latest pre-eam threads, the flamboyant shopkeeper happily greeted them dressed in equally. Aratilda. Who is this fine specimen you brought here? She ogled her surveilling sight onto the elf. By the way, the shopkeeper smiled was analytical that pierced through the seams of her prosaic attire in comparison to Aliathra's fey physique. I am Aliathra. She introduced herself to her. A friend. Give her the whole show. Diaz nodded. 
he firmly forwarded his smartphone onto the counter. On cue, the shopkeeper leapt to life from her seat. Welcome to the Pop Couture, the finest slickest street where in over three star systems, she circled around the counter to closely examine Aliathra. Before we begin, first off, get rid of that ugly militarist trash right now. I refuse to have them taint this temple. I expected more from elves. The shopkeeper growled daggers straight on Aliathra's handed down shirt of uninspiring grass. I only wear these because my old clothes have now seen too much of use. Aliathra stepped back, shyly composing herself. Well, that is why Pop Couture is here. We have the finest kitsch threads popular amongst such youths from Earth, Mars, and Kesselheim. Follow me. She guided the elf further into the store. The store was divided into the women's and men's sections. Clothes upon clothes neatly stacked and divided by occasion, cut, and sizes. Displays of human men and women models decorated the halls in a confident demonstration of the store's wide selection of products. The shopkeeper who guided her, a sommelier of the like on this field of consumable goods by how she analyzes and cited the client before her of what clothes best illuminated Aliathra. What is your style elf? Let me get to know you. Don't worry, there's no right or wrong answer. The shopkeeper pressed her. Well, Aliathra blushed. Despite the shopkeeper's eccentricities, she was quite progressive onto allowing her a choice. Taking a deep breath, Aliathra confesses I am not so sure. I have never had the choice for my own clothes before. My mother. My father. Other people always choose for me. Even when they are not around. I choose what they would have chosen for me. Ah. You wish to be free? Independent from them are you not? The shopkeeper asked. Yes. I want something that shows people I am not some princess who spent all her life locked up in her tower. I have grown up. I can make my own choices. I want to be with people I want to be with. Do what I want to do. Feel what I want to feel. To feel? You want to watch. You want to taste. And judging by your orgs, W what happened to you? You need to be one tough bitch to be able to wield such cyberware. You must be really good friends with pain. The shopkeeper's eyes widened pointed to Aliathra's augmentations. Such combat cyberware, especially the high graded ones sold on the market requires a proportional amount of constitution to wear them especially during the early days of installation, as the risk of bodily rejection is prominent around the first month of use. Aliathra did experience several occasions of her body attempting to reject her newfound augmentations but she managed to will herself through for her elven body to accept them. In order, electrocuted, blinded, lavered and having a tree drop on top of her. Diaz summarized, My sweetie, I am so sorry. The shopkeeper bowed. It is fine. I am no stranger when it comes to being put to the test. Aliathra relayed. You could say I am a friend of pain. That's why I like her. Diaz beamed. I see. Let me look at your face one bit right now. The shopkeeper curled her finger to examine the elf. My color me with envy. But if there is one thing you elf have met of my expectations, is that you are so beautiful you do not need much makeup. Golden ratio. Platinum. Diamond. You can just waltz anywhere and already you would be the center of attention. If you are not wearing any of that militarist trash again. Get it off. Get it off. She exclaimed, ushering her to the store's changing stalls. The shopkeeper harked her that until she gets rid of her youthief military where she would refuse further catering to her needs. Complying, Aliathra stripped them off. The monotone threads hanging over the curtain of which the shopkeeper promptly disposed of them. As I said, this belongs in the trash, she reprimanded as she tossed them into a black plastics bag never to be seen again. What color do you like you cute thing? She asked. I do like green, I do not lie. Aliathra answered, we have much more shades of green, I know of one you would like. Wait here. The shopkeeper leapt to her feet as she dived back into the store and began to scour her inventory. Diaz smirked as he kicked back his feet to his smartphone as he awaits what exemplary threads he will see off of Aliathra. Before long, the shopkeeper hurried back to the changing room and passed along to Aliathra over her stall several clothes. I am ready, she announced after a few moments fitting the clothes onto her body. 
The shopkeeper's well-trained eye can easily tell what the size of her proportions is for her. Aliathra came out wearing a lime-colored light-reactive laminated bomber jacket. Paired with its brilliance is an equally olive-tinted belly shirt that exposes a playful tease of her midriff that beams a racy, if not scandalous amount of her body, especially the skin-tight moist lick tracer pants. Her porcelain face flushed red as she presented herself to the two, shyly covering some of the more exposed parts of her body, not used to this much of skin being freed from the confines of the cloth. The jacket is versatile for style and combat complete with pockets in beneath so you can always have anything in handy, a wallet, your phone, even a trusty dusty pistol too. In addition, Pop Couture's jackets have a subtle little sleeve in between if you need to sneak in something protective for yourself like armor, anti-chemicals, electronic shieldings, whatever you can fit inside it, the shopkeeper promoted, not bad. Excellent. Diaz smiled, come on elf, you are in my temple of fashion, not a slave auction, the shopkeeper yelled, be bold. Pop Couture is bold, let it go, the fashion where sommelier articulated her body, twisting her torso and arms behind her head as she accentuated her chest. Such pose, provocative yet equally pressing for such equally provocative fashion. The elf shadowed the shopkeeper copying her poses to her and Diaz's delight. More, more. I have never seen such a muse since the late Kate Pillis graced her body onto the world. The shopkeeper squealed. Such a claim. Genuine acclaim from the likes of her and Diaz melted down what vestiges of the orthodoxy of her previous subjugated life she had left. Even back on her unheralded journey into Kesselheim where her story began, she stole clothes to what she had believed to be up to her mother's tastes being of discreet subtlety. But now, today she shall fly. A door of new possibilities opened before her, and she above all things will dive headfirst into its crevasse. Do. Do you have more? Aliathra asked, for today, she will take flight her new freedom. The freedom of choice. Especially of a different color? Of course. Everyone is beautiful when they can choose how to be beautiful. You deserve the stars, the rainbow, every color known to the naked eye. The shopkeeper concurred, as we say in pop couture, we are not to be sheep. We are made the rule. The elf became like a doll. Yet in contrast before by her old ways as a doll to be used as a political pawn, the doll has become a canvas for Aliathra Ether to paint herself onto its visage for all of the worlds to see. She indulged in a menagerie of different cloths, color combinations and a yoga session's worth of liberating articulation of her once shy body. Confidence sprouted onto the elf just as the bill, much to Dias's own chagrin. But he didn't mind as he could easily make the money back after a few gigs with a Paro Corp, elevated. She could barely count the number of jackets, tops, and bottoms she carried with her as Diaz sped through around New Albany. Their next stop, the local salon and barber to have both of their hair done. Diaz had his usual short cut with a shave while Staliathra was given the royal treatment. No pun intended. Her waving long hair was dressed by having her braids relocated to her right side as she hanged her hair loose onto the left giving her a feminine yet roguish crown. After their sessions were finished, the malinary star above Gleesia began to slowly set upon them. It was a singular breath of the natural world that the urbanized forests of the civilized lands could not replicate as much as they tried to. You know for a sharp young girl like you are now. How about you get yourself a sharp new iron too? I mean, it's good and all you can shoot a bow and magic but it doesn't hurt to get another backup. I know nice Toledo 5012 that should be the perfect fit for ya. Diaz smiled as he observed the overhauled visuals of Aliathra. Wanna get some takeout or something before I take you back home? He proposed. Vincent. Can you take us to the quietest point you can find? I wish to see the sunset. Aliathra asked. Why so? He asked. No other reason. I wish to see the sunset. The elf explained. Well, I do know of a spot near some construction projects that gives us a view. Most of the workers should be off by now. Diaz smiled. They boarded the Mustang as it cruised away to the city limits where the expansions were being commenced. Out of dirt. 
steel, and wood, the mechanical horse glided past them as it reached a construction clearing that Diaz, being an Apara Corporation employee can access at any time as he wishes. The site was perfect in all senses of purpose, a clear if a slight contrasting view of the setting sun against the backdrop of the slowly growing New Albany skyline. Additionally, there are no forms nor signs of any unexpected onlookers of any sort to disturb them. They truly had this field for themselves for the evening. Malinaries is leaving to slumber now. The elf muttered, exiting the car. She walked forward a few meters and began to kneel down in prayer. Diaz meanwhile standing behind her quietly out of respect. More prayers to her again? Neneth? Diaz asked. I may be an apostate but I still serve the goddess. I. I want to thank you. Aliathra stood up. Even in spite of her trials, Aliathra still believes her goddess merciful grace despite her deviations. All she asks is prayers for forgiveness, not just for herself but for those of her own people too. For the new clothes, don't mention it. Diaz smiled. No. It is not that. Aliathra disagreed. I want to thank you for helping me. Understand myself more. It is not just the clothes the car, but your fellowship, with you, Samantha, and the rest of Strider. I fear I may not be as fortunate without you. The elf explained. Oh, I see. Diaz nodded softly. May I ask Sir Diaz? Aliathra pressed closer to him. Why did you save me, the heart I have? You could have easily let me die. You got balls, Vinny answered. Too many people I know back in Kesselheim boats they are hot shit that they're the best on whatever but when their number calls, they fold like a bitch, not many people in Kesselheim to be honest are like that, they say they are this but aren't, believe me, I mean my whole job requires I have balls by reputation and the values you set forth on, without values, principles, you are just a zombie, you Ali, you practice what you preach even if it's gonna hurt, I like it on people, are you saying you are? Attracted to me? Aliathra asked. Who wouldn't be? Or maybe some poor slum boy from Kesselheim is attracted to tombs like you? Diaz answered back. Are you also attracted to me? Diaz asked. I admire those males with strength and wits. Your tongue, your sword, your style? It reminds me of the bard Bandle Thunderhand. I feel like I am the enchanting young maiden he has ensnared with his charms, the journeys, the attention and all of what he does. Oh, I can only dream to rest on his arms. Aliathra blushed, leaning over by the side of the Mustang's hood. Her body language as she talked, chafed along with her new clothes, her eyes dilating towards Vincent. So, Diaz sighed. What does Bandle and the lass do next? He smiled. What they do next? The elf stepped closer, their bodies merely an inch apart. Both of their hearts fluttering within the folly of this amorous moment. This Aliathra took Diaz's hand onto her breast and it slides down her jacket, yielding the status of the princess of Eth Island to the otherworlder who had freed her. Dash. This is absurd. Iris protested. Oh. Look at her cane. I knew she would hate it. Clay chuckled. Iris was in her loose sleeping wear alongside her nightman, Kane. They had also invited Corporal Clay and her own grandfather King Martin along for their leisurely gimmick. The topic of the day, eight hours, or until someone drops. Movie marathon of all things Dracula. According to their initial context as given by Clay and Kane who both proposed such an idea. The other worlders have their own artistic representations of blood consuming mages from their alien stories. They wanted just for fun after one occasion when Clay asked Iris if she had seen one of the Federation's many vampire movies that she said no. This weekend now is the prime opportunity to have Iris and her grandfather dive into vampire movies, specifically the quintessential, the classical, and the most venerated of Earth born vampires, Count Dracula. Sleeping in coffins? I rather sleep like one of the beggars in a dingy alley than to be made to sleep in one. The actual vampire ranted. Granddaughter. They all share a curse of being against the sunlight. A coffin, with all of its sides closed would have been a rational choice. King Martin argued. But, that scene with the child. I would disown any of my children if I found out they would resort to wickedness. And mirrors? 
They can't see their reflection in mirrors. I would be surprised if they could remain to look fair for even a month without one. The witch added, I still cannot believe you otherworlders think of us. Like this. This Dracula simply cannot compare to any of us, she voiced her displeasure. There were so many inaccuracies of earth folklore vampires and the Galician Socher fill that Iris was about to be reduced to the verge of hilarity fill tears over. At first glance, Dracula seems to be particularly your idealized illustration of a nobleman, charming of the tongue, educated, poignant to a fault. However, as their midnight marathon progressed, much to both Iris and Martin's frightened hilarity does the earth-made vampire displays its discrepant mannerisms in comparison. Many of the weaknesses that the earth vampires were of an easy or somewhat mitigated inconvenience for the Gleesi and such airfill such as the aversion to sunlight which obliterates the former but merely weakens the latter without the proper wardings to stave of its gaze. Pretty rich from someone who spent centuries in a coffin too, Clay grinned at the Lich King. It is a sarcophagus and it is much more dignified than a puny coffin. Martin snubbed. Well, you are undead after all. Clay pointed out. Not my children. Just me. I made that elixir so that my children can live long and fruitful lives. Granddaughter, you have a heartbeat do you not? The lich turned to Iris, the vampire which nodded. I can live and breathe just fine and enter other people's homes without their permission. Iris added, and garlic, the lord of all vampires can't stand a stupid little plant. I have seen children would last longer than him against Van Helsing. Within comparison, the vampires of Gleesia were some of the most imposing of folks to face thanks to their enhanced physical, mental and arcane acumens. It would take about five to seven several heavily armed and equally blessed inquisitors in comparison to even stand a decent chance against one such airfill. Compare that against Dracula who was bested by four men, three of whom are just your average man that was lead by an additional man who is an actual monster hunter. It was so embarrassing that Iris Lungs nearly killed her from the inside. You earthlings must really enjoy vampires so much to make plays of them a lot. Iris wiped off one of her tears. Your imaginations of us are more of a bardic comedy than those doom sayings I am used to hearing all the time. You have no idea. Clay nodded coyly. Are you saying you actually did that before? You robbed someone. Cairn laid his teeth, shuddering at the thought that the reclusive Iris would have done such an act. I had at one time. Iris evoked from memory. Mirian needed my help to repossess one of my enchanted items from a buyer who was particularly drippy on their payment for my services. I, to say the least, not very good at keeping quiet, but I got my work back. After turning his home inside out, she mentioned disconcertingly, What about you? What do you think about Dracula? Cain asked Martin. I dare say but I enjoyed Van Helsing the most. Martin answered, he reminds me of some of my old hunting companions that me and the lads would sneak off and kill some monsters for the thrill of it, the way Helsing just explains everything to. Now that's ironic, Clay barely contained his laughter. I however have one objection. Martin raised his voice. That Dracula has those three brides of his. Yet he still wants Mina. I would die the happiest king if I had first met Brigid and Lenain in such youth. Martin said. Brigid and Lenain? Clay asked. I had two wives. Brigid was my first. Lenain was by my side when the Senhili fell to Albone and escaped with my five children. Martin answered. His voice, head, and body retreated as he contracted back to his chair quietly. King Martin. Is something the matter? Clay asked. I, I wished to see them again after all of these years. My greatest regret outside of my that war I made with the Slaegians was never being there to see my children have children of their own. Cardo, Tyler, Duin, Marin, and Lactin. What? Became of them all? The Lich meekly answered before he promptly collapsed onto his lazy boy throne. I, you. Maybe I think it's best we give your gramps some space. Clay tapped Iris. I guess so. Let us clean up everything right now. She nodded. The three arose from their soft seatings as they cleaned up the scattered remains of snacks, drinks, and a few pillow stuffing. Courtesy of Iris' anger-induced rantings, 
Grabbing the glass goblets and bowls, Iris took them to her home sink to have them washed. But just as she was about to turn on the tap, the vibration of a physical tapping interrupted the relative quiescence of the now concluded marathon. At first, the vampire witch thought it was some wild nocturnal critter that wandered curiously out of its nest, but the incessant noise persisted as if it was calling attention to her. The source of the repeated sound came from a window on her immediate right. Upon closer examination, to Iris' surprise, she found the conjured bird, a Twitter messaging bird carrying onto its corporeal legacy sealed off container meant for letters, the violet-colored avian. Upon seeing Iris skipped excitedly, continuing to tap the window of Iris' new home, Iris slid open her aperture and promptly grabbed the sealed letter on the conjuration's leg, immediately dissipating upon the intended receiver's requirement. At first, Iris thought when she unfolded the parchment it was some invoice yet again from Luya to produce another magical item, but as she read the first few words of the letter, Iris' eyes widened. The words used in the handwriting was far too intimate and carefully inscribed to be the likes of the business-minded rush the dwarf merchant would have used. Sister Kadahagan. We have read through your many letters aloud to ourselves for the past few weeks. At first, we thought that your exile back into the wastes of our old homeland had gotten its madness through you, that all of these hearsays of the local vassal prince that brought the empire's dominion onto our old homeland had rebelled above all reasons against the empire and that our family's founder, the Lich King had returned. Yet after many travelers, minstrels and bards spoke of your supposed exploits and the ongoing crisis we simply could not ignore any longer. Honestly, at least for me, what you said about the other worlders and this rebellion that Tyrion had underwent through was almost too good to be true. Even though, the Slaegians, Dwarves and Eth Island are the ones provoked these sky people to go to war with them many of us still fear that they are no better than them all combined by the way your account their overwhelming power that could dominate the continent to their will. With such power and the fact that these other worlders are indistinguishable from many mortals, we had fear that they might be just like another Slaegian Empire or Elven Empire that will try to hunt the last of us down. That you are merely a tool to that these invaders would dispose once the time had come that you are no longer of use. However, the rest of the Kabbalah family still persist that you are to be given a second chance unlike your father had done when he last violated the Thomas and forced you into exile. Bring the one called Ranuprata to Damra, by the Duchy of Calmed. You can come home again sister. You know where exactly to meet when you arrive. The Ildiran shall judge for themselves and maybe they may grant you the clemency that your attainted line sought for so long. Do take care of yourselves when you journey from the south towards us, the legionnaire's presence, and thus the Inquisition have been increasing their presence within the duchy and I had feared this message would have been intercepted by their agents. The elimination of them should give ourselves room to breathe and if your other world of friends are willing enough to wipe them out rather than allow them to flee further north then the Thomas shall be grateful. Do also avoid the village of Agni above all else even if it is the most convenient of routes to pass. I have heard that the Inquisition has been making their shadow known the heaviest around that small town above all else, that I am not complaining. The other roads should be clear albeit will take your journey much longer to reach us. If all goes well with our parley with these other world as you speak of we may finally have the strength to be rid of the Inquisition once and for all. Until then, we shall see you very soon, Brother Yerjua Duinioth. Cain my dear. Iris turned to her nightman. I have something for you. She held the letter tightly on her hand and raced towards him. For Iris cold-hearted felt a new warmth, the approaching warmth of being able to begin again. Dash. The grand orchestra of battle wailed loudly as tribespeople fought in vain to contain these repulsive monsters with their bows, wooden spears, spell and stone weapons but to no avail. The southern frontiers tribes of wayward humans, orcs, Leokin and Gth had fought, dabbled and raided amongst each other for resources for millennia. Very few times however, they would unite to fight off against the new coming Slaegian invaders from the north who settled by the mouth's ends of their many rivers with their colonies. 
and yet even fewer tribes had the ability to conjure or perhaps tame such implacable monstrosities, as if blessed by whatever form of shamanistic magics that their profane pantheon had bestowed upon them. The Orsish tribe was known as the Mogoi. These warriors, famed for their light-footed soldiers combined with the pure strength of their warriors were aided by these alien constructs and divine demigods that blasted magics onto the Gth tribe known as the Balu. These two tribes were the fiercest of rival, locked eternally in bitter conflict for control of the canyon's wealth of fresh running water. The Blue Horns rely on their weapons and traps to fend off the Mogoi whilst the Orcs in contrast rely on sacrifices, divinations from their patron deity, and frenzy-inducing narcotics to fuel their aggression. For generational cycles uncounting, the two tribes fought each other into a deadlock until today. Rumor had whispered earlier those days from the Balu scouts of the religious Mogoi devotees speak of their patron goddess descending unto their cave homes in a physical manifestation. With Shaka and an army of her heralds called war aspects by their side, the Mogoi formed into a great heathen horde in impassioned numbers. A few days afterward, they pressed their attack on the Balu devastating all they come in contact with. Try as the Gths might, they were overwhelmed by the combined Orsish and demigods tide. The war aspects sported unusual black staves that the Mogoi called fire branches that spat molten metal through their bodies without honor and without thought, all fueled by a massed violence forcing many of their pre-made battle formations and defenses to scatter. Those that survived the initial magical barrage were no match for the orc warriors themselves who closed the distance and managed to thin their loosened numbers further in the hand-to-hand -hand combat of which the larger and taller Mogoi held the advantage against the lighter-sized Gth. It didn't take long for the Balu's own home settlement, merely wooden stakes to defend thatched houses to be demolished by the Mogoi. The Gth warriors began to lose heart when they saw their village, families and their possessions became the target of their aggressors ire in an orgy of despoilation. The Balu village was set ablaze and its defeated inhabitants pressed into the blade, the chain and the centuries of inter-tribal frustration now concluded by their humiliating domination. The chief of the village, a Gthelda who sported a cold beard was brought forth to the triumphant Hawk leader and his divine-like supporters. This land belongs to the heralds of the Los Reyes and their chosen people, the Mogoi. The Red's leader gloated. The other tribes will soon hear of this. They will all stop you, the elder said. You, fool. The goddess Shaka blessed. Her children, the Mogoi with powers beyond your insipid imagination, the Reyes bellowed. The figure then turned to the orc who bowed, allowing his feet to be quaked by war aspects steps. Here, the masked figure handed him over one of your fire branches of the goddess that you wield. The orc leader said, it is a smaller one, he remarked. The demigod's hands guided the orc to wield the black branch towards the conquered Balu elder. You wanted vengeance against him. Of how he killed your brother right? Now do it. The demigod said. The matriarch of the storm, Shaka is watching you now as Pyranti. Do not disappoint her. The war aspect leered. The orc smiled. Now his most hated foe now lies at his mercy. Egged on by his goddess's heralds, he aimed the fire branch onto the gth. The gth closed his eyes. A single tear fell on his cheek as he submitted to his fate. A loud crack followed by the lamentations of the now enslaved Gth filled the air as the last vestiges of the Balu tribe were devoured within a single day. Chapter 58 All Eyes on Us The land cruiser sailed the dirt roads of the Duchy of Kant as they made their way ahead of the Yafif's lines for Operation Northern Sweep. The mechanized thrust by the Amelioration's forces had already covered a third of the ground needed to reach Ghana's wall as of the first three days of the operation. The latest victim of their blitzkrieg is the agriculturally rich Duchy of Kant, a state well regarded by Klovich's input of being the bread and dairy basket of the empire. The landscape was of serene farmlands, humble ranches, poached woodlands, 
pollen-permeated plains, narrow creeks and the occasional small towns that dotted the scrolling meadows of the region. Today's timed objective for the youth is to reach the riverbanks of the Sukia. Samantha's squad is attached to the 23rd Infantry Battalion as an independent reconnaissance unit as per agreement between High Command and the 23RD's commander. Their task is to forge ahead for enemy positions and locations of interest for the infantrymen who hanged behind them several dozen kilometers away. Coincidentally, much to Iris' advantage, the Sugia River is not too far away from where her old home before her exile to Tyrian was. Just days earlier, she had presented to Governor White, Colonel Polonsky and to her grandfather of a letter that came from the other Sochef Phil who live in secret within the Empire's heartlands. Seeing an opportunity to cement a possible collaboration between the youth and local friendly natives, Governor White authorized Strider Group to make contact with King Martin's vampiric descendants. That and in conjunction to their standard reconnaissance assignments. So. Tell me more of this place Iris, Samantha asked as she tapped her canteen calmly to pass the time on their travels. My people's story started centuries ago back at Tyrian, known as Sanhili at the time. With the aid of the elves and the dwarves, the descendants of a hero called Del and the newly made Slay each an empire invaded the Sanhili kingdom. The remnants of the Sealian royal family fled northward to the land that will be calmed. The elders who saw the old kingdom called our journey. The bitter road. Many of us died on the way until my ancestors reached Calmed, which was just a simple river valley back then. We had for centuries lived amongst the other tribes before the Empire annexed all as far as the eyes can see around the Sugia River to create more farmlands. Over time we had adapted right under their noses, the vampires have taken many roles and positions within the social order of the duchy such as skilled individuals, landowners and other sorts of jobs whilst keeping their vampiric natures a secret amongst the after all. Damaro if you have not known is actually a county. The Count, or Countess is a vampire. Iris calmly narrated. Anyways, going back to the present. The eldest members of each bloodline of the Sochefil became a council called the Ildiran and they enforced the strict continued secrecy of our existence called the Thomas, while we live our lives here away from the prying eyes of the Empire. So, you hide in plain sight of the day then feed on blood on night am I correct? The captain pressed. You can say. A masquerade of sorts is practiced amongst us, we are your minstrels, your tailors, your shepherds and farmers at day, but at night we would either go out and exsanguinate the local animals or the occasional man. That was something an old friend of mine had told me. Maybe I should let you meet her soon if we get the chance. Iris nodded. Ease up their clay. Ailey do it now. Crocker who sat by the front passenger seat of the land cruiser ordered. To help with the infiltration of the reconnaissance team, Ailey threw cast an illusory spell onto the land cruiser. From the outside point of view, the land cruiser shares the visage of the typical wooden horse-drawn carriage if one doesn't observe too studiously. They also had to accelerate the land cruiser slower than normal as to maintain the ruse. Quite funnily enough, the carriage's driver is of the visible likeness of a beedire who had complained earlier of his mirror image being slightly too rotund for his personal taste. Additionally, Alia Thre would also use her magics. On the occasion that the disguised land cruiser is to move in close proximity to one of the roaming natives that travel along these same dirt roads to mask the Mraps engines with the auditory clopping steps of a yoked horse pulling along a carriage. However, in the event that suspicion arose amongst the travelers that meet up with Strider Grows, the squad is authorized to eliminate them to not jeopardize their position, regardless if they were patrolling legionnaires or civilians. Fortunately, only the former type of incident had occurred as of their deployment. Captain Rose advised that the squad should finish their reconnaissance duties for the day and make camp near Dimera as soon as possible. So anyways Iris, why did you get exiled from here in the first place? Samantha asked. It was such a long time. The vampire witch lowered her head. And I was so young. If you don't want to then it's okay. Samantha attempted to change the subject but she was cut off by Iris. Nay, you must know of my story before you meet the ill dear and Sam. She explained. Iris took a deep breath, rolled her eyes to right, and dove deep into her long memories. 
My father, Cardo violated the Thomas. The masquerade. He was excommunicated from the family where he was easy prey by the Inquisition agents. I too would have been killed like him if it were not for the Ildiran giving me leniency for my banishment unlike my poor father. Iris answered. Violated the masquerade how? Samantha pressed. He fell in love with an Arthurel woman, a human maiden outside of our family without the recognition of the Ildiran. We have many laws that guards our existence against the Arthurel. One such ruling is that if we are meant to be eloped with one outside of the family, they must have approval of the Ildiran. It was a great violation of masquerade when my father not only spoke of our existence to an outsider but to cause the death of an entire bloodline of ours to become extinct. The family never forgave him, nor me for all that had happened. Iris replied, sneering her teeth, as she got into the subject about her mother. Your father cheated on another woman? Ken furrowed his brow. Sounds to me you should be also mad at your father too. Yet you always speak so nice of him all the time whenever I bring it up. Samantha commented. To cheat demonstrates the limitation of the English speech my dear Ken. Adulterate is much more fitting. Iris explained. I was young, my childish thoughts like the old ballads sung from the bards. I didn't know it was wrong until I had become much older. But still, if you had met my mother, you would have understood why he chose love instead of his duty to the family. I could still remember my father's gentle voice and caring hands. Unlike mothers, what do you mean by that? Ken asked. My father and my mother's union were arranged. Marry the daughter of one of the other bloodlines so that they can give birth to a purebred vampire of which the union had sprouted me. Mother taught me magics whilst my father taught me how to craft potions as he was an apothecary by trade. Mother was harsh and demanding, father was kind calm and patient, I can remember all of their lessons as perfectly as the day I was there, and all their arguments, quarrels, Iris explained, yet alas, several decades into my childhood, further planted his seed and bore fruit unto the soil of another woman, the Arthurel, the outsider, your father had a child out of the marriage, the captain's eyes widened, a stillborn, Iris wistfully dipped, the child died before the babe could draw his first breath. That was when my father was exposed. A scandal of a vile vampire seducing a maiden caused an uproar amongst the townsfolks around the duchy. Hunts were conducted and the many of my kin were exposed. An entire branch of the family, the Lactin Arch was hunted to the last brother and sister during the great hunt. Reeling from this breakage of our masquerade, mother ordered me to honor the Thomas by throwing the stillborn at the Sukir. I just couldn't do it. I could have sworn my half-sister was still alive beneath those blankets so I hesitated. That is when my mother took the basket and threw it herself to the river. The vampire which allowed herself to be vulnerable as a lamented deer fell onto her pale cheeks that refracted from the sun rays that pierced through the land cruiser's windows. The air inside them wrapped descended into a melancholic mood as Strider Group gave a moment of silent empathy to Iris' sorrowful accounts. Iris. It's okay if you don't want to say any more. Samantha attempted to. The Ildiran saw my reluctance as a continued danger to the Thomas. I was sentenced into exile to live alone. Banished from my friends and family, all thanks to my mother. Iris continued. I traveled east, to the Estlrooks where I managed to gain the tutelage of the rank crafting monks of Merlerum. That was how I learned my enchanting skills at that underground monastery of theirs. They were so kind to a lone Umbre like me. After several decades, I had heard of a city down south that was in need of enchanted objects and so I bid farewell to that monastery and head to Tyrian. I joined Luya's trading company, built a house at the woods and well. One faithful day I met five strangers who intruded into my home. All of you. A soft smile was allowed to escape her beneath her somber reminiscence. I understand now. About you, Samantha inhaled her breath, absorbing the emotional pain under herself from her squad mate. I didn't mean to have you. Well, get you back there. She apologized. You needed to know everything Samantha and my story is only but a chapter of the long history of the Gleesian vampires. Iris wiped her tears away, recomposing her breath. She straightened her posture back to her usual supercilious self. 
There is still much more you must know about us vampires, Samantha. The Socher feels such as myself today came to Kant after the fall of the Old Kingdom. There are five, were five family branches of those descendants of the old Senhilian royal family that had fled Tyrian. Duinyath, descended from Duin, the youngest child, held exceptional magical prowess. The next family and also child afterward is Tulla named after the founder Tulla. They are as best I can remember, more lucid than the other branches, and are the richest thanks to their many ventures. The next one in contrast is the Lactanach. They were the brave warriors that unfortunately were killed off in their entirety about a century ago. The other branches are still trying to recover the void left by their departure. They are followed by the mariners of whom are the more in touch with themselves of the family. Bards, courtesans, actors to name a few of those I was good friends with. Lastly is the eldest child. You know them through me as the Kudahagan. The smallest but were perhaps the most influential of the branches before my father put our family's name to the mud. Iris lectured. Sounds like I got a handful to deal with. Samantha acknowledged. Are you sure I can be able to impress them all? Mariners and Tullanildirans. I am sure you might be able to win over with your magics alone. It is getting Duinyath and my mother to approve of you. Iris explained. Your mother is on the Ildiran too? Samantha grasped. I forego the matter that ever since the Kadahagan and the Lactan arches had fallen, the Duinyath branch has obtained the largest share of power amongst the Ildiran by proxy of my mother. If Dana who came from the Duinyath taking over the Kadahagan seat as go ruled by her uncle who seats the Duinyath seat. They will not be so easily swayed. Iris informed them. How so? Ken asked. Many of the vampires still do not trust Prince Klovich nor do they also trust your federation. In most of their eyes, you are no different than the Empire. The witch answered. Not even King Martin coming back was enough. Samantha raised. Grandfather has only recently arisen after centuries of slumber Samantha. They wouldn't trust some relic as old as him of what their main concerns are now. It was also through his mistakes that the family had to flee to Kant in the first place. So, what chance do we got to seal this deal? It's either your vampire family allies to us or the 23rd will not distinguish them from any other natives they come across once the next phase of the offensive pushes through. Samantha urgently pressed. An alliance to them is just another way of saying conceding for all the Ildirans would concern. Make no mistake, the Federation and the Amelioration are the one who holds the leverage and the Ildiran are at the defensive. Their pride would not allow it. Such could be their undoing if our fears come to pass. Iris noted, We have to be careful. I do have a few friends of my father who are still part of the family, but the scales are tipped against our bids. If we are to secure the family's cooperation, it has to be on equal grounds. We can't force them to yield, otherwise, they would sooner have everyone in this carriage be their next meal and then die against the Federation than submit, she warned. You jest? Aliathra quivered, No. I do not. Ira stiffered. For now, Samantha we must allow the Ildiran to speak their peace and then work with what we can from there, she advised. Captain Abidia cried. I found it. He looked over a piece of parchment paper that Iris provided. The illustration demonstrated a large encompassing table rock that towered over a dense forest and a creek. That's Dimura? Crocker asked. It is. Clay pitch this steed by the base of the rock. Samantha and I will press on from there. Iris nodded. Captain, are you sure about this? You two alone in there? Crockett turned around. The captain removed and holstered her bullpup rifle and chest trigger side, only keeping her trusty side arm with two clips of spare ammunition and a for self-defense. All she wears is her fatigues. Her olive tactical hoodie with the Hecate suit hidden underneath. She needed to come as non-threatening as possible to these vampires, to show them that the Federation is willing to talk. Yet she is no fool to not approach the Valley of Glutinous Devils of the Dark without any contingencies. Cain, Diaz, and Daliathra will be on standby in case things go south. I want this car ready to floor it, stealth be damned if the worst happens. Samantha cautioned. Roger that cap. Clay softly saluted with two of his fingers. The combat engineer smiled as he loaded his shotgun. Before they journeyed here, 
The squad was outfitted with specialized weaponry and armor to help them stand a chance against the vampires as to not repeat what happened in the Verdon Valley Forest again. UV lamps and bullets that will cause any of our skin to keep at a distance between them in addition to a retrofitted to the brim with armor and a few holy runes to ward off anyone who tries to engage the user, that being Cain. In melee, Diaz's augments were a natural fit with the agility cybernetics needed to weave through the vampires for any emergency extraction's sake. Aliathra was preparing her holy magics to fall back on but their orders were if they are not to engage the vampires in the event hostilities occur but fend them off long enough to escape and have more combat abiding units deal with the matter. For now, the two are to tail Samantha and Iris as they made their journey into Dimera. The surrounding forest of the plateau housed towering trees whose leaves shadow the ground below into a simulated perpetual night. Their roots festered up the ground of the cracked earth causing dizzying crevices and pockets to hamper those who walk by its twisted glades. Such hostile geography however housed a unique abundance of life however, glowshrooms and gaming critters dotted underneath and above the forest attracting many of brave or foolhardy, a folks to harvest its boundary. Such as the clever shield that veiled Dimera hunting lodge or known regionally as a Tyler to be the nerve center of the exiled Soch Phil who ruled the night in calmed. Hunting game amongst the many forests of the duchy is a popular pastime and a means of obtaining food in the fertile region for the peasant and noble folks alike. Yet Dimera? Although not the most premier of hunting lodges in the empire was the most abundant of a selection of flora and fauna of the especially nocturnal variety is situated within its uniquely isolated biosphere. Watch for traps, it's going to be hard to walk with a bleeding foot you know might upset the family. Iris panted as she saw the captain narrowly dodge the rusted teeth of one such animal trap. Thank God I am hiking without anything on me, Samantha sighed as she leapt over an uprooted rock with her hatchet in hand to cut of any overgrowth in their way. How come this forest is different compared to all the rest in Gleesia? She asked. I will let you in on a vampire's secret. Iris hushed her mouth. This forest was magically enchanted in such a way that the trees found here are remain tall and evergreen even at the worst of winters by my kin many centuries ago. To make this place for every night time so they can go about as they please? Clever. Samantha nodded. That and accidents happen quite often in the forests that is especially used by many gatherers for as long as they lived. Hunting accidents. Animal attacks. You can see where we get a healthy amount of blood coming into the lounge. The local gravekeeper and the physician who lives in the lounge are family too. They share a bit of the body essences every time a fresh one comes into their hands. Iris explained. The perfect crime. The captain shuddered. The vampires have theoretically a steady supply of blood to nourish themselves. However, now that the war has happened such hunting tours would be indefinitely close and who knows what bloodthirsty vampires would do when staved off of nourishment for too long. At least there was nobody following them today however. It took another half hour's hike through the woods to have Samantha and Iris be greeted to a large stone arch adorned with a shield and sign above them signifying that they have reached the foot of the Dimera hunting Tyler. Approaching the large head sized knocker. Iris tapped the heavy ring three times. Where is life's greatest of gifts? The Tyler gatekeeper's pair of eyes peered out from the gate as his sentinel gaze cast down upon the two. He spoke in a challenging tone with his earring voice, exsanguinated upon all of creation. Iris stepped forward and whispered. What is our greatest strength? The gatekeeper proceeded to the next riddle, seemingly satisfied by her answer otherwise if she was wrong. Silence, my brother. The witch answered, when is that we can begin again? The gatekeeper asked again. When dusk falls of where the tearful road ends is where we may begin again. Iris answered, Jaeger, let me in or I will rip your scalp off. The walk up here nearly ruined my new shoes, she yelled out. The gate opened slowly, its rusted hinges creaked as widened apart. A tall man of long silver hair greeted the two. He dressed in respectable if not a slightly blood-stained linen shirt with a flat collar and short cuffs on his wrist. He had with him a bandolier of assorted baits, sedative mixtures, 
and a quiver for his elegantly crafted crossbow that he held at the ready to be fired the moment he scented danger to the tailor. Welcome home sister. And guest Yeager Duanyuth greeted, his tongue seemingly forced to give honors to the exiled Aris and the visiting Samantha. Normally the Ildiran and the rest of the family would have met you by the outskirts of the plot but alas, these days are not normal. What had happened? Iris raised. Things are bad for many of the family Iris. The Duke has ordered the complete evacuation of the land so that we can flee to the safety of the North. We shall be surely exposed if we leave the safety of what we had built. Yegor explained. This must be the chosen one you speak of. She is. Well. Quite a person for my sights to be honest. Yegor bowed upon looking at Samantha. Why can't you leave? Samantha asked. The Thomas. Our mask has been threatened. Our family relies on its connections that are deep-rooted into this land for centuries. We are like a tree, tall and proud over the duchy ever since we were made to walk the tearful road from Senali to Calmed, the land you now call Tyrian. That land, just like our founders, it always seems to breed those who dare walk the untrodden paths such as this prince of yours who is descendant of the apostate. Yeager expanded. Prince Clovich? Samantha answered. Yes, child. Of one such of our former followers who led the Slay agents to devour us and forced us to walk the tearful road. But alas, we are not here to speak of bitter tales. Come sister. Bring the Chosen One to the Ildir and we are waiting for you. Yegor escorted Samantha and Iris through the Tyler's walled courtyard as they stepped foot onto the mouth of the lodge proper. In a disparaging transition from the frigid wilds of the forest, the Tyler was cordial in its urbane embrace, palatial in size due to its combination of hospitable facilities and the Countess' private quarters. Hunting trophies of various alien creatures of all sizes. Shapes and colors decorated the walls. Wooden furnishings civilized the otherwise frozen life with crafted hands, not to mention that Samantha's feet curls restfully when she felt the warm breeze of the nearby fireplace that invited respite, a sanctuary to those hunters who seek to rest and be entertained with a hot meal and cozy beds by the proprietress and countess of this household. Hello, mother. Iris forced herself to politely greet if Tana could a hagen nae The family resemblance was very reflective. The countess was of a taller and more mature-bodied version of Iris, the difference being that the countess has a few noticeable wrinkles here and there on her face and if Tana's hair curled upwards with hairpins that weaved through her ebony silken threads with worthy nobility, she sat by her chair. Her legs modestly held together with the royal grace of what remained of the old Senhili line in her shoulder-bearing purple dress. Greetings, daughter. The disdain from the countess' lips seethed into her mouth. You have changed quite a bit when I last saw you and your petulant father. If Tana scoffed, welcome home. The countess' voice shifted to distorted cordiality. Home? Samantha's skin crawled. Dimeradot was my home before I came to Terry and Samantha. As in the roof above my head and sleep soundly every night. Iris explained. Further taught me how to concoct potions in his apothecary here while mother diligently tutored me in the magical arts I am skilled at today right in this very Tyhelis. She glared back at Ivdana. For you Dega there, at least I know that I did not raise an idiotic child. You wouldn't be here alive and back to my feet once again if you were my daughter? The countess condescended. Iris' eyes fired daggers onto her mother's, her face silenced by the anguishing memories she had under her tyranny. A cadre of many more of Iris kin surrounded the two. Samantha's I could catch about twenty-four attendees to this gathering including Ivdana, their eyes examining capriciously. Locked towards the alien accessories and threads Iris and Samantha sported during their appearance. Let us not dally around the dale now. What she speaks shall decide our next course of action for the family. One of the vampires a robust yet respectably dressed man forwarded his motion on to everyone in the room. Indeed, we must. Ivtana nodded. Daughter. Angstai. Stand at the center of the room. She pointed. A table was set up displaying the five family shields of the great Sochefil families by five equally opulent thrones, each of the four Ildiran, with one left empty out for the bygone Lactan arches, took their respective thrones. Also, 
Atop of that table was a sizable 12 inch tower glass. As for the 15 other attendants, a row of chairs was set aside for them to look onwards, to bear witness to this court like case. Ladies and gentlemen, I know at such trying times I have called upon you here at the Tyler in spite of what hardship your houses have undertaken in the weeks, and for that, I appreciate all of you in attendance still wish to see our laws be enforced no matter, if Dana spoke forth, her conservative tone ring approving nods across all other vampire attendants. As you all have known beforehand, my daughter, Iris has proposed a most radical of propositions for our kind my fellow vampires, an alliance to be forged between us and this new amelioration and their federation patrons. That dumb sod couldn't tell he hoard himself out if you shouted slowly every word of his choices. She raised the subject to the court which was followed by their oars of rancorous laughter. Captain, drone is up. If I hear fighting, we're going to plan B standing by for your order. Ken radioed through Samantha's hidden earpiece. Let us proceed now on why we are all raised at all and Ildiran. I have a family to hide from the Jukal soldiers when this is over. He hastily proceeded. If Dana flipped over the hourglass on the table and waved her hand towards Iris and Samantha, prompting them to begin speaking for their case. 30 minutes. If Dana spoke sternly, why should we consort with your federation? Samantha took a deep breath. She and Iris had practiced every word, every possible response to a question and every possible misunderstanding. She hoped it shall be enough to convince them all. Murphy's law can be a cruel mistress to please indeed. They needed to say for this moment. If all else fails, the captain is ready bail out of there with her pistol and spells ready to be drawn at a second's notice. The Federation, in collaboration with Prince Klovich's amelioration is giving you the opportunity to join him in his new Lyward Wrath of New Zanigrad. He offers your people representation and participation in his organization in exchange for your support and cooperation in all of his endeavors. As we speak. He is already preparing to accommodate your people and integrate them peacefully into his newly formed nation if you so agree to collaborate with us. Each of you Ildiran shall become your people's representatives in his Alwadrath and be able to affect any decisions that concerns of you without meddlesome interference. Samantha announced. The prince. Knows of us? If Dana raised her voice. How? Huh? I did. Iris answered. The room quaked upon the disturbing revelation brought forth by one of their own, that their hidden society had been exposed. She's a traitor. Like her father, one of the jurors cried out. Hold on. I am have not finished speaking. Samantha hollered. Order. Order. The mayor and Ildiran called forth. If these other worlders are as what Iris had said are capable of, they would have found us out regardless if Sister Iris pointed our location to us. She reasoned. But our secrecy. If Dana protested, is under threat by the Empire anyways. What is more attention to us already then? This proposal is possibly our only way out to survive. The mayor and Ildiran pressed herself, motioning to Samantha to continue testifying for her position. Continued Stai. Samantha nodded. Klovich's Sainigrad guarantees equal rights for all races and peoples. Yours included. Vampires will enjoy without discrimination to be able to participate in the Lyward Wrath, but also the right to be free from fear. From fear? If Dana questioned. Never worrying about someone trying to unjustly attack you because you are a vampire, the captain explained. As long of course you do not do so unto others in return. She added, all of the Federation know of me as a vampire, yet they never tried to belittle me nor do they hide daggers behind their backs. Iris added. But for as long as you keep dancing to their tune like some Kuma Kenny dancing girl, the Duanir Thildiran argued, what is stopping them from disposing of you when you're... and our usefulness has been expended? Well, you get to live peacefully in a nice house surrounded by neighbors who care and admire you then I say. Not really that bad. Iris rebutted. Oh, and this is just from me, but I also have a new job of enchanting items and last, I check. I am earning just as much ducats as an elven in Canter, she added. The jury of vampires whispered amongst themselves of their sister's statement. They sensed the confident bravado, her calm respiration and her upright eyes that she hides no deceit. 
This swayed several of the initially skeptical Socher to seriously consider the Federation's radical offer. Yet still the more risk-averse vampires still had many more concerns left unaddressed. Even if we agreed to swear ourselves fealty to the amelioration, there is still the concern of our uncommon needs. The Duanya Thildiran raised, if we cannot acquire our needs we will perish. As you said earlier, not many people will agree that we do unto others so how can we fulfill our needs? Centuries of frightful tales from the Arthurol for our peculiarities will be most difficult to address. He tapped the side of his neck signifying he is talking about the vampire's need to feed on blood. We do have a means to address that problem. Samantha reached into her jacket and pulled out a plastic packet of artificial blood used as a blood substitute for many medical procedures from the Federation. The mere sight of red salivated the fangs of several of the vampires as the captain pulled two more out. Using a plastic straw, she pierced the intravenous cavity of each of the blood packs and handed them over to the vampires in the room. One packet is shared amongst the Ildiran while the jury makes do of passing along the other two. As their fanged lips sipped upon the blood bags, a corral of lip smacks and mastication swelled upon the room. It tastes odd. One red-lipped vampire, of whom distinguished himself as a connoisseur of all things sanguine commented. Crisp, uncannily earthy, lacks any finish. His tongue rolled as he tastes the mock blood's character as he gave courtesy to his next seat. I do not know about you, but I can hardly taste any difference. A young vampire who hadn't tasted much blood rebutted his experienced kin. Can I draw any of my spells with this? A curious-minded one inquired. Hey, I want that blood too. A piggish vampire hurled to claim the bag, his nose tantalized by its scent. The reception to the artificial blood was mixed as best the captain perceived. Some of them lightly approved of the imitation nourishment yet most of them were not fully on board of the overall taste of the blood packs. It wasn't the ideal reaction Iris and Samantha wanted, but it was some grounds they can build up from moving forward. Are the rumors true sister Iris, that these other worlders, can create blood? The Tylan vampire asked. Indeed, they in fact produce this blood quite often. Like us, they too respect such rites, transfusions, intravenous feeding and even donations. Iris nodded. Donations? You dot freely dot willingly. Give up your own precious bloods to people? The Tylan perked up. Yes, Samantha answered. It happens quite often for healers to do on occasion for healing. A rituals of ours, which of course, the Prince and the Federation are willing to give you such privilege, but only on people who approve of their blood being used for your consumption, she explained. Interesting. Very interesting. The Ildiran nodded approvingly as he retreated back to his throne. Meanwhile, Ivdana and her fellow Duanya Thildiran shook their head dismissively. Let us continue onwards. There is more that we need to discuss. Ivdana addressed to Iris. Us vampires are the pinnacle of magical prowess in Sanigrad. We had used our cunning and great knowledge to survive against those who wished to see us exterminated for many centuries. So, it came to our surprise when we had heard the heralds of one. So, it has come to our surprise and our pride to hear the tales being spun by the heralds and the inquisition that you personally train the chosen one, the shareholder the arcane arts, her actions from the Asterix, Tifrate and the imperial seat of Herring Point. Yes, I have, but I did not just merely train her, my magic has been enhanced to a new horizon thank no parts to learning unique subjects from her and the advanced insights brought by the Federation's own scholars. I managed to kill dozens of elite Dark Elves troops and Imperial battle mages during the war with me new spells. Iris boasted, it is one of the great benefits this alliance with the Federation can grant you. What Iris knows will also be known to you. Samantha reassured supportively to the vampires. Then demonstrate. Show us this newfound power. If Dana challenged, composing herself to see what could be unleashed under her eyes at this moment. Even the other vampires in the room watch unblinkingly to see their performance. Is there anything here in this room that you are willing to let go of? Samantha asked. This table is starting to rot anyways. One of the vampires pointed to the aged furniture across the room. 
The nods of agreement from his fellows authorized Samantha to lock onto the object for her demonstration. All righty then. I am going to use Mage Hand spell to crush the table in front of you with one hand, the captain confidently declared. That is most absurd. Mage Hand can only be used to lift objects not crushing them. If Tana defiantly exclaimed, several more shook their head in agreement to the Kadahagan matron. Samantha ignored the doubters, raising her hand silently towards the procured target, thrusting her left arm forward. The arcane meridian surgically incised within her body manipulated the mana around the room. A telekinetic force, invisible to the naked eye but able to be grasped and manipulated by Samantha was conjured from out of her as it dashed through towards the targeted table. At first, the furniture shook slightly to the touch of the captain's mage hand grasp but soon after only a few seconds of delay, a crack developed in between the surface of the tabletop. Now locked onto the object, Samantha, with the simple collapse of her hands, crushing the furniture into wooden splinters. Incredible. A vampire cheered. All of that babble from the tavern was true. She applauded. Impressive indeed. However, I would like to see your magics perform in a much more pressing environment, in combat. If Dana's eyes closed as she rose from her throne, still harboring her chauvinistic views despite the Seraphirol's prodigiousness daughter, since you are the one advocates the most of these other worlders you may select one of five of our best mages to do. You, mother. Iris cut her off, if Tana recoiled, flabbergasted by such bravado. Don't be so modest. I am already laying bare all I have gained during my banishment. It is only right you lay bare all that you have during these past decades. If we want to truly test the strength of my new magics, it is only right I test it against yours, the champion mage of the Duaneath. She openly challenged the matron's authority. Are you saying? The Duaneath filled ear and held his breath. He knew where this kind of talk would be heading towards to. I challenge my mother to a silence. The victor shall prove once and for all whose magics are superior, Iris declared. The crowd gasped by Iris' brazen display. To openly stand against the Ildiran was a risky assessment. Something her father, like daughter, paid the price for many years ago. Samantha retreated her niche knowledge back to that word. A silence was a precursor to the modern daily easy rendition of the magic duel. Unlike duels of purely combative contexts, the silence had more similarities to a western-styled fast draw, minus the lethality that seeks to address debates between rival mages. According to the rules, each side is to quickly sling one or a set number of spells towards their opponent, and whoever is left incapacitated or the most damaged would lose the contest. Several of their ancient techniques were incorporated into the logs of the Imperial College of Magi back in Herring Point as Carlia and Iris explained. Such an event however is only used for practices amongst novice mages to perfect their adversary Serial spell casting capabilities and the formalized confrontation's origins died out to the dangerous debates between rogue mages and vampires alike. Be careful of your words daughter, I had only partially trained you before your banishment, you do not know all of the arcane mysteries that the Duaneaths had delved themselves into the Illyrium. Of all that we could have taught you, you will be no match for me child, if Dana stepped forward stretching her hands as she readies herself to face off against her own offspring. Then a silence shall commence. Victory shall be decided on whoever can force their adversary to concede. The dull and Ildiran mediated. He turned to grab a smaller hourglass, one used for alchemical and culinary purposes set to about three minutes. I am no longer your scared little babe mother. I'll show you I have learned much from my travels. Iris attuned her hands readying herself to sling her magics. She had a game plan that she is confident will defeat her mother who amongst Turkin was a champion in silence. Samantha waited with bated breath, silently cheering to the vampire witch as the two ready themselves across each other with the Tull and Ildiran between them as the acting arbitrator of this contest. Ready? He told the women. Iris cocked the back of her thumb, her dead eye locked to her mother readying to end this fight as swiftly as it began. A soft smile emerged out of her mouth, as the room fell into a tense silence. Begin, the Ildiran shouted, 
If Dana waved her hands forward, focusing her powers to teach her impudent daughter another painful lesson like many times before, yet Iris knew from the very start she would do this when backed into a corner. She leaned backwards, her casting hand, formed into a gun with her thumb up with the index and middle finger pointing forward. The mana within her enchanted a meager yet sufficient amount of ice magic towards her palms. Using the somatic gesticulation to manipulate the potential mana energies, she cocked her thumb like a pistol's hammer to charge the spell before curling her middle finger to trigger the proverbial firing mechanism. A jet stream of water discharged from her hands, the conjured fluid irrigating her mother, embarrassingly shriveling her purple dress. You think you can best me with water? If Dana's nerves poked open from her head, rattled by something so childish. Bang! Iris whistled as she cocked her thumb again to discharge the second bolt of magics towards her mother. This time, it was ethereal in properties yet cool to the touch for it was a magic missile enchanted with ice. The magical bolt made impact upon Ivtana's body. To everyone's awe, the biting frost of Iris' spell began to entwine the Kadahagan matron. The ice that stained her body and rich clothes turning from a minor cosmetic inconvenience to a physical glacial prison. Ice bound her body stopping her mid-spell cast as its chillid embrace dashed any astute avenues for escape. If Dana was made incapacitated as long as it took for an autumn leaf to fall from its branch to the ground. This cold-blooded technique, a small amusement she had mimicked from the dexterous Diaz and then described by the gun-toting of Bidaya would not be possible without her time spent with Strider. Cocking her hands like the Federation's iron wand called the revolver, Iris was able to shoot out weaker albeit faster firing bolts of magics towards any foe. With a little extra practice, she can also guide the magic projectiles to whatever place she desired. As for the cryomancy on display, a little chemistry lesson by her dear little nightman, Ken gave her a deeper insight into the secrets of winter allowing such a spell to occur upon her brackish mother. There was no further contest, Iris had won the silence to the upset of everyone in the room. So cold, Ivtana shivered, helplessly trying to free herself to continue the duel but to no avail. It looks like I have won. Iris smiled standing proudly in triumph. The Kadahagan matron seeing no way to escape, reluctantly conceded with a submissive nod. Then it is settled, the Federation's magics are indeed potent. The Dalin concluded the silence. If Dana was then immediately broken free from her frigid imprisonments as she shivered anemically towards the fireplace for warmth, the swiftness of the vampire which shall be talk about beyond this day. Tilda Aris playfully hummed as she rests her hand by her hip and bowed respectfully, the formal gesture of triumph. Samantha ran up to her triumphant friend raising her hand above her, they united their hands onto each other with one sharp high five. An affectionate gesture that Aris had gotten to also learn from the Federation too. Impressive. Very impressive. Perhaps I. We had underestimated you. Ivtana shook of the last bits of frost from her body by searing herself slightly with conjured fire magics. Turning around, poising herself back to her stately self as she puffed air back into her lungs. You have proven that you do indeed have strength but also the abundant advantage of partnering with the amelioration. Brothers and sisters, she formally announced before turning to the rest of her kin. Send our word to the new emperor that we shall join you as long as Clovich grants us total autonomy to our continued way of life. The Duenia Thildiran gladly stated. You. I beg your pardon? Samantha raised. The captain thought she heard a critical fault in the vampire's statement. We will join once we are guaranteed the unlimited sway we have to our way of life. The same Ildiran paraphrased. Samantha and Iris looked into each other's eyes, both alarmed by the unwholesome implications of the vampire's bluster. They arrogantly expected the full benefits from Clovich without understanding that they are giving paltry effort on their part in return. A disproportional compromise that the Whigs back in New Albany will never accept. I, ah, uh, I have to say that you cannot just do that, Samantha denoted. What do you mean, cannot? If Dana asked, every vampire in the room was struck dead mid-flight as their waxed wings of hope melted and come crashing down back into the sea of reality. 
When new vampires join the Federation and Clovich's new kingdom, you have. You must integrate yourselves peacefully with the humans. Or our Farols and the other races too. The captain stated, Your laws, in their current form, are for the benefit of you vampires and a liability. The disadvantage for the rest. Therefore, we cannot let you do whatever you want so as a condition of this alliance, you have to have every single vampire law you have reviewed, adjusted, and reformed by him and his counselors before you are allowed to go about your livelihoods. That is absurd, if Dana shouted. Who do you and the amelioration think they are interfering with our laws? Nobody has the right to rule over us. She spat. Mother. Everyone please. Iris cried. We have always been seen as monsters and pests by the Empire for centuries. This is could be our only chance to show that we are no longer the monsters they think we are. They are not our kind daughter. Who are they to tell us what we can and cannot do? If Dana protested. This is no proposition at all. This is no better than vassalage. The last time we had played by the laws not of our own. An entire family was wiped from existence. The Duenia filled ear and scoffed. They are different. Times have changed when you sit here on your manors and burgs. We do not have to live in fear anymore with this. King Martin would have only wished for all of his children the best for him. Iris appealed pleadingly. How dare you invoke Martin's name to us child. If Dana refuted her daughter, he does not know anything of our plight. How long has he been buried underneath the ground? Five, six, seven hundred years, she exclaimed. If Dana, the tall and old dear and raised his voice. Your daughter is right. We cannot continue to live like this, he argued. What are you trying to say? She turned on him. The Inquisition has us by our throats. My children and my brothers are barely fighting off the Inquisition as we speak. If we do not do something, anything. It will be only a matter of time before they find us and kill us all like what they did to the Lactinox, he argued. I second his argument. The mayor and Ildiran stepped forward. I call for a pladizio. We shall settle on the matter to take this proposition by the shareholder as it stands or send her away with nothing. She weighed. Salute for yea, sword grip for nay, if Tana announced. A tense moment passed over as the jury of vampires used the time to make a decision. Before long, two factions, both opposing in their polarities, arose. Each split between a two-fingered salute and a fist with the thumb pointed out sidewards. Is this a coup? The Duenia Thildir and sneered his teeth, as he counted the disparaging division between all of the vampires. The room was caught in a stalemate, one vote short of a decision, twelve against, twelve for. But as he spoke, his eyes widened suddenly. Isn't that... 24? Aren't we supposed to be 25? The mayor and Azildaran raised. Roll call. If Dana demanded. Names were called quickly. Samantha's heart raced just as fast, barely hearing the many identities of the vampires in the room. Iris however silently stared towards her mother, despondent to what she is seeing of her people throwing away this one only opportunity for peace. Genya. Zinavi, Samba. Where is Rancid Ratama? The Duenia Thildiran frustratingly asked. No wonder this lodge smelled too pleasant. Where is that Trapscallion? The mayor and Ildiran asked her kin. How could we forget about him? She cried. He must have slipped past our minds. We were all busy. Excited to see the shareholder that we forgot about him. One vampire begged for forgiveness. Then again. I never liked Ratimer when he comes back from one of his escapades. Another cringed. Who is he exactly? Samantha inquired. My third eldest. The mayor and Azildiran answered. Lives alone but. He's a good child if you get past his. Eccentricities. Has a knack with animals though. She added. Oh, that one. Iris remembered his name by the Ildiran's description alone. Knowing him. He is probably fondling someone else's habitants or worse, rescuing them, she caustically answered. Why can't we send out a message to him now? Samantha asked. That is the problem. He is prone to wander a lot. Sometimes not even my own kin can truly track where he is the mayor and Azildiran answered. When I first sent out the invitations to this gathering, 
I just did one of my many children who is closer to him pass the message down, she explained. So who has last seen Ratima? The Duanya Thildiran questioned. I do believe I saw him at the sprouted flower in Kaloban last month. Perhaps you can start there? One of our sisters owns the establishment I do believe. One of the vampires raised. Who is this sister again? If you can remind me. If Dana nudged. Lillian. Lillian Aura. The vampire answered. Lillian? I. I remember that name. Iris muttered. She is. Was a good friend before I left. Well, someone has to find him. We cannot decide without his vote. If Dana raised. But La Dewey Aura is at Culloban. The Dewey near Thildir and protested. There are legionary patrols everywhere. They will get suspicious if they see any traveller roam anywhere southwards towards the city. Culloban? My troops are about to go over there by tomorrow anyway so I can easily go there. Samantha volunteered. You? The mariner's old ear and scratched her chin. If you speak so confidently then judging from your magic demonstrations it shall be best. We give you leeway in good faith to find Ratima and deal with the garrison in Culloban. I would like to see how this army of the amelioration managed to humiliate the Empire in a week. It does sound like a good time for an outing if the Inquisition in Culloban will be gone by that time. A vampire optimistically leapt. Might bring the smoked meats and cheese to watch. Once we find him, I will shoot up a magic message of his answer to you. Iris added, No, for the honor of the Pladizo, we cannot risk you trying to taint the integrity of his tally. If Tana politicked calmly, bring him back to the Tihelis in person in the next three days, otherwise we as a family shall be forced to abscond the decision to join your amelioration due to indecision. She brought out her terms. That is not fair mother. Surely we can ha, Iris paid to the Ildiran but she was stopped by the captain before her alacrity ruined any chances of resolving this political stalemate favorably. We are not in a position to press harder Iris. We need to play along. For now, Samantha implored her. The witch stuttered, but she knew that the captain was correct. They needed to find Ratima within the next few days otherwise the vampires will be just as dust as the old Sanhilian kingdom. This meeting is adjourned. The Duanya Thildir and gaveled. Dash. Sir Faith Langarm Hayek arose from his soft surface with aches over his bodies. Casting away the delicate and still mana-warmed hands of the healers attending him he shuffled his eyes to regain his bearings to where he was at. The clothes droof over his head, the scent of fresh grass, and the minimalistic interior of his dwellings indicated he is inside some sort of tent. Praise be the gods, the chosen one has awoken. One of the healers hailed Faithlen, groaning from his still damaged body. The boy knight sluggishly turned to the healer. What happened? Where am I? He asked. Faith Len had remembered before he blacked out that he was fighting the demons alongside the very heroes of the Empire. Even with all of their strength, the finest knights could barely allow the Emperor and his people to escape to safety. It took all of his best that his powers can be and the brave intervention of Princess Sistress that they managed to escape with their lives. Sir Garm Hayek shouted a familiar voice from the distance. It was the Grand Marshal Sir Hugot with Petra escorting him. Grand Marshal Faith Len saluted, the still fractured bones on his body chilled his arm. Tell me what had transpired? You were bedridden for five days straight. If it were not for our healers. Praise Nenith we wouldn't know what could happen to you chosen one. Hugot sighed in relief. But your recovery is perhaps the only good news I have been heard throughout this week. His voice grimly shifted. An aberrant tone of uncertainty permeated his blue means. Go on. He nudged him to continue. We have made camp barely through the Northern Territories and we should be able to reach Ghana's wall before the week finishes. Petra dressed. We could have been there sooner if we hadn't allowed the refugees to come along with us, however. He turned his gaze towards the marshal. All the roads have been blocked. Our supplies are about to run thin and we are being harassed daily by the demons as we retreat. Yet do not forget that we have to protect what is left of our people Sir Eric Dorf. That is our oath. Hugot refuted Petra. Garners will retreat. What is going on? What happened to the city of Herring Point? The Emperor? Princess Istris? Faith Len exclaimed for an answer. Such words were not of what he expected the valiant legion of Slaeja to speak of. 
They were always steadfast, daunting and tireless on their pursuit in their exercising of the will and might of the empire. Yet by the sight of tired knights, demoralized legionnaires and hungry refugees painted a grimly confusing transition to such a prestigious image. A grave silence fell before the tent as the healer, Marshal Huguet, and Sir Pecha were left frozen before Faithlen. Hesitating the disheartening news. Herring point. The capital. The sacred capital. Has fallen chosen one. The healer bowed humbly her sullen face expressing the deepest sympathies for the city's fall. Where of what remains of the mages and the adventurers then? We can surely rally them to fight back. Faith Len pressed. Surely they have retreated to Calmed. My town of Clairvuite is just a day's gallop from the capital at Calmed. They could use the forests and the hills too. No, no. No more college. No more guild. No more Clairvuite too. Hubert croaked. Because. Of. Of Bua, the marshal raised his hands to mimic a gigantic implosion, at a loss of words of what he had seen. Fireballs. They destroyed everything. I dot we. We have to link up what with the Northern Legions. We have to let them know that I am alive and that we can still defeat the other worlders. Tears trickled onto Faith Len's eyes, still clinging on to hope beneath all of this apocalyptic narration. As long as Slay each an empire has an army in Sainagrad's holy soil, then there is still a sliver of hope that the empire can stem this tide. I can help them fight. No, no, don't say their name. Huguet yelled, his eyes bloodshot in a concoction of anger and grief. What has gotten into you, Marshal? Faith Len beseeched him. It's there is no more Northern Legion too, the healer muttered. Pardon? Chosen one knocked. We are the Northern Legion now boy. Huguet wailed as he fell down onto what room remained on Faith Len's cot. Everyone that isn't us is either dead or captured. The Northern Legion. After Emperor Alden sailed off to Alfilnora. The marshal ordered them to hold off the demons to cover our retreat from Marv's to buy time for Prince Valorian's elves to land on Marv's port so that we may combine our strengths, Petra explained. However, the other world has descended upon us like lightning before the elves could arrive to reinforce. Many legionnaires died at the Battle of Marv's from the other. Nay, it was a massacre I tell you, the marshal yelled as he buried his face. My men, my men. They all died for so little. So. Nothing. This cannot be. Faith Len sank, smashing his fist onto the cot. All of the empire was now in flames, its people scattered, enslaved or dead. The fury of the demons knew no quarter by the air of despair that fell upon those slay agents that remained free. The legacy of glory order and honor of the empire crushed to dust, the songs of the mythical founder, called Elstla A. Ejak who held up his enchanted sword, can rifle, against the demonic tide shall all be for naught. The sword Faith Len muttered, your arms are by my tent Sir Garm Hayek if you ask. I had K. Petra answered, no, the sword, we must find the sword of called Elstla A. Ejak. If it can slay demons in a single stroke then it can surely help us defeat them again. Faith Len grasped for what embers of hope remained. That is absurd. You want to chase a myth at a time like this? Petra protested. I am willing to chase anything if it means we will not be wiped out by the demons. Marshal Huguet emerged from his lamentations. Then where do you think we can begin finding the sword then? Caldell had it with him when he disappeared. Petra asked Garner's wall for a start if anything could give us a lead. There is also the Inquisition too. They managed to rescue much of the sacred artifacts from the cathedral for themselves such as Caldell's final will. What is left of Imar at calm to assisting with the duchy's evacuation? Huguet answered, the Crowmaster. Mita was left behind there as to help root out any disorder brought forth by the evacuation. Disorder? Faith Len asked. There were rumors that some of the duchy's citizens are in the midst of conspiring with the other worlders. Huguet reported. Once more Faith Len smashed his fist. Not only are they beset by enemies from the other world, but also enemies from within. It was one to fight an enemy under a clear adversarial banner. But what if the enemy masqueraded as one of your own? Such treachery is unforgiving, unprincipled, and oh so unholy. 
anyone who bows their souls to the demons shall be punished. This I swear vengeance of all of the fallen onto the bane chosen one bowed. His voice echoed above the destitute campsite for all souls to over the frigid northern territories as the world slowly engulfs into flames around them. Chapter 59 The Gold Arrow Express A Gleesian vampire? His loving wife and child carried along a roll of cloth. An assorted fair filled into a wicker basket and a few sunray protecting enchantments on a clear cloudless day for today they shall have a family outing. Such an occasion was typically reserved for the summer season but this humid autumn day was a most unexpected occasion. They set up their little picnic cloth upon a flat grassy field as they brought out maslin bread, cheeses, ale, nuts, butter potted meat spreads and dried berries. Wife gently tethered their wild-hearted offspring from running off as she juggled bring out the food with her husband. Once the meals were brought out, the husband brought out one final piece to accompany this special day, a single telescope that he extended out its length that he may see the special occasions show and pass the device along to his family when they wanted to take a look. Typically, such a seeing-eye device only had several niche purposes from seafaring sailors looking to spot places of interests from afar, legionary commanders wanting to peer across the battlefield and astronomers who seek to read the portents that weaved above the heavens, yet as the vampire amusingly discovered, can be used to surveil any eventful happenings from a distance without the observed noticing. Accompanying them were fellow vampires, on their everyday gather clothing as they gathered upon the outskirts of the Duchy of Kant's capital, the city of Kaloban, specifically. The Battle of Kaloban. Armwill, can you pass the Haberfant cheese? The dame requested softly. The husband obliged. He turned around to the sizable cut coagulated dairy. The pale golden cheese was hard at first to the touch thanks to its preservation method of placing the whey into a special skin sack to allow fermentation and solidification to occur. However, upon consumption, the cheese mellows its rigid structure to a gum-like melt. Made by the domesticated bovine known as the Haberfant, a rotund quadrupedal mammalian with features similar to rhinoceros and cows that favor the grassy plains habitat of which the duchy being the ideal place to raise their herds on. It is used both as a beast of burden and as a source of food for the natives of continental Senegrad for centuries. They may be hardy creatures but the recent volcanic eruption of the Estlerox that only now had been swept away had tested their famed resiliency. Some died of respiratory complications whilst others starved due to the inedible grass the ashes had tainted. Before Operation Haymaker, the species was about to return to their normal grazing patterns before the Federation had arrived into their pastures. Most of the ranchers had already fled in the panic. Yet a few stubbornly stayed with their herds all over calmed. After passing the cheese, the husband grabbed his telescope and began to peer over to the horizon. Already, he could see the strange yet great iron beasts advance towards Caloban. Such an ending number of those otherworldly monstrosities bore feet made like the wheels of a cart yet their bodies of like an armored war steed galloping into battle. His family, mostly his curious son took turns looking through the magnifying glass of the telescope as they continued to observe from several hundred meters away. As the battle progressed, the iron beasts began, for lack of a tactful means of describing, excreting out soldiers in green clothing from behind their bottoms. These rifle men as Sister Iris described to them formed the core of the other world as alien powers. The iron beast had a sizable drunk similar to the length of a habifence that sprung itself to life as it adjusted its direction towards the city. The beast let out a blaring roar as it let loose pellets upon pellets of 20 mm rounds across the field towards two of Caloban's city walls. Within a blink of an eye, the southern barbican of Caloban's walls were pulverized into dust as the other worlders' soldiers broke through the gate like a flood. Those vampires who bared witness the theatrical carnage were left with their hearts beaten fitfully. To those who were on the fence of the other world a question or had a marginally chosen to choose nay over approving of their offer back at the time they were now convinced of the Federation's power after sipping a taste of this explosive demonstration.
not even their bravest of radicals would dare commit such an act of vandalism against the duchy's walls, let alone be capable of destroying it so utterly and yet so quickly. Such is their first course demonstration of these strange otherworlders that Sister Iris had introduced to them. A divine-like power she now possesses over if not higher to her still above them. Dash. Ash. Smoke and the marching noise of youth dreads filled Culloban as the seven ringed flower flew triumphantly atop of the city's tallest building, the bell tower. The battle, to say the least, was uneventful. The defense of the walled city collapsed like a house of cards as soon as the Arabian APC's chain guns laid down their 20 mm machine gun fire under Culloban's battlements. The 23rd Infantry Battalion poured through the destroyed gates securing the city of the Federation. What paltry remains the city garrison had during the fighting had either surrendered or were crushed beneath all of the rumble. Population-wise, about two-thirds of the city's burghers had fled thanks to reports from the enclave of vampires that live nearby, making Culloban virtually empty for the 23rd a forward operations base. The first of its kind outside of New Ogonia has now been established in Count where operations within this section of the Northern Theatre can be dispatched from. This timely development was much to the often underappreciated supply chain's relief. The so-called Gold Arrow Express as referred by the 23 RD's logisticians was a series of roadways used by the youth to push the needed supplies the armed forces needed to keep up the fight against the SLA agents the further they pushed inland. The Gold Arrow part of the name comes from the Vestigial Empire's road signs that were painted a bright yellow across junctions to designate the direction of what settlements come ahead the mostly dirt roads and even fewer stone roads of the Empire, as analyzed further by Major Holyfield weren't designed to accommodate the volume of two-way traffic the army logisticians are used to working on. As Ark in turn, created a one-way and constantly updating round-trip route given to each individual driver army supply trucks. The express route starts from main youth supply depot of New Argonia all the way to wherever the front lines were. More than a dozen tons of supplies for the youth soldiers were pushed through the rural lands of Sanigrad every day. The recent capture of Culloban now allows the city to be refurbished into a motor pool and secondary supply depot that bolster the volume of supply the Gold Arrow Express can deliver. As the 23rd basked themselves upon their victory, another mission group of brave soldiers galloped past them during their noontime luncheon of MREs and Grubby Chow. The city was quiet devoid of life except the fearful whimper of the remnant citizenry of the city as Stider Group's land cruiser sped through the city streets. Following Iris' directions, the Mrap arrived in front of an opulently colored building. In contrast to the symmetrical and unpainted houses that made up Culloban's architecture, the sprouted flower, much as its namesake, is a vividly tangerine-hued building decorated with crudely painted rainbow bouquet in full bloom. As Samantha and Iris entered its spell lace door, they were greeted, or more accurately, aroused with purposely selected perfumes and spices. Across the first chamber were soft bottomed sofas, chairs, and beds with paper folding screens cordoning off sections for privacy's sake. The establishment was quiet, despite its size. Having seen way more productive days, Samantha's heart fluttered red when she realizes what kind of services the sprouted flower offered. How may I be of service at trying times such as? A raven-haired young woman sultrily greeted as she sprang forth above the foyer's stairs to welcome the new arrivals. A couple of working girls were also awoken by the new guests and came to observe them. Her face shifted from forced smile to genuine surprise when she saw only Iris and Samantha standing atop of the carpeted floor by the entrance. The mistress was adorned in a skin-revealing garment that exposed her belly and left little to the imagination of those peoples who seek her companionship. It was equally complimenting that her angled face, panther-like eyes and delicate lips could reel the hearts of any creature she gazed upon, male or female alike. However. Her night-shaded hair was slightly disheveled, brushed roughly to an unladylike presentation. Even some of the other working girls were of a subber distinction for supposedly a flowery establishment. Likely from the fighting that had occurred outside earlier had gotten every one of them nervous and shaken. Lillian, it's me, Iris, 
the vampire which greeted her friend. How were you, Iris? Lillian gulped. Iris. She dashed down the stairs as she swiftly and affectionately latched onto the witch's hand. It had been so long. I thought I would have to flee the city before you came. Then I heard fighting by the walls and saw the guards getting massacred by those iron beasts. Green men and and those dragons whose wings were like drums. Me and the girls were terrified. Lillian shivered. It is okay now. Everything is okay. The fighting is over. Iris reassured her. Well, you're not the first person who called us that. Samantha smiled. Wait. You brought one of them here? Lillian's eyes widened. You're one of them, aren't you? The other worlders? She interrogated the captain. Samantha nodded, confirming her question. You must be Samantha, from the letters Iris wrote of. She reverted back to her artificial smile once again. I, I know your people are looking for some entertainment after all of this. But me and my girls aren't, aren't in the mood right now after all of what happened today. Can you tell your soldiers, demons? or whatever you call them that they can come back tomorrow? She blushed fearfully. You know. We don't have time for tomorrow I am afraid. Samantha dissuaded. Fine then. Just. Just make it quick. She shuddered, tugging her bawdy garments with her fingers. We are just here to ask you some questions. The captain raised. What do you mean? Lillian was about to pull away the light garments that covered her round bottom facing the too much to the alarm of Iris and the captain. Lillian. What are you doing? Iris yelled. I know you are a bit of a free nymph but this is too much from you. The victors come the spoils. I am no fighter Iris. You know that. She whimpered. I. I will scream as loud as you want. Just don't hurt any of my girls. Wait. No, Samantha yelled, realizing what the mistress meant. We do not do that, she cried. You do not? Lillian rose back up, revising herself. Those men are not going to despoil dot us? She pointed to the men standing outside of the door. No, both Iris and Samantha exclaimed in unison. Besides, that one over there, you see him? Only I am allowed to ravage him. Iris pointed to Cain. A hint of pride seeped from her tongue. Iris, female or I do. I didn't know that you had it in you. Lillian squealed. And I thought I have to use the last of my healing balm from the herbalist now that he left. One of the dollish girls upstairs sighed in relief. So, you said you wanted to ask me some questions? How about you and your our party from outside come to the main hall so we can talk? The girls can still entertain all of you. Well not in the way I thought. Lillian invited Strider inside both her establishment and home. That sounds so much better. Samantha smiled. Just tell your girls to stay away from Diaz. She warned. Gesturing them over, Samantha invited the rest of Strider into the sprouted flower. Diaz, with an anonymously hooded alia throw by his side, and Clay easily settled themselves in. Mesmerized by the wide variety titillating sensations that permeated the building, Crocker maintained his stoic professionalism amidst the sight of a handful of prostitutes that ogled his physique whilst Cairn was tugged against his will along with Iris as she introduced him to Lillian. I have heard so many things about your nightman, Lillian giggled, his skin color quite exotic, she commented. Yeah, very much. Cairn awkwardly smiled trying not to crumble beneath all of the mistress flattery nor offend the host, he knows that beneath all of their sight, it was childlike curiosity rather than bigotry that drove the attention he received from most liaisons of his ebony skin, ultimately innocent if naive, tell me more about yourself Lillian, what is your story, Samantha asked, as she was poured the kind glass of water onto her canteen to refresh herself. I am the head mistress of the sprouted flower. I used my charms and wiles to grasp the hearts of everyone that seeked my companionship. The last proprietress of this establishment saw my way of words that I became the brightest flower. Men. And even a few women traveled near and far just to see my face. I always had a way of getting my clients to tell me their deepest desires. I believe you would call it, illusion magics. She brushed along Samantha's ears, lightly breathing into her drums with venereal temptations. When she passed, 
the rains fell upon me for the well-being of the flower and those who work within its walls. I, I see, that's actually pretty clever to be honest. Samantha blushed, it was quite a sight for. Oh, don't worry, this is my true form, but I can do much more if you so have such desires that you wish to speak about to me. I can take you upstairs and show you an appetizer of what I can do. I tend to keep my show beneath closed doors. She winked flirtatiously much to the slowly lust-hearted captain's jittering. Her instincts beneath all of her years working in the flesh trade can attest to it. I can even let you pay with something much more precious than silly gold. Her fingers danced alluringly closer to Samantha's hips. B but alas. The captain regained her cool. I am afraid I am here on official business. Well, I can see why. If you and your men not going to enjoy the company of my fellow sisters then I can only conclude that it is information you are after. Lillian nodded. Tell me what you wish to know, but be warned. I will state my price before I loosen my tongue. She haughtily averted her gaze. We need to find Ratama. Rancid Ratama. Iris asked. Ratama? I will tell that one for free. Lillian's eyes widened, quite an odd request, but not my strangest. Normally Rancid Ratama doesn't like anyone disturbing his mad mumblings unless it was important. Why do you look for him? There is a council vote going on and they lack his vote before they come up to a decision. It's very important to all of us. Iris explained. I see. What is the vote all about to be exact sister? The mistress asked. It is regarding about being able to no longer have to worry about hiding any more sister. The other worlders are offering us sanctuary if we follow them. But some of the elders are too reluctant to agree to their terms. You can see now that they are good folks since well. They aren't sacking the town like any conquering army would have. Iris summarized. Oh, I can see why. You're just like your father again Iris. Always pushing forward and casting the die. Lillian giggled, they do pique my curiosity a little bit dot but even then, I too am not so sure myself of who these other worlders really are. She eyed over Samantha and the rest of Strider group who settled themselves quite comfortably inside the raunchy room. Do you know where Atom is at least? We need to find him for the council vote to conclude. Captain Rose pushed the conversation forward, the time for small talk can be done for later. No, but one of my girls do. Lillian answered. One of your girls? Explain. Samantha pressed the mistress. Well, you see, Ratama only shows interest to only one of my girls, pays many ducats just to have Meshul for himself. Quite curious really, Lillian explained. Curious how? Samantha asked. Mesh is a fairly unremarkable compared to the rest of the girls here, Lillian said, but nonetheless. She interacts with Ratima more than anyone else outside of me and mother. Even then, I rarely get to talk much outside of him asking me where is Mesh? Where will the Mesh be right now? Is she here? Samantha asked. No. She has been staying put at her home village of Igni for the past few weeks. To be honest, I grow rather concerned for her because she hasn't reported back for a long while. Lillian anxiously divulged. Looks like we got a lead now Cap. I say we go now and get this over with. Ken suggested. You do seem to know this mesh person a lot since she works for you. Maybe you want to come along with us? You're a local after all. If it means we can find both her and Ratama. Then I accept. Just let me dress up to something more. Comfortable for travel. Lillian agreed. Oh please stay for a while handsome. I might actually toss a coin to you just to look at your obsidian face. One of the girls begged coyly. Stay back. He is mine alone. Iris pushed the beguiling seductress aside greedily. Oh man. I was about to teach Ailey what a foursome is. Diaz sulked, leaving behind the sultry temptress who he was charming. Well I am glad we're out to ear. Girls are starting to stare aim. Crocker shaken his throat exhaustively. Dash. The crow master ticked her head as she finished wiping off the last specks of dust on her hair after barely surviving the barrage of invisible magics from the invaders when she was discussing the last bits of the plan to evacuate the last batch of people of the city. She was dispatched by the acting leaders of the inquisitorial remnant to secure and oversee the evacuation of Culloban's large granaries. 
They managed to fill several dozen or so feet high of precious wheat during the harvest before the volcano struck. Now they must secure what precious food they have left to be used for the last safe bastion of the empire that is Ghana's walls. The attack on Culloban could have happened any time sooner, but alas the tenacity of the other world as knows no earthly bounds. Her assignment of shadowing the duchy's task of organizing the retreat of its own people and food stocks had struck several difficulties. The stubborn peasantry had to be put down and made examples of by the combined remnants of the Imperial Legion, the Ducal Guards and the Inquisition members. The farming peasantry were apprehensive to relinquish their meager yields to the cause, some even giving up in despair seeing that the fall of the capital to be the writing on the wall that all is lost. Not helping matters is that there were rumors that vampiric enclaves are sabotaging the evacuation efforts by delaying the travel of much needed supplies and if the most extreme of theories are to believe, spreading a plague to raise minions to actively stifle any attempts of a chance the duchy has of fleeing to safety. That is why Mita was here that day as she weaved past the other world of soldiers who began to swarm across the city. She needed to regroup with the Inquisition back north and plan a means of delaying the invaders' blitzkrieg into the region otherwise all hope that Ghana's wall half could be lost. This shit. Is so easy. One of the other world soldiers lazily wailed. His stave holstered away as he talked to his partner. This war could be over before my birthday on June. Mita ducked down behind some wooden barrels as she overheard a couple of patrolling other worlders passing by the alley she took. She can still easily understand their thoughts and languages thanks to an enchantment that she embedded unto herself to comprehend the invaders in her line of work. To fight the enemy, one must know the enemy first. Damn show that new intel that the big wigs from command they got from Herring Point is on point. His more alert partner nodded. The crow master shook with distraught, she silently cursed herself that the defenders of the imperial capital before it had fallen had failed to destroy all the important items that the emperor was forced to leave behind. How did we know Kant is about to have all of them grains being evoked though exactly? I hear command must have a mountain of some good tell after the capital. The laid-back patrolman asked. Mita listened carefully to his words. This command is likely some sort of high-ranking general or perhaps the main demon leading, at the very least this invasion into the Empire's breadbasket. I actually learned it from a guy who knows a guy who knows that creepy-ass bureau dude who shot up the Adventurer's Guild place. The focused soldier raised, says it came from the College of Magic off of this scandal flukin guy named Owen. Sang a leak so big that it's practically flooding with dids back upstairs. Retreating points, instructions, anything about what they gonna do when they flee up north. Glad we popped that so new garbage to the floor. Who knows what he could have done with all the wizard bullshit he sparks out to his hands. The lazy one chuckled. Oh. That's not even the crazy shit of the story from my man. His patrol partner wildly waved his arm to interject. They didn't pop his ass. The black ops teams found him dead. Officially it's suicide, he explained. Guess we must had caught him in a corner and took the easy way out. The drowsy soldier snickered. Not so bro. I heard he offed himself because some talking artifact in that big temple place told him to. Or something. I don't know. My friend said he got the censored version of the report. It's probably some more crazy bullshit the nerds back at base are wanking themselves over the fun stuff. His counterpart answered. First magic, then dragons now talking stuff. Where the fuck are the hot fantasy girls now? The laggard stuck his tongue out teasingly. The two soldiers shared a light applause in that moment as Mita hunkered down at her hiding spot yet deep down, she knew exactly what those soldiers were talking about. The crow master became lost in a fog of distraught. Not only Grand Master Owen is dead but he had spilled valuable information to help the demons in their nefarious cause in the last moment of his life. Even more shocking is that the reason for him for doing that was caused by the Crystal Heart and that the other worlders have possession of it. It is likely Crystal Heart may have been corrupted by the demons to make Grandmaster to turn against his people or worst, amplify the powers of their own corrupted chosen one, Samantha the shareholder. A loud rumbling sound approached the guards, snapping Meter back into reality. Captain Rose, 
the mindful patrolman saluted, his partner following suit. Peering over the window of the alien cart, Mita could not mistake the visage that appeared before her. The Ranu put to herself. She could not forget those leaf-colored eyes, scarly hair nor her youthful face. Hey which gate is cleared for me to get out of the city of? Samantha asked the soldiers. It's the western gate. Just turn your cruiser around by the corner up ahead and just follow the road until you see some stables. Captain Rose, the cognizant sentry answered. Where are you headed? To a village called Igni. We need to find a vampire who lives there for something important. Samantha explained. I hope those vampires are willing to join us. All practicality aside. I always wanted to have girlfriend with sharp fangs and wings. The slacker jokingly states. He was then received an immediate jab from his fellow soldier, but I am afraid of heights, a voice echoed from the back of the truck. Wait there's one in the back? The slacker asked. Only to again be struck by his more professional partner, don't waste their time, he said to him. Well good luck on your trip then Captain Rose. Twelfth platoon should be nearby to assist you so don't be afraid to call them once you get a brief of the situation down there. I heard there's a big camp of sorts not too far away so check it out. The soldier saluted. Samantha retreated back inside the self-driving cart as the iron beast sped past the soldiers who then promptly walked away at the opposite direction leaving Meter to emerge safely from her hiding spot. This must be, despite her agnosticism from the Pantheon. A blessing from the gods as the crow master put it. The corrupted chosen one is going to be moving away towards an easily isolatable area with a minimal team of demons to protect her. Igni is about a day's walk from Kaloban but her training of controlled sprints or if possible, she can find a steed. Meter can cut down her arrival time at most in half. Assuming Samantha stays within that ranching village she could easily assemble the last reserves of her crows still under her banner to assist her in capturing the shareholder. That way they could free her and unlock more answers of what she knows of the Crystal Heart and Owen's apparent betrayal. Her previous encounters, both of her own and accounts from her peers gave the crow mast no room to allow for such trifling things such as leniency. Samantha will not go out quietly now and she will not ever. The crow's strike has to be perfect, there was no time to waste right now, Meter tailed Samantha's cart, using her enchanted cloak to shadow its gallop as they both made their way out of the fallen city. The crow master also had to juggle herself to throw a message spell back to her superiors for a request of resources. A mix of sedatives, people and a few swords in case they have to fight their way out. Dash. The ocean's waves quavered the wood of the Earth Island galleons as weary sailors and warriors endured the biting chill of northern Sanigrad. Attrition had taken hold of Prince Valorian of the Royal House of Lytha and his military expedition, from food shortages. The hostile elements, coastal raids and mental strain tested the will of the elven soldiers. Many of the brave sons and daughters of Earth Island grew restless after many sudden promises of touching down upon land only to be cruelly abrogated by the grimly changing front of the situation on the human continent. The ever-changing dynamics from their slay Aegean counterparts was hard to keep up with Valorian and his lieutenants. They were originally supposed to land on the port city of Marv's north of the imperial capital to rendezvous with the remnants of the Stla Aegean Legion, but just before they could make landfall, they had received news that the city and thus their landing point had fallen, attempting to salvage the situation. The boats changed course northward to a secondary landing point, which also became compromised by the terrifying speed of the demonic advance. They tried again and again, being slowly harassed by the otherworlders' magics such as fireballs and wyvern attacks that seemed to cut away from their strength bit by bit before they could muster their defenses, which was meager to say the least when your army is cooped upon an armada designed for carrier space than naval combat. Over a third of Valorian's initial expedition had succumbed to the attrition of the long sail northwards. Many sacrifices had to be made to ensure the overall well-being of the soldiers. Many of the knights reluctantly had to butcher their steeds to make meats that would extend the food supply for several days whilst the leather is used to mend the sails of the ships that became worn out by the slicing gales that northern Anagrad was infamous for. Some of their own war supplies, 
especially if wood were used for kindling to keep the soldiers warm, but even that wasn't enough to fully stave off the frigid chill, much of the enthusiasm that the elves had in fighting the demons were tempered to mere survival for their bodies and sanity, yet when it comes to prudence, none were so as besieged as the commander of the expedition himself, Prince Valorian, despite his grand titles, acumen and achievements, he is still just as vulnerable to the attrition of his soul like every one of his troops. Thantros, Dahodor, Silridiel, all of you. He buried his face to hide the lamenting tears that fell underneath his as you rise. Those were the names of several of his men, some he had known since childhood, others from his days of tutelage in the academy that had perished tragically in this journey. He could see their ghosts surrounding his room crying to him, to avenge them all but all paled in comparison to the wails of one imaginative figure Valorian overheard in his visions. Aliathra, I will avenge you. Valorian beat his chest, remembering his cardinal impetus for undertaking this crusade in the first place. The young general cursed himself that he is being anguished inside this damned piece of wood whilst his sister's murderers ran free to taint Sainagrad with impunity, striking the ship's hull with his fist. At first, the visions were just the dying calls of his late little sister, but the further the elven prince journeyed on his expedition, more ghosts, those of his followers and friends appeared before him to haunt his every waking hour. Even in the embrace of his in his cabin, the same bloodied phantasms begged for him to avenge them. He remembered that day, when his armada was beset by his own eyes, far from the skies that struck down like lighting upon several of his galleons causing to be set ablaze before the cold blue sea devoured its wooden corpse. Summoned forth by steel wyverns of wings that could challenge the swiftness of dragons, they spat mocking power words of lethal rain upon his men who fought in vain to challenge them. Some of his own men could share into his hallucinations, speaking of banshees and sirens asking of them to turn back you will perish from their righteous crusade which slowly eroded several of the elves' resolves. He didn't know if it was either the gods protecting him or the dark forces mocking him at every turn that he managed to survive such attacks until now. Just as he was about to succumb to his tribulation, two soft knocks interrupted his solitude. My prince, we have found land. The voice of one of his soldiers spoke, Land? The mere thought of solid ground, away from all of these debilitating days at sea was a ray of hope to the elven leader. He emerged from his cabin and followed his subordinate atop of his galleon where the captain and the navigator of his ship stood idly by to await him. My lord we have found a small shore that we can disembark some of our men to forage for much needed supplies, the captain said. It has been about a week since we were last attacked and I must do say with confidence that we are likely past the worst of our journey over the sea. The elven crown prince looked over by the navigator's telescope to survey the land. The shore was rocky if not somewhat challenging for a boat to land. Beyond the rocky beach, is a plain large enough to disembark his soldiers but at the risk of overbearing the battered galleons to its physical limits if they wish to chance upon a landing. Yet ultimately, the land was empty. A flexible and patient enough armada such as him could theoretically perform a gradual landing with what the table had in play. Where exactly are we now? Valorian asked. Last night's stars say that we are likely several dozen miles or so away from Ghana's wall Prince Valorian, making the rocky shore of the Dosan tribe's territory. If we hurry to the human fortress, we should be able to have warm beds and meals before the week passes. The navigator answered. We should follow the captain's advice and just have several of our rangers. Nay, we land our forces on Zanigrad today, the prince ordered. He was tired of sitting idle as the demons swallowed the land in their tainted crusade. His armies must march to meet them head on less all of Zanagrad will be lost. I fear it may be a risk to land here I am afraid my prince. The rocks may not be treacherous but we will likely damage our ships if we attempt to land our forces ashore now. The captain advised, but if we don't land now. Who knows what will happen to us? Valorian argued. Our maps say all that's beyond Ghana's wall is nothing but ice. If we don't land our forces now then by the gods we have failed in our mission. By our inaction, 
He pressed. His men were being stretched to the breaking point being cramped inside their roughened ships. The Dawson lands feature ample opportunities for replenishment and resupply with wood to keep them war and wild mushrooms and game to eat. It will take a day to forage such items for the journey ahead but their chances of having an ample force to arrive of any value to Ghana's wall is greater on the frigid northern lands of the beast folk than it is to canker inside their ships. Have all of the ships ready for a rough landing at the double, we will disembark ship by ship so be careful. I want to see every soldier that could still stand on their legs to touch land today. Valoria ordered. The captain was no fool to disobey the crown prince. Reluctantly he bowed, walking towards his horn, and with a mighty gust from his breath, its howl echoed across the elven armada. As each galleon heard its bellowing echo across the northern fjords, a spark of fire erupted amongst the weary crew. A second wind drove the sailors and soldiers to arise from their sloughs. The seafarers tossed their anchors, tied their sails whilst the soldiers buckled their weapons and armor as the first Death Island forces finally touched down upon Senegrad. Mages assisted the disembarkation by hovering their supplies by the beach whilst their menagerie of mystical monsters assisted in the ferrying of the soldiers from ship to land. The process was meticulous if not without several mistakes made along the way. The elves, boat my boat poured into that small rocky beach with such enthusiasm that some crashed accidentally across the rough rocks ashore. Some were so excited to touch land that they swam a challenging distance across. Several injuries and fatalities had occurred during the landing in addition to critical damages by their beaten galleons but chiefly, over 100 surviving galleons of the elven armada. Of each contained 500 elven warriors were now deployed onto the cold rocky beach below the grey covered sky equaling a 50,000 strong army. Mounting atop of his beloved steed, the horned Dale Dasher Bethrel, he cantered off to the front of his gathering army of the best of the best the Ethylon elves have to offer. Rainbow helms, some dismounted, raised their great swords and lay ives at the ready. Sword singers and war dancers bowed at the ready equipped with their spell woven weapons were as resplendent and as beautiful as their names presented, phoenix knights led their lances ablaze atop of their glitters and mounts, elven forest rangers carrying their beautiful enchanted bows by their breasts formed the sharpest tip of the spear, warrior elite of the Eth Island army. At its core, Valorian could count on the strength of both the mountains and the downpour of rainfall. The front line consisted of an impenetrable line of pike and shield-wielding Silothian guards whose white plumes unfurled like a rising bird across the cold winds. Counting behind them were their skirmishing counterparts. The Alushtashi archers equipped with longbows as large as their entire bodies readying to unleash a hail of arrows unto their foes. Always appreciating a vanguard of cavalry to complement his infantry, the elves had also deployed their glade hearth knights who, Although lighter armed than their phoenix-ranked brethren were just as swift-footed and bold in their charges. At last, to put the elven gift to be wrapped into a bow as a present of aid to the Slaegians were their mystical beasts. A cadre of great eagles, some ridden by the most accomplished forest rangers and knights being led by the helm of a mighty sun dragon whose auric head bears the second most important follower of Valorian's army. The Archmage Selly and the graceful hammer of potent if not nigh godlike magecraft. The royal prince looked on to his army and smiled proudly at his brave followers who locked their gaze onto their leader with devotion burned into their hearts for the cause. Brothers and sisters of Alphalnora, Valorian yelled forth, Bethrel dashing across his army as he spoke, It has been a treacherous journey from our homelands to the lands Sanigrad. We had faced trials of starvation pain and death but we have so far prevailed against them. Brought forth likely by the demon lord's attempts to stop our advance before we could meet him in fair battle. His soldiers cheered in unison. Spirits lifted that they had survived the journey so far. We mourn for our lost dead and we shall avenge soul the demons had taken from us with ten more of theirs. Valorian vowed. It is time once again. For the brave sons and daughters of Alphalnora to protect the world once again from the forces of darkness. We had aided, guided, and lifted the many peoples of Zanigrad as the one true shepherds of Gleesia, as bestowed by our gods. 
Now they ask for our aid once again. We shall show all of the world what our ancestors had accomplished many centuries ago. To beat back the darkness and restore the light of order unto Gleesia. His soldiers once again cheered, united in purpose and passion. By Valorian's inspiring words, the warriors raised their weapons to salute their commander as he passed over all of them. Valorian each looked onto their eyes back, reinstilling his commitment to his mission. He rallied to his cavalry bodyguards by the army's right wings and together, the forces of Ethylon marched to meet the demonic tide. Sister of mine, I shall avenge you, he whispered beneath his breath. Dash. It was quite idyllic, if not haunting for Strider group when they slowed themselves down to absorb the calmed countryside. If one ignored the looming air of war on the horizon, there was a unique purity beneath all of Gleesia's archaicism. The fantastic fields of the duchy reminded Samantha of a time beneath Earth's own history free, a vivid looking class of a time free of mega corporations, big governments and indentured poverty of the Federation worlds. The irrigation canals creaked down comfortably on her right whilst the autumn winds brushed soothing along the blades of chestnut colored grass that the local livestock raised upon by her left as her party journeyed by the loam paved road towards Zigni. It was easy to get distracted beneath all of this fey-flavored scenery. I hope this mesh friend is a digny. Your duke is really keen on getting everyone out to here before we move in. Crocker worried. My dear mesh is a plucky lass. She knows how to handle herself and isn't afraid to live prudently if she has to. Being the daughter of a shepherd after all. She does have a thing with their fingers when they touch the skin of others. Now I remember. Lillian answered. If we find Mesh, we will find Ratma, I assure you. Samantha gritted her teeth. Now was not the time to smell the flowers. She needed to refocus back at the task at hand. We should be able to see the village just by coming over this hill. Lillian pointed out. The group pushed themselves over the terrain as they are greeted a full ambient view of the region ahead. A virile glade breathing with fields clothed in red, gold and jade as far as Strider's eyes, and binoculars could see, the village of Agni, lay before a few hundred meters below the hill. However, a closer examination revealed that the town was empty and that the populace had moved out into a makeshift refugee camp far ahead. We should definitely start at that camp over there. Samantha peered her hand above her brow. They should be able to evade suspicion by the locals as they investigate the town since news of Culloban's fall of which the road they treaded lead to the city has not yet likely reached the locals as of yet. Their gear and weapons were hidden beneath a thick destitute leather jacket they wore over themselves to anonymously blend in with the refugee hordes that now drift all over Zanigrad. The group descended down the hilltop as they landed upon the mouth of the village. In contrast to the pastoric charm the wilderness had provided, the town was seemed to drain of all life. Boarded up rooms and abandoned hovels greeted the expedition with only a handful of remnants lethargically sitting idle by. All refugees must present selves to the camp for the imperial census for rations and passage out to duchy. A townsman of Agni monotonously ushered the newcoming strider group. Excuse me. Good sir. Samantha swallowed her throat and put up her best Gleesian accent. I am looking for a... A friend who lives here, she asked. I, I know everyone in this village who you be look in fur. The townsman leaned closer, empathetically ready to help those fellows who wish to leave with their friends and families. I am looking for one named Mesh, the daughter of a shepherd. Do you know the person? Samantha asked. The townsman's helpful smile twist to a disheartened paralysis as he struggled to construct his response. H.A. Have you not heard what the heralds had squawked? said what the townsman stuttered what happened to her samantha's eyes shot with adrenaline gods protect us, dear which hunters they found her to be casting hexes and curses making dare town sick and raising the dead to kill us all while he flee from the demons the townsman wailed inquisition are about to burn her at the stake by the temple now upon hearing those words samantha fired her feet Carving a trail deep into the heart of darkness once again her squad following her. The captain will not let this potential peace with the vampires become ashes. Chapter 60
the Gleesian biohazard. Captain Rose's boots scurried in a blur through the muddy dirt roadways through the semi-derelict village as her mind raced in equal celerity. The moment she heard of Mesh's impending fate, her heart quickened as she desperately gains her bearings of the Igni village. Her squad ran, taking care not to expose themselves too much of a scene amongst the evacuating villagers as they chased after her. The village was a mess of carts, boxes, and oaken barrels that littered the supplies of personal belongings of a village of over fifty tenant farmers making the muddy paths a labyrinth. After a brief tussle of dodging hurried villagers, grunting porters, and stray livestock, Strider finds themselves within the village center. A large circle with a stone temple of the Gleesian pantheon easily skyscraping the highest point in the settlement. A crowd gathered before a wooden stage where a man in heavy armor and wearing a purple hat carried with him a lengthy scroll of paper that he read out its content from face level all the way down to his feet. Behind him was a wayfish lady, tied to a pole of cut lumber her feet mired in animal fat, twine, and small kindling sticks. Several religious clerics waved holy symbols of the Gleesian pantheon onto the condemned woman as they chanted hymns and prayers onto her as she wailed all the louder the more they progressed. It was as if she was not only damned in her mortal form but damned forever in the soul. By mandate of the Duke of Kant and the High Ecclesiarchith in the Fourth, we have gathered here today to address a crime most foul and to lose hammer smiting down upon the wicked trespasser. For whatever crime is greater than treason, the man declared to a jeering crowd, jeering not at him but at the woman behind him, may his all-smiting hammer purify the tainted soul of this vile witch who has sowed discord and death unto her own neighbors, may she forever howl amongst the echoless chasm of the slough of Tivna's garden for all times and beyond, that woman. That is Mesh, Lillian cried out, those plumb toppers of the Inquisition are going to burn her. If they have mesh, they could also have Ratima too. Iris followed in her distress. What do we do now? A bee dire sweat fell off of his brow. There's a lot of peeps all over us right now. Kick in the door and will be unwise. Crocker shook his jaw as he peered over his surroundings. God damn it. And if we don't, we will lose our only shot in finding Ratima. Samantha cursed. The time for her to think was again very short every second flowing down upon her as patience, tactics, and forethought was discarded for immediacy. She was going to regret this decision. Samantha concentrated her mind once again for a spell, charging the arcane meridians on her Hecate suit as she formed a great big ball of water. The created water bubbled in size as the Inquisition ignited his torch before proceeding menacingly to a quavering mesh who tried in vain to break free from her tight bonds. The flames soon encapsulated its kindling, devouring it all to grow in its infernal strength as their tongues licked the ragged grey cloth of mesh. She screamed, cried in pain as she could feel her skin crisp under the fire's kisses. She wanted to howl in agony once again, but as the waif was about to open her mouth, she suddenly felt a heavy cold breeze lay past her. It felt like the spring water used for the baths back at the sprouted flower. Opening her eyes, Mesh looked around her to see that the fire below her feet were quenched, the ashes of the flame, its cold corpse laying on where the kindling was placed, and she too was equally soaked in water, the autumn air soothing away her semi-broiled body. She unholstered her FBR-20, unveiling it from her tunic and raised its barrel to the air, firing three warning shots that echoed thunderously across the village. Those three shots caused the villagers to scatter in disarray with only a few iron hearts and those of the Inquisition left standing with their sweat poured faces drawing their weapons in a fearful frenzy. Who dares interrupt this execution? One of the purple hat inquisitors growled as he drew his rapier. You got three counts to drop your weapons and give us the girl. Samantha unveiled herself alongside with Strider who readied themselves, magic and guns alike for battle. Why, you, you're the shareholder, aren't you? He recognized Samantha from the numerous reports, or more exactly horror stories being accounted to him by those who spoke of her many terrifying talents. You demons seek to rescue this witch? That only makes you and her even more guilty of the highest of heresies, he scowled. I am getting so tired of hearing this. Samantha grated, 
she just wants to shoot them all and be done with it but alas, the rules of engagement says she is only cleared to attack if she is being set upon by the now scattered Gleesian natives. 1. She began her countdown. I rather die on my feet than live on my knees demon. Kill there. The Inquisitor didn't have time to completely blare his orders to his men before Samantha fired her bullpup with a clean headshot through his purple hat. Get Mesh out of there, the captain ordered. The Inquisitors and their escort of Jekyll guards charged forth towards Samantha and her squad readying both their blades and spells. Crocker, Clay, and Aliathra were on crowd control using their fully automatic and rapid firing weapons to pin down the charging natives. They ducked for cover seeing that ordinary obstructions could shield them, if partially, from the invader's wrath. This gave Diaz the opportunity he needed to rush towards Mesh's pyre and cut her loose from her bindings with a slash of his Actocolite katana. The battle for Igni village soon escalated to a chaotic firefight as Strider stormed the Jekyll inquisitorial positions with hailstorms of spell and bullets leaving a maelstrom that is easy to be lost beneath its lethal gales. Silence. He casted an arcane curse to them just as Aris and Lillian were about to react. One such inquisitor, a mage of senior distinction, began to cast several enchanted hexes in quick succession towards the vampires of whom he caught isolated behind their demonic allies. Both vampires began to feel a searing heat burn from within their bellies as the opposing life forces of their bodies began to turn violently. Their negative flow reacted to the anathema of the inquisitorial mage's positive flow with acidic consequence, as long as that mage grappled them with his magics. The two couldn't even scream for help as the battle raged on around them. I smite you down vampire whores, the curse-bearing inquisitor brought up his enchanted knife a blade searing with holy magics onto its form readying to finish the two such air fill off with a cathartic lunge into their hearts. Smite this! Iris bared her fangs tipping over. She bucked her hip upwards where she kept her Aparo Astra Magnum pistol holstered on her belt. Its hollow pointed Magnum ammo tore through the Inquisitor's arm, dismembering it clean off and disrupting his holy powered hexing, freeing both Iris and Lilyuan. That was a clever little cantrip you have there. Lillian shook off the dirt on her porcelain face. Not a cantrip, just a little. Gift from a certain friend. Iris blushed as she turned over to the Inquisitor's corpse. She attempted to backspin around her new gun so she could stylishly sheath her Aparo Astro Magnum back into its pocket and impress her friend Lillian. Unfortunately, her finger slipped a few inches and the pistol came falling down clumsily onto the muddy ground. At least she kicked the safety in first otherwise she would have a verbal beating by Ken and Samantha about weapons safeties. Still haven't gotten the cowboy right. Iris shook her head, picking up her pistol once again and quietly holstering it back before huddling over to the corpse once again. Using her sharpened nails, she cut an open bleeding wound from the man's abdomen and began to sate her thirst through cups of her palms. I suggest you drink some, I believe this is going to be a long day ahead of us. The witch suggested to Lillian. The battle continues to rage on for the rest of the hour, with the native soldiers now slowly being overwhelmed by the Federation's superior firepower and close quarters tactics. They tried in vain to hide away from them within the houses only to be ratted out by Cairn and Crocker. Before long, the whole of the village of Igni, of a defender amount of 107 was defeated by a force an tithe of its number. We surrender. One of the villagers held his hands and dropped his pitchfork upon seeing the litters of death and destruction happen before his village. Their will broken. The villagers bowed before the other worlders, frozen into silence as they did not want what happened to those soldiers to happen to them and their families too. What now Cap? Cain turned to Samantha. There's like over hundreds or more civvies around us. No way we can control them all with just us. Samantha examined the aftermath. These were starving villagers. Broken down by a newfound fear yet there were many more of them than there were of Strider. They are all in likelihood might try to do something drastic against her squad if given one moment of weakness in such disproportionate conditions. 
and they weren't even equipped for settlement occupations, let alone babysitting refugees. This chick here needs some help though, Diaz reminded everyone as he carried the fading mesh in his arms. Her hair was shaved and her body was close to a ghoulish skeleton as a result of days if not weeks of abusive neglect. Shite. Get her somewhere safe. Away from these folks. Crocker clasped his fist upon seeing such anguish inflicted onto her. Get her to that church up on that hill. Ailey, he interrupts Dad. He barked. Clay gets a line over to the twelfths that we have managed to occupy a settlement east of Culloden. Samantha ordered. Occupational force and refugee care complement at the double. Carrying of mesh, the stridery group to the village center and into the empty temple. The building was situated at the top of a small hill that easily made the holy building the highest point in the village. The holy site was a humble stone monument to the Gleesian pantheon, built more as a reminder of their faith than to share the opulence of the natives' gods with wooden furnishings. In regards to a temple's sacred treasures, if judging by the humble size of the temple being very few and likely had been evacuated already before Strider Group's arrival thus allowing the Vampira Karis and Lillian to enter the premise with negligible discomfort. Setting aside the altar to be used as a makeshift medical bed, Aliathra began to cast her restoration magics onto Mesh, revitalizing her body from the brink of death. Emma, mistress? The girl turned to see her boss amongst her rescuers. Thank the gods you are okay Mesh. You are safe now. Lillian cradled her. Mistress. They, I thought I was going to die. The darkness. All of it. They even had Ratama. She groaned. Her breath quickened with each progressing word as the elf healer's hands began to treat her numerous bruises. Ratama. My cousin. Where is he? If they, had you, they would ha. Lillian asked her but she was interrupted when Mesh immediately began to wail upon hearing Ratama's name. He is dead. The beleaguered Mesh convulsed. They killed him in his own home and took me away. What do you mean he is dead? Lillian grasped Mesh's laying body, shaken into disbelief. The Inquisition killed Ratama. She trembled. Explain everything that happened to you and him. Samantha pressed. Ratama wanted me to bring home some habifant calves and a few pots of dirt from ranch that was having a plague amongst their cattle until I found his cottage being ransacked by adventurers. From the Grey Order by the looks of their badges, Mesh explained. One of them told me that I was a thrall to that Ratama but I wasn't. I did what he was told willingly. Yet they told me that he caused the plague that has befallen unto Igni. They went inside his home to eat to kill him. Do you recognize the adventurers? Lillian asked. I, I think one of them was called the Bane. Mesh stuttered. Faith Len. Samantha's ears ringed when she heard that name. Blonde hair, blue eyes? She asked. Mesh nodded, confirming her suspicions. That brat again? Iris Fangs growled. When did that all happen? Where is Ratima's cottage? Months. Maybe. Ah. Mesh grasped her bruised skull. He. He only ever shows me his cottage. You can follow the creek northeast until you see his hut. Hidden by some trees and by a large rock. She directed. But. The forest is now being used to cordon off all the infected people and animals there now. Shit. This all went to shit cap. The sergeant cursed. First we got an election referendum thingy. Now we're ought to solve a fucking pandemic. Wait. What was he doing exactly more in his cottage? When you brought him those things he asked from you. Samantha pressed again. Pieces of habifant meat. Ratama told me that he is trying to find a way to cure plague that had befallen to the habifants and several of the villagers. Mesh answered. Does that mean? Shit. I got a call. Yeah. You. Yeah captain. Code line. We need a CRBN team on the way with them. Prep for biohazards. Clay interjected as he held his radio who is on the line with the commander of the 12th Infantry. Cure? For a plague? That'll be bad for everyone. Samantha shook her head. Okudot passion? Have the Empire come with the northern reinforcements? Mesh's eyes gleamed as she turned to Strider. Samantha awkwardly coughed. Ah. That is not important right now. Can you take us to Ratima's cottage? I can show you the way but we must steer clear of the plague camps. The air is thick with their sickness. Mesh nodded. 
The twelfth is coming in about an hour ma'am. We should sit here until they arrive. Clay reported, dropping his radio back to his back. Nay, we have to get to Ratama. I, I, we cannot allow Mew my brother to. Lillian sprang up, tears in her eyes and throat choked with grief. She dashed away from Mesh straight to the door. Lillian waited not so Samantha was about to grab Mesh but she was too quick on her heels for her to catch her. Abidaya, who was standing sentinel with his rifle pointed to the temple's entrance was too slow to halt the tearfully running Lillian as she exited the holy premise. Shit, we have to get her. The captain cursed. Crocker, stay here with Diaz, Abidaya, Ailey, and Mesh. Kayan, Iris come with me, she ordered. Don't run far off now. Sarge hollered. Samantha along with the vampire witch and the combat engineer bolted past the temple's carved doors. They trailed behind the runaway vampire courtesan past the pacified village to the forest as aforementioned by Mesh. The mouth of the trail leading to the forest was packed with warning signs and damnatory cross marks that signify an evil being locked inside by the tree lion's walls. It didn't take another hundred meters for the dispatched Strider group members to encounter the creek that Lillian promptly followed northeastward. Lillian, we shouldn't be here. Let us take care of this for you. Ken pleaded. I cannot allow my brother's remains nor his home to be defiled. The vampire hysterically howled. She leapt through the decaying trees and decrepit rocks until her soft porcelain feet became tainted with the black kisses of the earth. The trees they darted past soon transitioned into a glade where a hidden cottage, just as Mesh described was situated against a large rock. Greeting them was a band of several five shapes of an uncanny fusion between Neanderthalic and ghastly that littered their warm yet scarred-filled bodies around the ransacked cottage. At first glance, they looked like savage vagrants or those who had endured a battering series of hardships across a tumultuous journey. There were several crudely made tents of cloth and animal hide they were sheltered on. Observing just a second further, Samantha could indicate that these must be the infected people Mesh had also talked about. Their mouths were salivating excessively, their spasmodic movements, eyes unblinking, and their heavy breaths showing that their quarantine life in the forest was a harsh living. These vultures in humanoid form arose from scavenging the remains of Ratima's cottage as Lillian angrily gripped her hips to demand their attention. You cretins, don't you dare touch let your dirty paws touch my brother's home, the vampire courtesan scolded them. The quarantined humans remained unresponsive only silently staring at Lillian with their doll-like eyes and with their mouths agape in frothy saliva. Foo, so, Han, Gur. One of the infected, without hesitation lunged at Lillian. His mouth opened with his sickly yellow and blood-stained teeth for a savage bite. He was immediately shot dead from a quick draw of Samantha's bullpup clean off. The cracking of her rifle initially startled the infected for a brief second but they resumed their cannibalistic charge towards Samantha and her companions. Lunging to them with crude clubs, stones, and rusted knives. They seemed to power through most of Ken and Iris' attacks from their weapons and magics as if they were immune to most forms of pain. Only a clean shot at center mass, or by the head from Ken's shotgun or a decapitating slash from Iris' vampire claws guaranteed their incapacitation. Their hearts pounded heavily as the last of scavengers fell to the disturbed relief of everyone in the group. Lillian, do not run off like that. Those people could have killed you, Samantha reprimanded. Wah, what accursed beings are those? Lillian bewildering pointed to the five corpses on the floor. They tried to attack me. Za zombies. Zombies, Captain. Dead looking, groaning and stinky everything. Ken screened aside to examine them. His cheeks twitched as he gagged in disgust to its decrepit smell. Strange, they look like them but they don't. Feel like a sturbed. Iris suspicious scanned the corpses. They feel like one. Ken turned his head and questioned the witch. There's no sign of any negative energies. They can't be zombies. They still have all have their positive energies. They are all still alive, somehow, but in a way, not themselves. Like feral. Iris sensed the still warm bodies of the dying infected people. Just my word as a practiced conjurer of the undead. Oh. Forgive me Sam my dear. But their blood. No. No need to look away like you do. 
Even I wouldn't drink that. The witch plugged her nose and mouth with the cup of her palm. End of block 7.